the crimson gardenia and other tales of adventure by rex beach story one the crimson gardenia part one the royal yacht had anchored amid a thunder of cannon and the king had gone ashore the city was bright with bunting a thousand whistles blew up through the festooned streets his majesty was escorted between long rows of blue-coated officers behind which the eager crowds were massed for mile upon mile thin wire cables were stretched along the curbs to hold the people back but these threatened to snap before the weight of the multitude in the neighbourhood of the raised pavilion where the queen and her maids of honour waited the press was thickest here rows of stands had been erected that groaned beneath their freight while rooftops and windows trees and telegraph poles were black with clustered humanity the king was tall and dark a long beard hid his face but the queen was young and blushing and her waiting women were fairer than springtime flowers to a crashing martial air she handed him a sparkling goblet in which he pledged her happiness while the street rocked to the roar of many voices and in the open spaces youths grotesquely costumed danced with goblin glee mr roland van dam secretly thought it all quite fine and inspiriting but he was too highly schooled to allow himself much emotion he had been hard put to obtain seats and had succeeded only through the efforts of a friend the duke of cotton therefore he felt the members of his party might have shown at least a perfunctory appreciation but they were not the appreciative kind and their attitude was made plain by eleanor banneman's languid words how dull it's nothing like the carnival at nice and the people seem very common her father was dozing uncomfortably with his two lower chins telescoped into his billowing chest mrs banneman complained of the heat and the glare and predicted a headache for herself near by the rest of the party were striving to conceal their lack of interest by guying the crowd below van dam had been the one to suggest this trip to new orleans for the mardi gras and he felt the weight of entertainment bearing heavily upon him in consequence he assumed a sprightly interest that was uh, very far from genuine this sort of thing awakens something medieval inside of one don't you know he said miss banneman regarded him with a bland lack of comprehension and her mother moaned weakly the burden of her complaint being as usual why did we leave palm beach all those dukes and things make me feel as if it were real van dam explained further they say this rex fellow is a true king during mardi gras week and those chaps in masks are quite like court jesters maybe they sing of wars and love and romance and all that rot i dare say life was just as uninteresting in olden times as it is now eleanor remarked love and romance exist mainly in books i fancy if they ever did exist we've outgrown them eh, Roley? being a very rich and a very experienced young woman miss banneman prided herself upon her lack of illusion to be sure she occasionally permitted roland to kiss her in celebration of their engagement but such caresses left her unperturbed her pulses had never been stirred she looked upon marriage as a somewhat trying although necessary institution van dam being equally modern and equally satiated by life's blessings shared her beliefs in a vague way manifestly no lover could allow such an assertion as this to go unchallenged so he rose to the defence of romance only to hear her say oh nonsense do be sensible raleigh such things aren't done nowadays what things aren't done oh those crude primitive performances we read about in novels nice people don't fall in love overnight for instance they don't allow themselves to hate and be jealous and to rage about like wild animals any more the idea your father is a perfect savage at heart said mrs banneman she nodded at her sleeping husband who was roused at that moment by a fly that strayed into his right nostril mr banneman sneezed half opened his eyes and murmured a feeble anathema before dozing off again it was plain that he was not greatly enjoying the mardi gras 
all men are primitive said raleigh quoting some forgotten author at which eleanor eyed him languidly could you love at first sight and run off with the girl certainly not i'd naturally have to know something about her people were you ever jealous you've never given me an occasion he told her gallantly did you ever hate anybody mm, no ever been afraid not exactly revengeful certainly not she smiled it's just as i said respectable people don't allow themselves to be harrowed by crude emotions i hate my modiste when she fails to fit me i was jealous of that baroness at the poinquiana the one with all those gorgeous gowns i'm afraid of flying machines but that is as deep as such things go nowadays in our set van damme was no hand at argument and he had a great respect for miss banneman's observation however he had been discussing something of which he possessed no first-hand knowledge therefore he said nothing further no one had a greater appreciation of or took a keener pleasure in life's unruffled placidity than the young society man no one had a denser ignorance of its depths its hidden currents and its uncharted channels than he for adventure had never come his way romance had never beckoned him from rose-embowered balconies and yet as the world goes he was a normal individual save for the size of his income he had not lost interest in life he was merely interested in things which did not matter that after all is quite different there were times nevertheless when he longed vaguely for something thrilling to happen when he regretted the oslerization of romance and the commercializing of love of course adventure still existed one could hunt big game in certain hidden quarters if one chose van damme detested stuffed heads and it took so much time to get them those unformed desires came to him only now and then and he felt ashamed of them in an idle way now that the parade had passed the visitors lost no time in leaving and a dignified stampede toward the hotel occurred for the gentlemen were thirsty and the ladies wished to smoke it was due to their haste perhaps that van damme became separated from them and found himself drifting along canal street alone in a densely packed crowd of merrymakers a masked woman in a daring spanish dress chucked him under the chin her companion showered him with confetti a laughing pierrot whacked him with a noisy bladder boys and girls in ragged disguises importuned him for pennies a very very shapely female person in what appeared to be the beginnings of a bathing suit laughed over her shoulder inviting him with eyes that danced my word murmured the new yorker this is worth while ahead of him he caught a glimpse of miss banneman's aigrettes and the ponderous figure of her father but the gaiety of the carnival crowd had infected him and he was loath to leave it for the grunewald whither his friends were bound with the unerring directness of thirsty millionaires it was a brilliant gorgeous afternoon the streets were alive with colour somewhere through this crowd the young man idly reflected adventure even romance might be stalking if such things really existed so he decided to linger to be quite truthful van damme's decision was made not with any faintest idea of encountering either romance or adventure but because a slight indigestion made the thought of a gin fizz or a julep unbearable at the moment as he continued to move with the throng the butt of badinage and the target for impudent glances he felt a desire to be of it and in it he yielded himself to a most indiscreet impulse assuring himself that he was unobserved he stepped into a store purchased a plain black domino and mask donned them and then fell in with the procession once more dimly amused at his folly vaguely surprised at his impropriety but now that he was one of the revellers he was no longer an object of their attentions they paid no heed to him and he soon became bored he engaged himself in conversation with an old flower woman and as she had only a solitary gardenia left in her tray he bought it in order that she might go home 
he pinned the blossom on the left breast of his domino and wandered to the nearest corner to watch the crowds flow past he had been there but a moment when a girl approached and stood beside him she was petite and yet her body beneath its fetching norman costume showed the rounded lines of maturity at the edge of her mask her skin gleamed smooth and creamy her eyes were very dark and very bright as mr van dam was a very circumspect young man not given to the slightest familiarity with strangers he confined his attention to an inoffensive inventory of her charms and was doubly startled to hear her murmur you came in spite of all monsieur a french girl he thought no doubt one of those creoles he had heard so much about aloud he said with a bow yes mademoiselle i have been looking for someone like you her eyes flashed to the white gardenia on his breast then up to his own you were expecting someone i was a girl to guide me through the carnival but you are early did you not perceive the warning warning he answered confused i received no warning i feared as much she said so i came but it was unwise of you it was madness to risk the streets her eyes left his face to scan the crowds he fancied she shrank from them as if fearing observation van damme was puzzled her voice and manner undoubtedly betrayed a genuine emotion or else she was a consummate actress if this were some mardi gras prank he felt a desire to see the next move if it proved to be anything more he fancied that he was too sophisticated to be caught and fleeced like a countryman but something told him that this was no ordinary street flirtation the words warning risk seemed to promise entertainment if as he suspected she had mistaken him for someone else a brief masquerade could lead to no harm he decided to see how far he could carry the deception oh, what warning could serve to prevent my seeing you he asked in a hollow voice then was surprised at the flush that stole upward to the girl's dainty ear you are indeed insane to jest at such a time she breathed i would never have known you without the flower but come we are in danger here some one is waiting will you follow me to the ends of the earth he replied gallantly again she gave him a startled glance half of pleasure half of deprecation then as he made a movement to accompany her she checked him oh no no you must let me go ahead they are everywhere they may suspect even my disguise i i am dreadfully afraid van damme scarcely knew how to answer this so like a wise man he held his tongue listen she continued i will walk slowly and do you remain far enough behind for your own safety my safety is as nothing to yours he told her but she shook her head impatiently please please they will never select you out of a thousand dominoes and i am not sure they suspect me but should they try to lift my mask you must escape at once would they dare mr van damme inquired shocked at such a breach of carnival etiquette they would dare anything but i couldn't allow it really he persisted if any hand is to lift your mask i insist that mine be the favoured one she darted a doubtful look at him being plainly perturbed at his tone then shook her head she told me you were reckless but you are quite insane for a second time he discovered that delicious color tinging her neck and laughed which disconcerted her even more she hesitated then turned away and he fell in beside her but distance proved only to enhance the girl's charms raleigh saw how beautifully proportioned she was how regally she carried herself how light and springy was her step although he had not seen her face he somehow felt agreeably certain that she possessed a witching beauty the circumspection with which she avoided the densest crowds made him wonder anew at the character of the danger that could overhang a masked maiden at mid-afternoon on a carnival day for by this time he had forgotten his first suspicion 
he thought not at all that the peril could be serious or in any way involve him for the magic of the van dam name protected its owner like invisible mail the effect of that patronymic was really quite wonderful policemen bowed to it irate strangers allowed their anger to ooze away before it it smoothed the owner's way through difficulties and brought him favors when least expected rage changed to servility indignation opposition even jealousy altered color in the shadow of the van dam millions nothing really unpleasant ever happened to raleigh and so it was that he had become blasé and tired at twenty-six he followed his masked guide across canal street and into the foreign quarter of the city where the surroundings were unfamiliar to him he gazed with mild repugnance at the squalid old houses mouldering behind their rusted iron balconies dim flag-paved hallways allowed him a glimpse of flowered courtyards at the rear cool passages went twisting in between the buildings over hard-baked glaring walls there drooped branches laden with bloom and fruit the streets were narrow the houses leaned intimately toward one another as if exchanging gossip little cafes with sanded floors opened upon the sidewalks here the carnival crowd was more foreign in character people were dancing to orchestras of guitar and mandolin youths turned somersaults for pennies ragged negroes jigged and shuffled with outstretched hats through this confusion the norman girl took her way now seeking some deep doorway to allow a particularly boisterous group to pass now flitting through the open spaces with the swift irregularity of a butterfly winging its course through sunlit stretches but her caution her bird-like backward glances told van dam that she was in constant dread of discovery and involuntarily he lessened the distance between them it was well perhaps that he did so for just then a man in a domino like his own accosted the girl raleigh saw his guide shrink away saw her turn and signal him with a swift imperious gesture of warning instead of heeding it he moved forward in time to intercept the stranger the fellow was laughing loudly he assumed a tipsy air and lurched against the girl then with a quickness that belied his pose he snatched at her mask and bared her features she cried out in terror and with the sound of her voice mr van dam flew to action he knew that until six o'clock disguises were inviolate and that it was against the strictest of police regulations to unmask a reveller therefore he yielded to a righteous impulse and struck the man in the domino squarely upon the jaw beneath raleigh's rounded proportions was a deceptive machinery of bone and muscle that had been schooled by the most expensive instructors of boxing he had known how to hit cleanly since he was twelve years old and although he had never struck a man in anger until this moment his fist went true the fellow rocked stiffly back upon his heels and fell like a wooden figure his head thumping dully on the pavement and raleigh gave vent to a most ungentlemanly snort of surprise and satisfaction it had been easier than he had expected and feeling that the man should have every opportunity for fair play raleigh began promptly to count one two three then he felt the girl's hand upon his arm and turned in time to catch a fleeting glimpse of a dimpled chin as she drew her mask down rotten trick that heaven above she gasped you must flee quickly people were crossing the street toward them drawn by the sight of the fallen man run away and leave you queried raleigh hardly then the breath caught in the girl's throat come she clutched his hand and they fled side by side pursued by half a score of shouting merrymakers around the first corner they scurried into a crowd then out of it and into the next thoroughfare doubling and turning until the girl's breath was gone why did did you do it uh, why she gasped still hurrying him along drunken loafer van dam said vindictively he was not drunk don't you understand didn't you guess it was the black wolf 
raleigh did not understand and he had no opportunity to guess who or what the black wolf might be for his companion paused crying god help us they're coming from the street behind rose a babble of angry voices he saw me he knows she cast a despairing glance about and spying a narrow alley close at hand darted toward it dragging van damme with her retreat carries with it a peculiar panic and the young man felt the stirring of an utterly new sensation within him he was running away what was more he wanted to keep running even though he had not the faintest idea of what menaced him it was quite remarkable he seemed to feel for some unknown reason that this sprightly young person beside him was indeed risking her safety for him therefore he began to share her apprehension but as to what it meant or whither the adventure was leading he had not a suspicion he did wonder however where the black wolf got his name the alley was damp and slippery being no more than a tunnel-like passage between two buildings and it led into a large courtyard full of carts and wagons a low shed ran along one side of the enclosure at the rear was a two-story structure used as a stable there i guess we've given them a slip van damme sighed with relief but his companion shook her head oh no no we must hide the black wolf has the cunning of satan and now that he knows she sped through the confusion of vehicles to the stable door with raleigh following an instant more and they were in an odorful dim-lit place divided into stalls out of which the heads of several horses were thrust in friendly greeting the girl closed the door and leaned panting against it one hand to her heaving bosom her head was bowed and her ears were strained for sounds of pursuit in the silence van damme heard his own heavy breathing the swish of the horse's tails an impatient stirring of hoofs and a gentle whinny he discovered that his pulse was hammering in a very unusual manner and that he was agreeably excited the girl uttered an exclamation oh, i feared so hurry she slipped past him to a rickety stairway that led upward ah this mask is smothering me she disengaged it hastily and he saw it dangling in her hand as he mounted the steep stairs behind her he saw also a pair of dainty silken ankles swelling into delicious curves that were hidden in the foamy whiteness of lingerie being an extremely respectful gentleman mr van damme lowered his eyes anticipating with curious eagerness the pleasure of beholding her countenance once they had gained the loft the desire to see behind her mask became really acute he had missed one opportunity by so narrow a margin as to quicken his desires they came out upon a rough landing and van damme caught the whisk of her skirts disappearing through a door that led into the haymow as he followed the door closed and he found himself in utter darkness he heard her fumbling with the lock their hands came together as he turned a rusty key and he felt her figure close against his her fragrant breath fanned his cheek make no sound as you value our lives as she whispered this van damme swore mildly at the luck that prevented him from appraising his companion's good looks now that her mask was off from the courtyard below sounded voices the girl clutched him nervously her hand was shaking he could feel her shiver so he slipped an arm about her waist he did this merely to steady her he told himself he reasoned further that such a familiarity could scarcely be offensive in the dark as she yielded gratefully to his embrace her soft body palpitating against his own he ceased reasoning and drew her closer it was very agreeable to discover that she made no resistance he could not recollect any sensation quite like this as yet he had done nothing improper in view of the fact that it was every gentleman's bounden duty to succour beauty in distress he wondered if his friends at the grunewald had missed him then realized with relief that miss banneman never allowed his presence or his absence to interfere in the slightest with her arrangements they were probably finishing their drinks by now this would make an entertaining story later in the evening they would never guess what he was doing 
who is that speaking he inquired francois the spider whispered the girl a oh, god how they all have come to hate you raleigh reasoned from these words that his enemies numbered more than one or two and involuntarily he asked hate me what for the girl trembled as if you did not know and what would happen if they found me uh, us he persisted feeling vaguely for some hint ah her breath caught hush she laid her fingers over the lips of his mask van damme yielded to an ungovernable impulse and kissed them through the stiff harsh cloth whereat she said in wonderment heaven guard us you are actually laughing that you are wild i knew but you are you act very strangely monsieur perhaps i'm intoxicated he murmured and pressed her slender waist meaningly whereupon she seemed to feel his arm for the first time she drew away but as she disengaged his embrace her hand encountered his it is wet bloody where you struck the black wolf that was a good wallop wasn't it van damme chuckled with satisfaction while she felt for her handkerchief and dabbled at his bruised knuckles i wondered if i could put him out then they ceased whispering for some one was entering the stable beneath them after a time the stairs creaked to a heavy tread a hand tried the door and they could feel a presence within arm's length they stood motionless not daring even to shift their weight upon the crazy floor until the fellow began to explore the other portion of the loft that is the spider himself breathed the girl close to van damme's ear he thinks he has me in his web but yes i would die before i married him a sudden dislike for spiders in general awoke in raleigh's breast i hate him i would kill him if i dared but he frightens me she broke off and caught at her companion gasping oh god what are you doing he had turned the key softly and was opening the door to be quite truthful raleigh van damme did not know exactly what he intended doing but some reckless impulse moved him to action he was invaded by a sudden desire to lay hands upon this spider person who went about terrorizing pretty girls having been reared to a habit of doing exactly as impulse dictated he felt no hesitation now away back in his mind however something told him calmly that he had gone quite mad that the magic of adventure had sent his wits a-flying and had played havoc with his common sense and a change really had come over him with the very beginning of this enterprise although he had not stopped to notice it the flaring rage that had answered to the wolf's assault upon the girl the joyful sensation of setting his fist into the fellow's face the excitement of the flight and the pursuit had all combined to upset his equilibrium then too the presence of this bewitching creature close beside him in the darkness the pressure of her body in his arms the scent of her warm breath all this helped to completely electrify him he felt the dawning of new and utterly absurd desires away with discretion to the winds with prudence this maiden's cause was his here was the one glad moment of his life francois he called in a low voice he slipped the girl's hand from his arm thrust her back into the shadow and stepped out upon the landing we oui, in a moment the spider came stumbling toward him she is not here van damme saw a tall man in a domino like his own Sacre! she has disappeared and that devil spawn is with her you found no trace in the yard below S listen breathed raleigh he sank his fingers into his palms and measured the distance carefully then as francois turned his head attentively raleigh braced himself and swung it may have been due to the uncertain light or to the narrow eyelet holes through which he peered at any rate van damme's blow went short the spider uttered a cry of fury and surprise raleigh felt himself hugged by a pair of thin iron-muscled arms then his hands felt in beneath the man's disguise and the cry changed to a gurgle they strained and rocked against each other briefly the floor sagged and creaked the door behind them flew open francois was groping with one free hand at his waist 
but his domino was like a shirt and he could not find that for which his hungry fingers searched as for van damme a delicious ferocity was flaming through his veins here was an enemy bent upon his quick destruction no game he had ever played was half so exhilarating as this he could feel the fellow writhe and the breath bursting through beneath his fingers he could feel the man's cords harden until they were like wire strange to say with every wrench and every surge his own abysmal fury increased but the spider was no weakling he fought desperately until in a burst of blind anger that was like some diabolic glee van damme lifted him bodily and hurled him at the opening in the floor the fellow missed his footing clawed wildly then fell backward headlong into the light below the next instant van damme too had lost his balance and followed bumping from step to step until he fetched up at the foot with a jar that drove the breath out of him he sat up in a moment still dazed then he heard a rustle and beheld above him a pair of frightened dark eyes gazing into his although he could see nothing of the girl's face she had replaced her mask he knew that she was racked with anxiety are you killed she queried no just abominably twisted he said then with a wry face ouch that was an awful bump as he felt himself over gingerly he stopped short at the sight of his mask lying crumpled beside him he realized that the jig was up and began to formulate an explanation of his deception only to hear her exclaim tremulously god be praised you are unhurt he sat still staring at her amazed that no outburst followed her glimpse of his face how did you dare she turned to the figure of francois which roly discovered motionless and arm's length away the spider was sprawled loosely in the litter his head was twisted upon his shoulders in a peculiar way and his mask having slipped to the back stared upward with a placid wax-like smile that was horrible under the circumstances still lost in wonderment van damme arose dusted off his clothing and picked up his own disguise was it possible that she did not know the person she had gone to meet it seemed so indeed for she was hanging upon him anxiously as if still doubting his safety while she half sobbed her admiration of his bravery and her gratitude at his escape raleigh began to fear he had been imposed upon after all else how could she fail to realize that he was an utter stranger but the girl's honesty was compelling he found that he could not doubt the sincerity of her gaze he felt an unaccountable lack of compunction regarding the spider in fact he experienced a sense of satisfaction at the completeness of his victory over the ruffian and she seemed to share the feeling he heard her urging him to make haste and before he had fully regained his wits he found himself following her out into the sunlight underneath the wagon shed she guided him around behind it and into a narrow three-foot space the left side of which was bounded by a board fence about head high quick she cried eagerly once we are on the other side we may escape the others are somewhere close by End of story one part one part two van damme being accustomed by this time to a certain obedience lifted the girl up to the top of the fence scrambled over it himself and held up his arms to her he was in another yard much cleaner than the one he had just quit there were trees and flowers in it and looking down on them were shuttered windows which seemed empty as she surrendered her weight to him he gave rein to the license which was in his blood and pressed a warm kiss back of her mask where the hair lay in wispy ringlets against her neck mon dieu what a man she laughed struggling gently to free herself you had better put on your mask we haven't far to go but there may be observing eyes am i uh, quite the person you pictured he queried as he adjusted the false face not at all you have never seen me before the to-day of course not how could i i have seen you often impossible where dreams said van damme vaguely yet with some degree of truth this all seems like a dream as a matter of fact 
i'm afraid i'll turn over and you'll change into an old lady with hoop skirts or a flock of purple snowbirds or a friendly crocodile with gold spectacles she pondered this for a moment as they made their way across the yard being careful in the meanwhile to see if they were observed after a moment she halted wait she said i'm not sure we dare risk going farther for the streets are alarmed and the wolf is in the neighborhood with all his pack i had thought to take you straight home but now they will be watching it would be madness to try it again she fell silent only to exclaim i have an idea come she turned abruptly to the right where are we going now he inquired mildly she pointed to a house the back yard of which abutted upon the one that they were crossing yonder is your cousin alfred's house he is away at business the servants are out watching the carnival and so it is empty do you dare venture it just the thing he said amiably i owe alfred a call the girl laughed shortly ah he would die of rage or fright if he knew but you can wait here while i go oh i say you're not going to leave me queried raleigh in a genuine alarm of course silly someone must bring her van dam fell silent speculating upon this last remark after a moment he said you're sure alfred won't return who knows we must run some hazards the key will be under the step i think come they gained ingress to the next enclosure through a cedar hedge then as they neared the back door a distant commotion sounded from the stable yard warning them that the spider's friends had stumbled upon him but the girl's ready fingers found the key where it was hidden and an instant later they were in a spotless creole kitchen ornamented with shining pots and pans a cat rose from a sleepy window ledge arched its back and stretched with a warning gesture van dam's guide bade him wait then disappeared returning in a moment it is as i thought the house is empty she beckoned him and he followed her past a pantry down a hall and into a study furnished with a considerable degree of elegance drawn blinds shut out the glaring heat it was dim and cool and restful the maiden heaved a sigh of relief and steadied herself against one of the massive mahogany chairs showing by her attitude that the recent strain had told upon her heaven be praised you are safe here for a time at least she managed to say nice comfy place this remarked van dam with an appreciative glance at the surroundings uh, we can sit here and uh, get acquainted eh? Hmm, i think i have learned to know you quite well in the past half hour she laughed true but we've had very little chance to talk calmly and rationally now have we of course you're accustomed to such things perhaps but it has been a trifle strenuous for a person of my easy ways i don't mind telling you that i'm positively winded let's rest a bit before you leave but the girl shook her head at his suggestion you forget how she has waited and longed for this hour she has been very ill nothing seemed to interest her until you promised to come on the last day of the fiesta since then she has been like another woman she is counting the moments now until she feels your arms about her raleigh stirred uncomfortably for here was something he had not counted upon one woman at a time was ample he had no desire to hold another to his breast he was shocked too that this girl should suggest such a thing after what had passed between them it was unseemly he felt tempted to confess his deception and to demand an explanation of the whole affair but some sense of shame held him back besides his companion was undoubtedly sincere and he could not bring himself to cause her dismay another reason that urged him to hold his tongue and to let the adventure run its course was that as yet he had not yet seen her face the desire to do so was becoming insufferable he was about to claim the privilege when she changed the current of his thoughts you must not be shocked if she does not recognize you she has been ill very ill since you uh, proved so great a trial to her you understand perfectly he said thankful that she could not detect his signs of bewilderment very well then you will make free of your cousin alfred's hospitality while i am gone she laughed nervously la there is irony for you suppose he should return in the meantime she shrugged 
oh, you seem quite capable of caring for yourself monsieur i should not wish to be in his shoes that is all but there is little danger and now i must leave you just a moment he said taking her two hands in his you have seen my face don't you think i wish to see yours her breath caught at the tone of his voice not yet please when i return when you have held her in your arms and made your peace then perhaps if you wish but not until then she pressed his fingers meaningly and he thrilled you haven't spoken my name either said he won't you tell me that you like me i like you cousin emile said she then in a voice that told him she was blushing rosily and what name do you give to me raleigh's wits came to his rescue barely in time with an air of deepest tenderness that was not all assumed he said well, i haven't dared acknowledge the name my heart has given you even to myself it is no no she laughed tremulously call me madeline madeline desire of my dreams he raised her hand to his lips until you give me leave to lift your mask i kiss these dimpled fingers it was plain that his boldness did not altogether displease her for she paused reluctantly upon the threshold her eyes were shining although her mask smiled at him vacuously as she said you are a most unusual young man you awaken something strange within me i cannot despise you as i should for you have taken away my reason that is disturbing is it not now then avail yourself of the hospitality of the man who has robbed you i shall return as fast as ever my feet will bring me she waved him a kiss and was gone he heard the front door close then he endeavored to piece out some theory as to the cause of this situation but the more he considered the clues in his possession the more bewildered he became one thing only stood out with alarming certainty his cousin madeline had gone to fetch a woman who loved him so long as the adventure had concerned him only with the masked girl herself he had been eager to continue it now that it threatened to involve a second woman he decided it was time to go she would return and find him gone it would be a disappointment perhaps but not so great as his own at parting from her and leaving this mystery unsolved he was somewhat proud of his exploits thus far for in an hour's time he had met and bested two of his enemies and had changed a maiden's heart no mean accomplishment for an idler but why did she feel that she ought to despise him why had she risked so much for a man beloved by another why under these circumstances had she welcomed his advance and promised him a sight of her face a kiss perhaps above all who were the black wolf the spider and cousin alfred he gave up puzzling over the affair and determined to get out of this stranger's house without delay it was evident that cousin alfred was a person of substance for the study was furnished in rich old santo domingo mahogany blood-red and flaming where the light struck it the books were bound in uniform levant the paintings were valuable the bric-a-brac in irreproachable taste an inlaid ivory humidor was filled with coronas at exactly the right degree of moisture he removed the ground glass stopper from an etched decanter and sniffed of the contents the aroma brought a smile to his face and reflecting that the owner had robbed him he took some time to pour out a drink and to light a fragrant cigar all gentlemanly housebreakers did the like he reflected then he yielded to whimsical notion and fumbled in his pocket thinking to leave the price of his refreshments on the tray midway in this purpose he paused the breath hung in his throat the hair at the back of his neck seemed to rise he had heard no one enter the house there had been no faintest stir since madeline had left he detected no sound whatever and yet he was positive that eyes were boring into his back that he was no longer alone it was ridiculous and yet a gentle cough sounded behind him with a swift gesture he settled his mask back in place and whirling around beheld the most evil-appearing human being he had ever seen 
the man was little and stooped and undersized all but his head which was unusually large his face was fleshless and covered with a tight skin of unusual pallor he was bowing at van damme but his smile was mocking and his eyes glittered malignantly good day monsieur black wolf said the stranger harshly making yourself at home with my wines as usual eh van damme felt the cold sweat leap upon his body he cursed the deliberation that had betrayed him with an assumption of indifference he mumbled something and waved his cigar carelessly how often must i tell you to come here only at night snarled the old man already the police are suspicious fortunately it is carnival day i dare say no one suspected you in that disguise the speaker deposited his hat upon the table with a sour glance then when his caller said nothing he snapped well well what is it van damme was at a loss for words he was panic-stricken but swift upon his consternation came a reckless determination to take advantage of the old gentleman's first mistake and try to brazen the matter through there was nothing to be gained by explanation no one would believe his story he spoke out boldly the wolf is hurt and the spider i think has his neck very neatly broken i came to tell you that your cousin emile is in the city the effect of these words was amazing electric cousin alfred turned a corpse-like green he froze in his tracks his eyes rolled in their sockets emile here his teeth chattered he plucked at his collar as if he were strangling then you who are you raleigh shrugged oh, i'm one of the others i was sent to warn you he recognized now the character of the old fellow's emotion it was cowardice terror but of such utter foulness as to be disgusting evidently this emile whoever he was had a reputation raleigh multiplied his host's discomfiture by adding oh yes he struck down the wolf in the street then dropped the spider on his head from the top of a staircase god help us stammered cousin alfred he will take me next oh he has threatened me he cast a frightened glance over his shoulder as if expecting the sanguinary emile to appear at any moment then he began to whine i know him i know him and the servant's gone i i am an old man he wouldn't like nothing better than to find me alone but how dared he come wait it was felice oh i'll wager she sent for him and he would not refuse the scoundrel the speaker's lips were wet and loose his gaze was very evil as he mumbled along felice must be the other girl the one for whom madeline had gone raleigh decided in view of alfred's evident hatred it did not seem right to allow madeline to bring the other girl without some warning one glance at those working features convinced the young man that such a meeting would be dangerous and yet he was quite at a loss how to prevent it his host was running on it was only yesterday that she appealed to me she and madeline and all the time they knew he was coming he ground his teeth i have been a fool to spare them so long this uh, felice van damme ventured groping blindly for some clue your cousin emile is fond of her i judge damnation he would pass through fire for her and she would sacrifice her soul for him alfred poured himself a drink with shaking hand the glass rattled against the decanter he spilled the wine over his waistcoat as he gulped it so they planned to catch me napping eh but we shall see yes yes we shall see after a moment during which he pulled himself together he continued you shall remain here with me when he comes we shall afford him a surprise he slid open a drawer in the big desk and took from it a revolver at which raleigh exclaimed i say whatever makes you think you'll come here oh he will come there is no doubt of it he has promised me that much those were his last words uh, why don't you clear out you don't have to stay and see him but the old man's eyes were red and vindictive as he shook his head you don't understand so long as he lives we are none of us safe not even you besides he would return again he hangs upon me like a leech 
i i dream about him well what are you going to do if i if i should kill him the law would say nothing i could kill him very easily and nothing would be said you understand cousin alfred's lips were watery little drops of moisture gleamed upon his sallow face he eyed the pistol with a shrinking fascination i i he fell to trembling weakly as his first desperation cooled van damme watched him curiously he looked up at length to meet raleigh's gaze his own eyes were wavering his face was distorted with mingled fear and eagerness he stretched his neck as if he already felt on it the fingers of his cousin emile when van damme did not offer to help him he whined he is always intended to even up the score but i am an old man my hand is unsteady perhaps you, you it would be worth something to escape those dreams i could afford to pay you well as you know you are a strong man you have no nerves your hand is sure the old villain's expression was crafty he was gnawed by a fierce desire that he was loath to put into words you mean you'd like to have me make away with him queried van damme as if in a dream well, yes yes the law would say nothing how so it's not so easy to kill a man and but the reward two thousand dollars you would get that i will double it eh come now is it a bargain the speaker was trembling but when he received no answer he went on i will take the blame upon myself i will say that i did it and you will get the money four thousand dollars let us say five thousand eh a tidy sum for a moment's work with no risk we are alone in the house and no one but the wolf knows you are here even i don't know but by the way i haven't seen you yet under the circumstances i think i'll keep my mask on van damme answered perhaps the less you know about me the better then you agree queried the other all a shake raleigh declined with a gesture eh, god five thousand dollars a fortune indeed think of it heaven knows i am not a croesus and yet i might increase even that a little what do you say six thousand then all cash this is the money you stole from emile i believe said van damme you could afford even more seven thousand five hundred chattered alfred not another cent or i shall do it myself good you do it raleigh exclaimed whereat the tempter writhed and shivered in an ague of fear with a wail that came like a sob and with a final wrench of his miserly soul he exclaimed wait then i will pay you ten thousand dollars if you kill him the money is there it will bankrupt me but god above ten thousand dollars it is scarcely worth it such a little job how do i know you'd make good inquired the young man you robbed him you might rob me i have promised it is there in the safe the moment he is dead bah mr van damme managed a mocking laugh although his heart was pounding your word is worth nothing to me alfred made answer by slipping across the room and kneeling before the steel safe he spun the knob swiftly to right and to left then gave a wrench and the massive door opened come here van damme obeyed look he saw legal documents deeds mortgages and blue envelopes all neatly marked then a cash drawer crowded full of symmetrical packages of crisp new ten-dollar bills each with its bank band plainly labeled one thousand dollars ah you are satisfied the owner was staring craftily up at him careful to keep his body between van damme and the treasure jove raleigh exclaimed in astonishment you'll be robbed some night is it a bargain i'm no business man the masker hesitated with an air of extreme suspicion will you pay in advance at this cousin alfred uttered a bleat of dismay but raleigh was firm i'm not sure you'd open the safe again don't you see besides it would take time and i'd prefer not to wait really i would for i'm always a bit nervous after a job of this kind listen then exclaimed the old man i will close the safe but i will leave the combination off see we must each run some risk in this matter i suppose but i trust you once it is over there will be no delay 
a moment and you can be away with ten thousand dollars in your pocket and with me to do the explaining why he had allowed the affair to run to such an extraordinary length van damme hardly knew except that he wished to gain time he had no idea that the mysterious emile would really come to the house for madeline had as much as told him that a far different reason lay behind the young man's presence in the city what did concern raleigh however the more he considered it was the possible consequence if the two girls returned thus far he had been able to meet each new surprise each fresh situation with a resource that amazed himself but if they came face to face with him and alfred his own masquerade would end at once and disastrous explanations would certainly follow nevertheless he could not run away and leave them in an awkward position as he looked back over the fantastic occurrences of the past hour or more it amused and amazed him to realize how nicely he had fitted into the puzzle and puzzle it surely was for the whole sequence of events that had followed the purchase of the white gardenia that lay above his heart was now more bewildering than ever that there was something more than mere roguery afoot he had ample proof he felt himself groping along the edge of something vague and black and sinister but what it was what were the issues or who were the people involved he had not the slightest conception of one thing only was he sure madeline had no place in this elaborate web and woof of crime she had impressed him more deeply even than he had realized and his main anxiety now outside of a desire to protect her from the venom of this poisonous old man was to see her face to lift with his own fingers the mask that had so tantalized him the owner of the house was busily arranging the plans for emile's destruction when the doorbell rang he clutched his guest nervously by the arm and thrust the revolver into his hand whispering it is he the scoundrel has arrived quickly now behind the door but raleigh stepped to a front window and cautiously drawing the curtain aside peered out he saw what he had feared the figure of a petite norman maid and beside it that of a masked woman in a long dark robe well now who can it be he heard alfred whisper and discovered the senile villain appearing past his shoulder it is madeline and felice raleigh explained they here oh wait i will give them a cursing to remember but before the speaker could move he found his arm pinioned behind him and his own weapon pointed at his head he uttered a squeak of amazement and terror mon dieu what is this shut up raleigh dragged the old man from the window stripped a thick curtain cord from its hook and knotted his wrists together alfred offered no resistance a horrible fear had him by the throat he hung like a sack in the younger man's grasp his eyes alone retained their activity these followed van damme in a horrified stare they seemed about to emerge from their sockets raleigh deposited his limp captive in a chair and stepping to the window tapped sharply when madeline looked up he signalled her to wait the hall portieres furnished another cord for cousin alfred's ankles and a handkerchief served as a gag as this was being adjusted however the captive quavered hoarsely <gasps> who are you i raleigh laughed why i am your cousin emile the householder voiced a thin shriek and began to plead for his life then the remnants of his strength escaped leaving him a spineless heap in the great leather chair van damme bore him in his arms down the hall searching for a place of concealment this he found in a closet the door of which he closed then he hastened back to the front entrance you kept us waiting sufficiently madeline said as he stepped aside for the two women to enter raleigh's eyes were glued upon the taller of the two figures but felice seemed to take no heed of him he heard her murmuring in a sick eager voice emile my own beloved emile madeline raised her hand in a warning gesture and the young man shrank closer into the shadows courage dear she said to her companion we have arrived at last a moment now and he will come she half led half supported the taller woman into the library the next instant she was back at van damme's side 
drawing him into the parlor across the hall she exclaimed in a voice which showed that tears were in her eyes thank heaven no one recognized us but i was weak with fright oh it was pitiful i have wept at every step she has been calling you like that night and day go quickly she removed his mask and thrust him into the hall this was the most embarrassing moment van damme had experienced thus far he had been prepared to face eventual discovery and had decided to make a clean breast of his part in this comedy when the necessary moment arrived but this was altogether different felice was ill half demented what might be the effect upon her of this disclosure there was nothing to do however but to face it out and to make the truth known as quickly and as gently as possible but as he entered the study he received a surprise that robbed the adventure of all its entertainment that changed this comedy into a tragedy and humbled the man's reckless spirit end of story one part two part three van damme saw that which filled him with aching pity for instead of a girl he found awaiting him a frail sweet-faced old woman whose fingers were locked as if in prayer whose lips were murmuring the name of her son her hair softer and finer than silken floss was silvery white her wistful wrinkled countenance was ablaze with a glad excitement that made it glorious and holy that which caused van damme's heart to melt and to turn away completely however was the fact that she was blind she had heard his step muffled as it was in the inch-thick carpet and rose with a tender cry pausing with her arms outstretched her body shaken by an ecstasy of yearning emile emile she whispered and came toward him her sightless eyes were wet she was trembling terribly van damme experienced a desire to flee he tried to speak and to warn her off but as the feeble figure swayed toward him the age-old appalling tragedy of mother's love caused his throat to tighten then he took her hands in his his arms enfolded her she lay against his breast weeping softly gladly while he bowed his head reverently over hers had his life depended upon his speaking he could not have done it he merely waited with a sick feeling of dread the instant of her awakening he was vaguely surprised as moment followed moment and it did not come then he discovered the explanation grief had set her wits to wandering days and weeks and months of yearning had burned away some part of her faculties leaving her possessed by such a reasonless hunger that almost any object would have served to fill her want he had heard of demented mothers whose minds had been saved by the substitution of a living for a dead child and it seemed that this was a similar case for she was flooded now with a supreme content and appeared to experience no suspicion of fraud the touch of her fluttering fingers on his cheek was like the caress of butterfly wings her voice was soft her words though wandering were tender and filled with such a heaven-born adoration that his distress was multiplied this was her hour he reflected perhaps an all-wise providence had selected him to fill this part and to bring glory to her withered heart at any rate he would have been unspeakably cruel to disillusionize her he led her to a chair then knelt and bowed his head to her straying fingers murmuring those terms of endearment which cause a mother's breast to thrill when he looked up to madeline at last she saw that he was crying quite like a little boy from the disconnected words that fell from the blind woman's lips he began after a time to piece the truth together emile had been an only son a paragon of manly virtues the keeper of his mother's soul there had come a great shock and a great disgrace that had evidently conspired to unseat her reason she spoke indirectly of them as a child marked by some prenatal influence recoils at contact with the cause of its infirmity then it seemed madeline had come to watch over and to comfort her filling a son's place with a daughter's devotion there had been persecution want the loss of property through an enemy of whom the mother spoke ramblingly 
van damme recollected the dried-up villain in the closet down the hall and felt a flame of rage mount through him he longed mightily to ask questions to run the matter down without delay but dared not for he was in momentary dread that the imposture would be discovered so he spoke as infrequently as possible and substituted for words those gentle caresses and endearing attentions that are far more welcome to a starving heart madeline remained close by adding a grain of comfort and encouragement now and then and regarding van damme with a strangely bewildered attention but the mother was far from strong her excitement had wearied her and now with the relaxation of contentment fatigue stole over her she lay back among the soft cushions her restless hands moving more slowly her gentle voice stilled she dozed at last her face serene and beatific madeline motioned to van damme and he rose noiselessly they stole across the hall and into the drawing-room leaving the placid figure in repose she turned upon him saying doubtfully with every moment you surprise me emile you are not at all what i expected not at all the cousin of whom i have heard so much even in looks you seem uh, how shall i say it uh, strange are you pleased or disappointed ah pleased i feel that i must weep you are so brave and strong and yet so gentle so sweet perhaps only a mother recognizes the good that is in one that scene in yonder was very touching i can hardly credit my ears and my eyes it's plain you have a wrong idea of me i'm not at all a bad sort so i began to believe in spite of everything la it is confusing i'm all in a whirl she uttered a hesitating silvery little laugh that proved her embarrassment we must speak quickly he said i am also greatly confused you have opened up a great possibility for me madeline this whole world is suddenly different i think i am in love with you my little cousin she flung out her hand to check him crying no no i could never love you her voice was uncertain and he imprisoned her outstretched palm then with his free hand he removed her mask she made no resistance she did not even draw away from him his heart leaped wildly at the face he saw for it was more perfect even than he had imagined the eyes were deep brown the skin was smooth and olive-hued the lips were red and pouting with embarrassment she met his hungry gaze with a flaming blush of defiance then she smiled pathetically and without further delay he drew her to him and kissed her once twice again and again until she lay spent and shaken in his arms after a time she said wonderingly what miracle is this i have always hated you i hate you now when i think of the evil you have done i shall continue to hate you i hardly believe that it is very sad that this has come to pass it means nothing but unhappiness how so can you ask you a refugee with a price upon your head she shuddered and buried her face against his shoulder why have you made me love you it was fate my little witch if you will trust me all will come out right in the end but there is a great deal here that i don't understand for instance how come you two to be in want surely you know as well as i i do not but i wrote letters go astray tell me there is little to tell we hardly know ourselves except that we trusted in our good cousin alfred as you trusted he is a snake she clutched roland fiercely by the folds of his domino oh it is too bad that i did not know you sooner emile i would have saved you from those evil men for i am very wise but now you must suffer the punishment for your crime and i must suffer also it is hardly just is it suppose i told you uh, i am innocent please one rosy palm closed his lips you must never lie to me even to promote my happiness no when a woman loves she loves blindly without reason regardless of her lover's unworthiness you have brought misery to me as you brought it to her uh, perhaps you will suffer as a punishment and why have you devoted yourself to my mother 
he inquired i love her i am alone in the world we are poor together cousin alfred has my money too you understand van damme was tempted as upon several former occasions to tell her the truth but a sudden idea occurred to him an idea so inspiring so brilliant that it brought an exclamation to his lips wait here for a moment he said and leaving her he stole into the library with an eye upon the sleeping figure he knelt before the safe and turned the knob it opened noiselessly and the sight of the close-packed cash drawer filled him with a tremendous merriment it was exhilarating it was godlike to be endowed with the power of restitution and retribution he greatly enjoyed the feel of the crisp new banknotes as he emptied the compartment and assembled the package into a bundle he was amazed at the amount represented there must have been twenty thousand dollars all in those smooth unsoiled ten-dollar bills evidently the old miser preferred lock and key to a banker's vagaries naughty alfred to rob widows and orphans well he had been warned of the danger of robbery van damme predicted apoplexy for the owner when he discovered his loss the girl was waiting where he had left her but when she discovered the nature of the gift he bore she drew back in amazement come come he said it belongs to you and felice but mon dieu i have prospered a lucky speculation a gift from the gods as it were you need have no hesitation in accepting it for it is yours and no one can take it from you not even cousin alfred she was still protesting when they heard the mother call this money another miracle madeline exclaimed it is wonderful i feel that i am dreaming but come we have overstayed we may be discovered at any moment he took her in his arms again and whispered his adoration i am coming to find you madeline i have the power to work miracles you see no no if you care for me you must guard yourself perhaps after many years perhaps when you have shown yourself worthy and the world has forgotten uh, then she shivered at thought of the weary wait ahead of her her lips quivered pathetically there were many things he wished to ask her the hunger to retain her in his arms was almost unbearable but now that she had been reawakened to the perils of their situation she allowed him no opportunity she tore her lips reluctantly from his she held him off in an agony of pleading and when the mother's voice sounded a second time they returned in hand to the study there followed a touching farewell as the blind woman clung shakingly to the gentle impostor praying for his safety imploring him piteously to be a good man and to walk in the shadow of righteousness then came a lingering heart-breaking caress and once more the three were at the front door van damme seized the girl's fingers and kissed them while the look in his eyes brought tears to hers then they were gone and he stood alone in the hall of the house he had robbed he remained motionless for a time lost in a blissful intoxication was this strange new-born delirium love it must be it could be nothing else it was quite amazing utterly bewildering he had never dreamed of anything at all like it he felt a desire to cry aloud the news of this marvel he was melting with pain and gladness something inside him was singing gloriously at thought of madeline's deep wide eyes of her tender lips dewy with the birth of passion his muscles swelled and the whole world seems to applaud but it was so new so unbelievable the swift rush of this afternoon's events had left him in a dizzy whirl an hour ago he had been deaf dumb and blind but he had suddenly regained his every sense he was no longer blasé he was awake with yearnings and appreciations madeline had taught him the greatest secret of the universe madeline but who the devil was madeline van damme brought himself abruptly out of his reverie there had been enough mystery for one day now for the solution of this puzzle back yonder gagged and bound was a cringing human rat who knew everything van damme desired to know and who would talk if forced to do so 
raleigh decided to have the inmost details of this affair if it became necessary to roast the soles of cousin alfred's feet over a slow fire in order to loosen his tongue time had flown but there was a little margin left he hurried down the hall flung open the door behind which his captive lay then recoiled with mouth agape the closet was empty alfred he called alfred but his voice echoed lonesomely through the empty rooms not a sound broke the silence there on the floor lay the handkerchief and the two tasseled curtain cords he felt a chill of apprehension for unseen eyes were observing him he was certain with that vindictive little ruffian at large the situation altered each door might hide a menace each moment add to his peril the thought of that rifled safe and the consequences of discovery convinced van dam that this was no place for a respectable new york society man so he clapped on his mask and darted down the hall toward the rear of the house past the pantry and into the kitchen he fled his precipitate haste nearly causing him to collide with another masked figure that had just entered from the garden instinctively the two men recoiled van dam saw that the stranger wore a black domino like his own and that a white gardenia was pinned over his heart it was a twin to the flower that reposed upon his own breast emile he exclaimed with a start the newcomer swept his mask downward and simultaneously he conjured an automatic revolver from some place of concealment the face that he exposed was not pleasant to look upon for it was coarsened by dissipation and the eyes were both violent and furtive underneath his heavy passionate features however lay a marked resemblance to the blind mother who had just left yes i am emile he panted then with a snarl he raised his weapon until it bore upon van damme's breast and you are one of the gang eh here don't point that confounded thing at me it might go off roley brushed aside the mask from his own face explaining i'm not one of the gang i'm a friend emile eyed him intently before lowering his weapon i never saw you before of course not but come we both got to get out of here indeed i came to see my cousin alfred it is a little call i promised him i know everything and believe me you have no time to lose how do you come to know so much demanded emile suspiciously and what is that with the muzzle of his weapon he indicated the waxen white flower upon roley's domino there's no time to explain everything but i know why you are here the old man has gone gone bah that is a lie i have followed him all through the city i've been to his office and they told me he was here i've a little matter to settle with him it will only take a moment i tell you he's gone who the devil are you anyhow i have no friends i am madeline's fiance van dam said boldly another lie she has no fiance the speaker's face darkened if she marries any one it shall be me an unfamiliar pang smote van dam suddenly but he disregarded it don't be a fool he insisted i know why you came here but you're too late your mother and madeline were here too a moment ago here exclaimed the youth incredulously yes alfred heard you were in the city and he planned to ambush you i tied him up and threw him into a closet then i robbed his safe and gave the money to madeline and your mother emile's face was a study at this amazing intelligence when i came to look for the old fellow a moment ago i found he'd escaped i don't know where he's gone that's why we'd better cut and run for it before he sets up an alarm run emile shook his head i have been running with the black wolf at my heels i thought they had me cornered more than once they're after me now the whole pack do they know you're here i dare say they were right behind me he cursed violently and to think that i missed cousin alfred after all you had no business in the city you must get out again it's too late now why it's nearly six o'clock i could never get away before it's time for masks off nevertheless you must try van dam said decisively if you stay here you're lost we'll climb the fence at the rear of the next yard and slip out through the stable way emile pondered for a moment i hadn't thought of that it's a chance but you can't go with me i shan't allow it nonsense you don't know the wolf if i were seen it would mean the death of both of us 
very well then i'll leave by the front way now go van damme half shoved the young man toward the door thanks murmured the fugitive you seem to be the right sort if i live i shan't forget the next instant he was gone raleigh watched him race across the yard squeeze through the hedge then an instant later saw his form as he mounted the fence to the wagon enclosure where the spider had gone to his destruction earlier in the afternoon it was a risky route to safety he reflected but in view of what emile had said about his pursuers it was infinitely preferable to any other why he had helped the fellow van damme scarcely knew unless it was because of his sympathy for the underdog whatever the boy had done he possessed a reckless bravery that was commendable and he still held his mother's love raleigh was about to close the door when he saw a second man in a long black domino briefly silhouetted upon the fence then he heard a whistle the fellow dropped over into the tracks of emile leaving the new yorker amazed at the apparition a sickening fear clutched van damme but he knew it was useless to cry out could it be that he had sent the young fellow to his death when a moment then another had passed with no sound from that quarter he closed the kitchen door and retraced his steps swiftly to the front of the house as he came to the library entrance he found it closed and from inside he heard a tinkle as if a telephone hook was being violently agitated inclining his ear a low agonized voice came to him le duc again why haven't you sent the police robbery my cousin emile murder me god above they are slow he will escape van damme tried the door it was locked then he called sweetly alfred my dear cousin alfred the voice at the telephone ended in a shriek there came a crash as the instrument fell from the old man's fingers so the police were on their way escape then must be but a matter of moments with his heart pounding van damme stepped into the drawing-room and reconnoitred from a front window what he saw did not reassure him particularly in view of emile's words for directly opposite he beheld a masked man in a black domino who looked very like the black wolf scattered up and down the block were others all idling about in a seemingly objectless manner evidently the house was surrounded he dared not risk the back way after what he had seen he could not remain from the library again came that faint frantic tinkling van damme dropped his mask tore the flimsy robe from his back and strode to the front door under any other circumstances he would have preferred to remain and to take the consequences but for madeline's sake he dare not risk an explanation to the police besides how could he explain that twenty thousand dollars in clean crisp ten-dollar notes that she had in her possession he flung the portal wide stepped out then turned and bowed as if to some one inside good-bye he called cheerily had a delightful afternoon the door closed with a click and he was in the open air he extracted a cigarette from his jewelled case noting from the corner of his eye that with one accord the maskers were closing in upon him descending the steps he turned to the left walking briskly his one chance now depended upon whether these men knew emile by sight if so he felt that he was reasonably safe if not he was approaching two of them they separated to let him pass between from beneath their fatuously smiling masks he saw eyes staring at him curiously the flesh along his spine crinkled and rippled but he did not turn his head or falter even when he knew that they had halted he could feel the puzzled gaze of many eyes upon him and imagined the mystification his appearance had excited in the midst of their indecision there sounded the faint clamor of a gong it grew rapidly until with wild clangor a patrol wagon reeled into the street and drew up in front of the house van damme had just quitted he turned as a half dozen blue coats tumbled out of it and rushed up the steps incidentally he saw that the black-clad figures were melting away in various directions raleigh did not wait to observe what followed he turned the first corner then quickened his gait at the next corner swinging once more to the left his pulses were jumping his ears were roaring he found the muscles of his jaws were aching from the strain a close call surely 
but he had come through it all safely he was whole and on his way out of this mysterious neighbourhood once more his promptness and resource had saved him here was the very street up which he and madeline had fled yonder was the entrance to the blind alley that led into the stable yard he noticed that a little crowd was congregated there many of its members in the same costume of merrymakers he reflected that emile might have found their presence awkward in making his escape they seemed greatly excited or shocked over something he noted as he approached they completely blocked the alley entrance in among them he forced his way then paused staring down with startled eyes at what he saw a babble of voices smote his ears but he heard nothing he was elbowed aside but his gaze remained riveted upon the body of a man in a black domino it lay sprawled in the dirt and covering the face was a mask which smiled placidly up at the beholders on the left breast was pinned a solitary gardenia crimson with blood it had been pierced with a dagger and out of it had trickled a bright red arterial stream van damme continued to stare at the gruesome sight while his wits whirled dizzily why it was but a moment ago that this boy had left him in the full flower of his youth the body was still warm it seemed inconceivable that the grim reaper could have worked this grisly change in so short a time how had it happened he recalled that sombre figure as he had seen it scaling the fence he recalled that warning whistle at the memory he turned sick was it possible that he had been to blame for this he shook the notion from him reflecting that emile's fate would have been the same or worse had he chosen any other course a rest he knew would have been no more welcome than this raleigh felt a great desire to shout the truth at these people who stood about so stupidly he longed to set them on the trail of the black wolf and his pack but he refrained how little he really knew after all who was the black wolf who was this emile what had the young scapegoat done to place himself not only outside the law but outside the good graces of those conspirators what intricate network of hatred and crime was here suggested the desire to know the truth overcame all thought of his own safety so he began to question those around him heedless of the fact that he was being hunted in this very block the crowd was growing an officer returned after sending a call for an ambulance and began to force the people back van damme discovered a voluble old woman evidently a shopkeeper who seemed better informed than the others and to her he applied himself do i know him indeed she cried shrilly in answer to his question and who should know him better than i emile le duc a fine boy sir of the very best family think of it to be murdered like this ah that's what comes of a bad life sir but right at my own doorstep as you might say and in the light of day well well what can you expect he must have been mad to return with the whole city knowing him so well she was greatly excited and her voice broke under the stress of her feelings it doesn't help the neighbourhood you understand to have such things happen she ran on although nobody can say it's not as quiet and respectable hereabouts as the next place you've noticed as much yourself i dare say nothing ever happens a misfortune to all of us i call it why it's barely two hours ago that they brought a poor fellow out of this very alley with his head a lolloping around like a ball on a string he fell and hurt himself i hear although he looked perfectly dead to me think of that two in one day oh it doesn't help the neighbourhood although there's nobody in the whole block as would do another injury unless it might be that poor boy's cousin the old rip who lives in the fine house through yonder he's a bad one far worse than emile if i do say it who never speaks ill of my neighbours and there's others besides me who'll be sorry it isn't him instead of the young man who lies there with a hole through his ribs why i thought he was some masquerader up to his carnival pranks or drunk perhaps until i noticed him all over blood van damme drew the speaker into her shop which was near by then handed her a banknote come i want you to tell me all you know oh a detective eh not that i wouldn't tell you all i know without this ten dollars is it peace and love you are generous well then he has stood right in your tracks in this very store many's the time 
law what a lad he was nothing bad about him but just reckless we used to think of course that was before we learned the truth what do you mean you must be a stranger why the whole world knows the scandal it made a commotion i can tell you but the poor lad he's paid for all his evil deeds why sir he was dead when he walked out into the street he must have been a corpse even when i took him for a merrymaker strange things do happen on these carnival days they must have finished him with one stroke Ugh! they whom do you mean the old woman winked and wagged her head sagely oh you'll never learn who but we know you think the gang was broken up when emile went to prison but where do all these counterfeits come from eh? answer me that there's not a week goes by that one of em doesn't find its way into my store they're perfect or nearly so it would take a bank teller to find a flaw i'm always frightened to death till i work them off again for all i know this very ten dollar bill you gave me is bad but i'll risk it some people don't seem to mind them at all and so long as there's a chance to get rid of em why i don't object but that's how it all came about through counterfeit money sir they used a meal for a cat's paw so i've heard but when he was caught they let him take his punishment it was his cousin alfred le duc who got him to confess under promise of a light sentence they do say the old rascal fooled him into it for what reason nobody ever knew anyhow they sent emile away for ten years he threatened to turn state's evidence and perhaps he would have done so if he hadn't escaped ah so he broke jail exactly and they've been hunting him ever since with a reward on his head and all the time the counterfeits are still coming in and the police are as far from the truth as ever poor boy there he lies dead with a flower over his heart and i saw him fall this will kill his mother she's blind you know and very feeble he has a cousin madeline i believe raleigh ventured ah then you know her a blessed angel with a face like a picture and a heart of pure gold hark the old lady listened uh, there go the clock striking six that means masks off and the end of the carnival too bad too bad and emile with a flower over his heart like one in a dream roland van damme emerged from the foreign quarter into the broad reaches of canal street he had been gone nearly three hours the pavements were strewn with confetti and the litter of a mardi gras crowd but nowhere was a masker to be seen directly ahead of him loomed the grunewald a splendid tower of white brick and terracotta inside were his friends awaiting him perhaps he realized with a sinking sensation that eleanor bannerman was among them and that he had asked her to be his wife what a change three hours had brought to him why in that brief interval he had lived through all those very emotions the existence of which they had both denied earlier in the day life had opened for him and he had seen it in the raw on his hands was the blood of a fellow man on his lips the fragrance of a kiss that set his veins afire i say raleigh where have you been miss bannerman's strident voice demanded as he entered the cafe bless my soul exclaimed her father waving his prospective son-in-law to a chair with a pudgy hand we thought you were lost in the tall grass you miss tea but you're in time for a cocktail eleanor is quite cranky if she misses hers beastly stupid place don't you think miss bannerman inquired of her sweetheart oh i haven't found it so raleigh said with a sigh of relief fact is i've been quite entertained you have such absurd taste a dash of absinthe is mine if you please waiter papa has ordered the car attached to the evening train and we're dining aboard what do you say to pinehurst and a week of golf raleigh felt a sudden distaste for pinehurst for golf for all the places and people he had known a lovely he managed to say then summoning his courage i'll join you later perhaps sorry to break up the party but i've a little business here that will take a day or so business you how funny exclaimed eleanor too bad her father said it's bloomin hot here and the flies are awful the others joined in commiserating the young man when they arose to go upstairs and prepare for the train raleigh fell in behind them with miss bannerman see here eleanor are you sure you love me he asked 
she lifted her brows slightly not at all what put such an idea into your head you're a charming boy even if you are a bit romantic but love well, i thought we understood each other i've been thinking something unusual for me and i don't believe we're either of us quite ready to take the fatal plunge how does it strike you i'm in no hurry miss bannerman said indifferently let's call it off for the present we can try it on again in the autumn if we feel like it mighty sensible of you van dam told her with relief oh that's all right don't let this keep you away from pinehurst however the season's nearly over and we'll need you for a foursome she extended her hand and van dam took it gratefully her father called from the elevator see you in a few days raleigh good luck with your business and don't take any bad money mr banneman's use of slang was neither brilliant nor original but he was chuckling as the car shot up out of sight van dam hastened to the desk and called for a city directory then ran through it to the l's la le ah there it is le duc felice widow residence two forty seven boule street he made a note of the address then settled his hat upon his head lit a cigarette and walked jauntily out into the evening and turned toward canal street it was growing cool the street lights were gleaming long rows of them were festooned for blocks in all direction blazing forth in fanciful designs in a short time now the rex parade would be under way with its countless floats depicting the age of romance romance indeed smiled mr van dam contentedly why this was the age of romance something recalled mr banneman's parting words to him bad money the young man paused abruptly bad money what a coincidence he pictured a safe sunk into a library wall an open cash drawer jammed with neatly pinned packages of crisp new ten-dollar banknotes then he recalled the story of the garrulous old shopwoman raleigh came to himself with a jerk he began to laugh good lord he said aloud i wonder if cousin alfred's money was counterfeit he was still smiling as he bought a white gardenia and placed it in his buttonhole. End of Story 1, Part 3 Story 2, Rope's End, Part 1 A round moon flooded the thickets with gold and inky shadows. The night was hot, poisonous with the scent of blossoms and of rotting tropic vegetation it was that breathless overpowering period between the seasons when the trades were fitful before the rains had come from the caribbean rose the whisper of a dying surf slower and fainter than the respirations of a sick man in the north the bearded wrinkled haitian hills lifted their scowling faces they were trackless mysterious darker even than the history of the island beneath a thatched roof set upon four posts was a table spread with food and on it a candle burned steadily no wind came out of the hot darkness the flame rose straight and unwavering under a similar thatched shed a short distance away a group of soldiers were busy round a smouldering cook-fire there were other huts inside the jungle clearing through the dilapidated walls of which issued rays of light and men's voices Pédéome Laguerre, colonel of Tireuse in the Army of the Republic, wiped the fat of a roasted pig from his lips with the back of his hand. Using his thumbnail as a knife-blade, he loosened a splinter from the edge of the rickety wooden table, fashioned it into a toothpick, then laid himself back in a grass hammock. He had expected to find rum in the house of Julian Rameau, but either there had been none, or his brave soldiers had happened upon it. At any rate, supper had been a dry meal, only one of several disappointments of the day. The sack of the village had not been at all satisfactory to the colonel. One yellow woman dead, a few prisoners, and some smouldering ruins. Surely there was no profit in such business." reclining at ease he allowed himself to admire his uniform a splendid creation of blue and gold which had put him to much pains and expense it had arrived from port-au-prince barely in time to be of service in the campaign 
as for the shoes they were not so satisfactory shoes of any sort in fact cramped colonel petiome laguerre's feet and were refinements of fashion to which he had never fully accustomed himself he wore them religiously in public for a colonel who would be a general must observe the niceties of military deportment even in the haitian army but now he kicked them off and exposed his naked yellow soles gratefully on three sides of the clearing were thickets of guava and coffee trees long since gone wild a ruined wall along the beach road a pair of bleaching gate posts a mouldering house foundation showed that this had once been the site of a considerable estate these mute testimonials to the glories of the french occupation are common in haiti but since the blacks rose under toussaint l'ouverture they have been steadily disappearing the greedy fingers of the jungle have destroyed them bit by bit what were once farms and gardens are now thickets and groves in place of stately houses there are now nothing but miserable hovels cities of brick and stone have been replaced by squalid villages of board and corrugated iron peopled by a shrill-voiced quarrelling race over which in grim mockery floats the banner of the black republic inscribed with the motto liberty equality fraternity once haiti was called the jewel of the antilles and boasted its little paris of the west but when the black men rose to power it became a place of evil reputation a land behind a veil where all things are possible and most things come to pass in place of monastery bells there sounds the midnight mutter of voodoo drums the priest has been succeeded by the papeloi the worship of the virgin has changed to that of the serpent instead of the sacramental bread and wine men drink the blood of the white cock and so it is whispered eat the flesh of the goat without horns as he picked his teeth colonel petiome laguerre turned his eyes to the right peering idly into the shadows of a tamarind tree the branches of which overtopped the hut suspended from one of these was an inert shape mottled with yellow patches where the moonbeams filtered through the leaves it stirred swayed turned slowly resolving itself into the figure of an old man he was hanging by the wrists to a rawhide rope his toes were lightly touching the earth so now that monsieur rameau has had time to think perhaps he will speak said the colonel a sigh it was scarcely a groan answered miser that you are impatiently exclaimed the colonel your money can do you no good now is it not better to part with it easily than to rot in a government prison you understand uh, the jails are full many mulattoes like you will be shot to make room there is no money faintly came the voice of the prisoner my neighbors will tell you that i am poor both men spoke in the creole patois of the island not much perhaps but a little eh? just a little let us say why should i lie there is none bah it seems you are stubborn congo bring the boy laguerre spoke gruffly a man emerged from the shadows of the base of the tree and slouched forward he was a negro soldier and with musket and machete shuffled past the corner of the hut in the direction of the other houses pausing as the colonel said but wait there is a girl too i believe oh yes monsieur the wife of floreal good bring them both some moments later imploring voices rose a shrill entreaty in a woman's tones then congo and another tirailleur appeared driving ahead of them a youth and a girl the prisoners arms were bound behind them and although the girl was weeping the boy said little he stepped forward into the candlelight and stared defiantly at the blue and gold officer floriel rameau was a slim mulatto perhaps twenty years old his lips were thin and sensitive his nose prominent his eyes brilliant and fearless they gleamed now with all the vindictiveness of a serpent until that hanging figure in the shadows just outside turned slowly and a straying moonbeam lit the face of his father then a new expression leaped into them floriel's chin fell he swayed uncertainly upon his legs monsieur what is this 
he said faintly the girl cowered at his back your father persists in lying exclaimed laguerre what do you wish him to say oh a little thing his money can be of no further use to him money floriel voiced the word vacantly he turned to his wife saying monsieur le colonel asks for money we have none the girl nodded her lips moved but no sound issued she also was staring horror-stricken into the shadows of the tamarind tree her arms bound as they were threw the outlines of her ripe young bosom into prominent relief and showed her to be round and supple she was lighter in colour even than floreal a light scar just below her left eye stood out dull brown upon her yellow cheek laguerre now saw her plainly for the first time and shook off his indolence he swung his legs from the hammock and sat up something in the intensity of his regard brought her gaze away from the figure of papa rameau she saw a large thick-necked full-bodied black of bold and brutal feature whose determined eyes had become bloodshot from staring through dust and sun he wore a moustache and a little pointed woolly patch beneath his lower lip involuntarily the girl recoiled mm, so the barefoot colonel rose and stepping forward took her face in his harsh palm turning it up for scrutiny his roving glance appraised her fully your name is uh, pierrine to be sure well then my little pierrine you will tell me about this eh huh? i know nothing she stammered floreal speaks the truth monsieur what does it mean all this we are good people we harm nobody every one here was happy until the blacks rose then there was fighting and this morning you came it was terrible mamma cleomelie is dead the soldier shot her why do you hang papa julien floreal broke in hysterically yes monsieur he is an old man punish me if you will but my father he is old see he is barely alive these riches you speak about are imaginary we have fields cattle a schooner take them for the republic but monsieur my father has injured no one Petit-Homme Laguerre reseated himself in the hammock and swung himself idly, his bare soles scuffing the hard earthen floor. He continued to eye Pierrine. Now that young Rameau had brought himself to beg, he fell to his knees and went on, "'I swear to you that we are not traitors. Never have we spoken against the government. We are colored, yes, but the black people love us. They loved Cleomélie, my mother, whom the soldiers shot.' that was murder monsieur she would have harmed nobody she was only frightened the suppliant's shoulders were heaving his voice was choked by emotion she is unburied i appeal to your kind heart to let us go and bury her we will be your servants for life you wish money good we will find it for you i will work i will steal i will kill for this money you wish i swear it but old julien he is dying there on the rope floreal raised his tortured eyes to the black face above him then his babbling tongue fell silent and he rose interposing his body between pierrine and the colonel it was evident that the latter had heard nothing whatever of the appeal for he was still staring at the girl floreal strained until the rawhide thongs cut into his wrists his bare yellow toes gripping the hard earth like the claws of a cat until he seemed about to spring once he turned his head curiously fearfully toward his young wife then his blazing glance swung back to his captor the silence roused laguerre finally and he rose speak the truth he commanded roughly otherwise you shall see your father dance a bambula while my soldiers drum on his ribs with the cocomaque he is feeble his bones are brittle said the son thickly as for you my little pierrine you will come to my house then if these wicked men refuse to speak perhaps you and i will reach an understanding laguerre grinned evilly monsieur with a furious curse floreal flung himself in the path of the black man the wife retreated in speechless dismay petit-homme thrust young rameau aside crying angrily you wish to live eh? well then the truth otherwise 
but she Pererine, panted floriel with a twist of his head in her direction i may allow her to go free who can tell he led the girl out across the moonlit clearing and to the largest house in the group he reappeared making the door fast behind him and returned stretching himself in the hammock once more now congo he ordered let us see who will speak first taking a pipe from his pocket he filled it with the rank native tobacco and lighted it the tirailleur he had addressed selected a four-foot club of the jointed cocomacaque wood such as is used by the local police and with it smote the suspended figure heavily old julien groaned his son cried out the brutality proceeded with deliberation the body of old julien swung drunkenly spinning swaying writhing in the moonlight floriel shrank away retreating until his back was against the table he clutched its edge with his numb fingers for support he was young he had seen a little of the ferocious cruelty which characterized his countrymen this was the first uprising against his color that he had witnessed every blow which seemed directed at his own body made him suffer until he became almost as senseless as the figure of his father his groping fingers finally touched the candle at his back it was burning low and the blaze bit at them with the pain there came a thought wild fantastic he shifted his position slightly until the flame licked at his bonds colonel laguerre was in the shadow now watching the torture with approval maximilien the other soldier rested unmoved upon his rifle floriel leaned backward and shut his teeth an agony ran through his veins the odor of burning flesh rose faintly to his nostrils softly congo directed the colonel after a time let him rest for a moment turning to the son he inquired oh, will you see him die rather than speak floriel nodded silently his face was distorted and wet with sweat laguerre rose with a curse little pig i will make your tongue wag if i have to place you between planks and saw you in twain but you shall have time to think maximilian will guard you and in the morning you will guide me to the hiding place meanwhile we will let the old man hang i have an appetite for pleasanter things than this he turned toward the house in which pierrine was hidden whereat floriel strained at his bonds calling after him la guerre she is my wife by the church my wife betty Ohm opened the door silently and disappeared Umph, the colonel amuses himself while i tickle the sides of this yellow man said congo in some envy i don't believe there is any money maximilian observed what am i right he turned inquiringly to floriel but the latter had regained his former position and the candle flame was licking at his wrists oh to be sure this is a waste of time make an end of the old man congo and i will take the boy back to his prison it is late and i am sleepy the speaker approached his captive his musket resting in the hollow of his arm his machete hanging at his side so now don't strain so bitterly he laughed i tied those knots and they will not slip for i have tied too many yellow men to-morrow you will be shot monsieur and pierrine will be a widow so why curse the colonel if he cheats you by a few hours Congo was examining his victim, and uttered an exclamation, at which Maximilian paused, with a hand upon Floriel's shoulder. "'Is he dead?' Oh, "'The club was heavier than I thought,' answered Congo. "'He brought it upon himself. Well, the prison at Jacmel is full of colored people. This will leave room for one more.' Maximilian's words suddenly failed him. His thoughts were abruptly halted for he found that in some unaccountable manner young rameau's hands had become free and that the machete at his own side was slipping from its sheath the phenomenon was unbelievable it paralyzed maximilian's intellect during that momentary pause which is required to reconcile the inconceivable with the imminent it is doubtful if the trooper fully realized what had befallen or that any danger threatened for his mind was sluggish and under rameau's swift hands his soul had begun to tug at his body before his astonishment had disappeared 
the blade rasped out of its scabbard whistled through its course and maximilian lurched forward to his knees the sound of the blow like that of an axe sunk into a rotten tree trunk surprised congo a shout burst from him he raised the stout cudgel above his head for floreal was upon him like the blurred image out of a nightmare the trooper shrieked affrightedly as the blade sheared through his shield and bit at his arm he turned to flee but his head was round and bare and it danced before the oncoming floreal rameau cleft it as he had learned to open a green coconut with one stroke on the hard earth maximilian was scratching and kicking as if to drag himself out of the welter in which he lay floreal cut down his father and received the limp figure in his arms as he straightened it he heard a furious commotion from the campfire where the other tirailleurs were squatted from the tail of his eye he saw that they were reaching for their weapons he heard laguerre shouting in the hut then the crash of something overturned as he rose from his father's body he heard a shot and saw the soldiers of the republic charging him they were between him and pierrine he hesitated then slipped back into the shadow of the tamarind tree and out at the other side his cotton garments flickered briefly through the moonlight then the thicket swallowed him his pursuers paused and emptied their guns blindly into the ink-black shadows where he had disappeared when colonel laguerre arrived upon the scene they were still loading and firing without aim and he had some difficulty in restoring them to order blood they were accustomed to but blood of their own letting this was very different this was a blow at the government at their own established authority such an appalling loss of life seldom occurred to regular troops of the republic it was worse than a pitched battle with the dominicans and it excited the troopers terribly perhaps he had been mistaken and there was no money thought the colonel as he returned to his quarters after a time of course the girl still remained and he could soon force the truth from her but she was the only source of information left now that floreal had escaped for laguerre had noted carelessly that the body of julien had hung too long it was annoying to be deceived in this way but perhaps the day had not been without some profit after all he mused the road to the dominican frontier was rough and wild all haiti was aflame every village was peopled by raging blacks who had risen against their lighter-hued brethren among the fugitives who slunk along the winding bridle paths that once had been roads there was a mulatto youth of scarcely twenty who carried a machete beneath his arm in his eyes there was a lurking horror his wrists were bound with rags torn from his cotton shirt he spoke but seldom and when he did it was to curse the name of Pedéome Laguerre. End of Story 2, Part 1 Part 2 Floreal took up his residence across the border. The countries had long been at war, so he found reason to change his name. He likewise changed his language, although that was not so easily accomplished, and then, since he had been born of the sea, he returned to it but he could not bring himself to utterly forsake the island of his birth for twice a year when the seasons changed when the trades died and the hot lands sent their odours reeking through the night he felt a hungry yearning for haiti during these periods of lifeless heat his impulses ran wild at these times his habits changed and he became violent nocturnal as he thought of petit laguerre he bit his wrists in an agony of recollection women shunned him men said to one another this innocencio is a person of uncertain temper he has a bad eye whence did he come others inquired he's now one of us from jamaica or the barbados perhaps he has much evil in him yet he makes no enemies nor friends mm, a peculiar fellow a man of passion one can see it in his face haiti had become quiet once more as quiet as could be expected and the former colonel of tirailleurs had prospered he was now general petit laguerre commandant of the arrondissement of the south and the echo of his name crept eastward along the coast even to azua 
the bitterness of this news finally sent innocencio seaward in a barkentine the business of which was not above suspicion he cruised through the virgin islands on around the leewards and the windwards seeing something of the world and tasting of its wickedness a year later at trinidad he fell in with a portuguese half-breed captain of a schooner bound on hazardous business and inasmuch as high wages were promised he shipped followed adventures of many sorts during which inocencio became a mate but made no friends one night when the moon was full and the schooner lay becalmed there was drinking and gambling in the little cabin it was the change of the seasons before the rains had come the air was close the ship reeked with odours inocencio played like a demon for his heart was fierce and the cards befriended him all night he and the portuguese half-breed shuffled and dealt drank rum and cursed each other when daylight came the schooner had changed hands colon sits on the southern shore of the caribbean and through it drifts a current of traffic from many seas it is like the riffle of a sluice or the catch basin of a sewer gathering all the sediment carried by the stream and thither captain inocencio headed drawn on the tide it was at the time of the french fiasco when de lesseps name was powerful and when cologne was the wickedest sickest city of the western hemisphere into the harbour came inocencio's schooner pelting ahead of the stiff trade winds that blew like the draught from an electric fan and there the haitian stayed for in cologne he found work that suited him there he heard the echo of tremendous undertakings there he learned new rascalities and met men from other lands who were homeless like himself there he tasted of the white man's wickedness and beheld forms of corruption that were strange to him the nights were ribald and the days were drear for fever stalked the streets but inocencio was immune and for the first time he enjoyed himself but he was solitary in his habits the festering town with its green slimed sewers and its filthy streets did not appeal to him so he took up his abode on the shore of a little bay close behind where a grove of palm trees overhung a sandy beach just across a mangrove swamp at his back was the city before him lay his schooner her bowsprit pointed seaward day and night it pointed seaward like a resolute finger pointed toward haiti and pierrine in time the mulatto acquired a reputation and gathered a crew of ruffians over whom he tyrannized there were women in his camp too bajon saint lucien and wenches from the other isles but neither they nor their powdered sisters along the back streets of cologne appealed to inocencio very long for sooner or later there always came to him the memory of a yellow girl with a scar beneath her eye and thoughts of her brought pictures of a blue and gold negro colonel and an old man hanging by the wrists then it was that he felt a slow flame licking at his tendons and his hatred blazed up so suddenly that the women fled from him bearing marks of his fingers on their flesh sometimes he sailed away and was gone for weeks when he returned his crew told stories of aimless visits to the haitian coast in which there appeared to be neither reason nor profit since they neither took nor fetched a cargo these journeys came at regular intervals as if there arrived upon the hurrying trades a call that took him northward just before the seasons changed his helpers retailed other gossip also rumors of a coming revolution in the republic tales of the great general Bedeon laguerre who had aims upon the presidency inocencio's ears were open and what he heard stirred his rage but he was not a brilliant man and his brain unused to strategy refused to counsel him for five years he had studied the matter incessantly nursing his hate and searching for a means to satisfy it then as if born of the lightning he saw his way he consulted a french clerk in the canal offices and between them they contrived a letter which ran as follows to his excellency general pedeon laguerre commandant of the arrondissement of the south jacmel republic of haiti 
general the bearer innocencio ruiz of cartagena master of the schooner stella will consult you upon a matter of extreme delicacy which concerns the sale of two hundred rifles these arms of latest model were consigned to this port but under the existing relations of amity between the french and colombian governments they cannot be used knowing your patriotism and the zeal with which you safeguard the welfare of your country the writer makes bold to offer these arms to you as agent of the haitian government at a low figure captain ruiz a man of discretion is empowered to discuss the matter with you at greater length in full appreciation of your supreme qualities as a soldier and statesman it is with admiration that i salute you respectfully antoine leblanc when the letter was finally read to innocencio he nodded but the french clerk said doubtfully this laguerre is a man of force i believe i should not care to trifle with him in this way i too am a man of force said the mulatto he is your enemy to the death the white man shook his head danger lurks along the haitian coast many things happen there for the people are barbarians i should prefer to forgive this petty homme rather than oppose him even though he were my enemy innocencio scowled when i die i shall have no enemies to forgive for i shall have killed them all he said simply jacmel lay white in the blazing sun as the cella dropped anchor the trades were failing and the schooner drifted slowly under a full spread of canvas near where she came to rest lay a haitian gunboat ill-painted ill-manned ill-disciplined and innocencio regarded her with some concern for her presence was a thing he had not counted upon it argued either that laguerre had won the support of her commander or that she had been sent by the government as a check upon his activities in either event she was a menace a band was playing in the square and there were many soldiers innocencio did not go ashore instead he sent the letter by a member of his crew a giant bon whom he trusted and with it he sent word that he hoped to meet his excellency general laguerre that evening at a certain drinking place near the waterfront the sailor returned at dusk with news that set his captain's eyes aglow jacques was alive with troops there had been a review that very afternoon and the populace had hailed the commandant as president on all sides there was talk of revolution the whole south country had enrolled beneath the banner of revolt the gunboat was laguerre's all haiti craved a change the old familiar race cry had been raised and the mulattoes were in terror of another massacre but the regular troops were badly armed and the perusal of innocencio's letter had filled the general with joy captain ruiz was early at the meeting-place but he waited patiently drinking rum and listening to the chatter of the street his spanish accent his identity as the master of the schooner in the offing and above all his threatening eyes won him a tolerance which the warlike blacks did not accord to haitians of his color therefore he was not molested he soon confirmed his sailor's story revolution was indeed in the air the country was seething with unrest many houses already had been burned sure token of an uprising the soldiers had had a taste of pillage and persecution the streets were thronged with them now merchants were on guard before their shops from every side came the sounds of revelry and quarrelling laguerre arrived finally a huge forbidding man of martial bearing and he was heralded by cheers he was much older and infinitely prouder than when innocencio had seen him his uniform had been blue at that time but now it was parrot green his epaulets were broader the gold braid and the dangling loops were heavier and he was fat from easy living with age and power he had coarsened but his eyes were still bloodshot and domineering captain ruiz he inquired pausing before the yellow man your excellency innocencio rose and saluted the seaman's eyes were smouldering but his lips were cold for he felt the dread of recognition 
time it seemed had dulled the sharp outlines of laguerre's memory as it had changed the younger man's features for he continued unsuspectingly you are the agent of monsieur leblanc i believe the same good now these rifles uh, you will have them nearby within gunshot excellency they are in the harbour at this moment laguerre's face lighted ah a man of business this leblanc you will fix the price as i understand it there followed a certain amount of bickering during which the general allowed himself to be worsted he agreed weakly to innocencio's terms having already decided to appropriate the god-sent cargo without payment the latter had counted upon this and moreover he had rightfully construed the light in those bloodshot eyes and monsieur le general must see these rifles for himself to appreciate them and he must count them too else how can he know that i am not deceiving him we must observe caution for there may be spies innocencio spoke craftily pa spies jacmel nevertheless there is a gunboat in the harbour and she flies the flag of the republic my skiff is waiting we will slip out and back again in an hour the inspection will be completed you must see those rifles with your own eyes excellency they are wonderful the equal of any in the world no troops can stand before them they are magnificent oh, come said laguerre rising but alone innocencio displayed a worthy circumspection this is hazardous business that warship with the flag of the republic my employer is a man of reputation very well laguerre dismissed an aide who had remained at a distance during the interview and together the two set out you arrived barely in time for we march to-morrow said the general at least we march within the week my defiance has gone forth my country cries for her defender there will be bloody doings for i tell you the temper of the people is roused and they have no stomach for that tyrant at port au prince bloody doings innocencio smiled admiringly upon his companion and who could cope with them better than yourself you have a reputation excellency the name of petitome laguerre is known even in my country indeed the black general's chest swelled we have heroes of our own men who have bathed in blood defending our rights but our soldiers are only soldiers they are not statesmen we are not so fortunate as haiti we would welcome we would idolize such a one would that we had him would that we boasted a petit homme la guerre the hearer was immensely gratified at this flattery and he straightened himself pompously saying but we are favoured by god we haitians and we have bred a race of giants we have gained our proud position among the nations at the price of blood believe me we are not ordinary men our soldiers are braver than lions our armies are the admiration of the world we have reached that level for which god created us it requires strong hands to guide such a people my country calls i am her servant the moon was round and brilliant as they walked out upon the rotting wharf all wharves in haiti are decayed the night had grown still and through it came the gentle whisper of the tide mingled with the babble from the town landowners combined with the pungent stench of the harbour in a scent which caused innocencio's nostrils to quiver and memory to gnaw at him he cast a worried look skyward and in his ungodly soul prayed for wind for a breeze for a gentle zephyr which would put his vengeance in his hands he had dropped anchor well off shore hence the row was long but as they neared the stella a breath came out of the open it was hot stifling as if a furnace door had opened and the yellow man smiled grimly into the night the crew were sleeping on the deck as the two came overside but at sight of that glittering apparition of green and gold they rubbed their eyes open and stared in speechless amazement they were reckless fellows fit for any enterprise but innocencio had learned to keep a silent tongue so they knew nothing of his present plans they heard him saying into the cabin monsieur le general if you will be so good it is dark yes but there will be light presently and then a sight for any soldier's eyes something that will gladden the heart of any patriot they went below leaving the sailors open-mouthed 
a miserable place excellency came the soft voice but the cause for haiti one would suffer a match if you will be so kind the lamp is at your hand the skylight glowed a faint yellow then was brightly illuminated for haiti one would endure uh, much there followed the sound of a blow of a heavy fall then a loud ferocious cry and a subdued scuffling during which the crew stared at one another the giant bayon crept forward finally and was met by innocencio emerging from the cabin the captain was smiling and he carefully closed the hatch before he gave orders to make sail the breeze was faint so the schooner gathered headway slowly but as the lights of jacmel and of the anchored gunboat faded out astern innocencio sat upon the deck-house and drummed with his naked heels upon the cabin wall he lit one cigarette after another and the helmsman saw that he was laughing silently dawn broke in an explosion of many colors the sun rushed up out of the sea as if pursued night fled and in its place was a blistering day full grown the breeze had died however and the stella wallowed in a glassy calm her sails slatting her booms creaking her gear complaining to the drunken roll the slow swells heeled her first to one side then to the other the decks grew burning hot no faintest ripple stirred the undulating surface of the caribbean afar the haitian hills wavered and danced through a veil of heat the slender topmast described long measured arcs across the sky like a schoolmaster's pointer from its peak the halyards whipped and bellied captain the bayan waited for recognition captain innocencio looked up finally there beyond jacmel there is smoke see we have been watching it the mulatto nodded the smoke of a ship ah a ship innocencio smiled and the negro recoiled suddenly all night long the master of the stella had sat upon the deck-house staring at the sea and smoking at times he had laughed and whispered to some one whom the helmsman could not see but this was the first time he had smiled at any member of his crew in fact it was the first time the sailor had ever seen him smile the bayan withdrew and went forward to consult with his fellows they eyed their employer curiously fearfully for much had happened to alarm them not the least of which had been a furious commotion from below frightful curses had issued from the cabin threats which had caused their limbs to tremble but they had affected the captain like soothing music it was very strange it caused the sailors to look with concern upon that thin low streamer in the distance it led them to go aft in a body finally and speak their minds the smoke is growing larger they declared and innocencio roused himself sufficiently to look it is the warship we are pursued who is this big man below he is a um, friend of mine a petit homme la guerre la guerre what did i tell you exclaimed the bahan breathlessly what shall we do one of them inquired in a panic that smoke the wind has forsaken us he shuffled his bare feet uncomfortably we will be shot for this innocencio tossed away his cigarette and rose he lifted his eyes aloft the slim topmast arrested his attention as it swept across the sky and he watched it for a moment then to the giant sailor he said you will find a new rope forward make it fast to the end of this halyard and run it through yonder block he slid back the hatch and descended leisurely into the cabin laguerre was sitting in a chair with his arms and legs securely bound but he had succeeded in working considerable havoc with the furnishings of the place as well as with his splendid uniform his lips foamed his eyes protruded at sight of his captor a trickle of blood from his scalp lent him a ferocious appearance innocencio seated himself and the two men stared at each other across the bare table laguerre spoke first his tongue thick his voice hoarse from yelling innocencio listened with fixed unwavering gaze you tricked me neatly the former raved you are a government spy i presume the government feared me well then it was bold work but you will listen to what i say now we will settle this matter quickly you and i i have money you can name your price 
the hearer curled his thin lips so you have money you offer to buy your life old julien had no money he was poor pettyhome did not understand i am too powerful to remain in prison he declared and the president would not dare harm me no man dares harm me but i am willing to pay you all haiti could not buy your life laguerre some tone of voice some haunting familiarity of feature set the prisoner's memory to groping blindly at last he inquired who are you i am floriel the name meant nothing laguerre's life was black many floriels had figured in it you do not remember me no and yet perhaps you will remember another a woman she had a scar just here the speaker laid a tobacco-stained finger upon his left cheekbone and laguerre noticed for the first time that the wrist beneath it was maimed as from a burn it was a little scar and it was brown in the candlelight she was young and round and her body was soft the mulatto's lean face was suddenly distorted in a horrible grimace which he intended for a smile she was my wife laguerre by the church and you took her she died but she had a child your child the huge black figure shrank into its green and gold panoply the bloodshot eyes rested upon innocencio with a look of terrified recognition i have no children laguerre no wife no home i am poor and you have become great there was an old man whom you stretched by the wrists in the moonlight do you remember him and the old woman my mother whom one of your soldiers shot maximilian did it but i killed him and congo and now there is only you that was long ago the prisoner rolled his eyes desperately his voice was uncertain as he whined i, I am rich r richer than anybody knows others had more money than we eh the general nodded perrien is dead and you would have been the president it is well that i came in time again captain ruiz smiled and the corpulent soldier was shaken loosely as by an invisible hand come now your friends are approaching and i must prepare you to greet them he untied the knots at laguerre's ankles then motioned him toward the cabin door that streamer of smoke had grown it was a black smudge against the sky when the two gained the deck and at sight of it the general shouted my ship the gunboat oh if harm comes to me innocencio took one end of the new rope which had been run through the block at the masthead and knotted it about his prisoner's wrists then with his knife he severed the other bonds give way he ordered the crew held back at which he turned upon them so savagely that they hastened to obey they put their weight upon the line laguerre's arms were whisked above his head he felt his feet leave the deck he was dumb with surprise choked with rage at this indignity but he did not understand its significance up with him in a rush cried the captain and hand over hand the sailors hauled in while upward in a series of jerks went petitome laguerre the schooner listed and he swayed outward he tried to entwine his legs in the shrouds but failed and he continued to rise until his feet had cleared the cross tree make fast innocencio ordered laguerre was hanging like a huge plumb-bob now and as the schooner heeled to starboard he swung out farther and farther until there was nothing beneath him but the glassy sea he screamed at this and kicked and capered the slender topmast sprung to his antics then the vessel righted herself and as she did so the man at the rope's end began a swift and fearful journey not until that instant did his fate become apparent to him but when he saw what was in store for him he ceased to cry out he fixed his eyes upon the mast toward which the weight of his body propelled him he drew himself upward by his arms he flung out his legs to break the impact the stella lifted by the bow and he cleared the spar by a few inches onward he rushed to the pause that marked the limit of his flight to port then slowly but with increasing swiftness he began his return journey 
again he resisted furiously and again his body missed the mast all but one shoulder which brushed lightly in passing and served to spin him like a top the measured slowness of that oscillation added to its horror with every escape the victim's strength decreased his fear grew and the end approached it was a game of chance played by the hand of the sea under him the deck appeared and disappeared at regular intervals the rope cut into his wrists the slim spar sprung to his efforts in the distance was a charcoal smear which grew blacker after a time laguerre heard innocencio counting and saw his upturned face ah very close monsieur le general but we will try once again ship's timber is not so hard as cocomacaque but sufficiently hard nevertheless and the rope bites eh? but there was old julien what again uh, you are always lucky his flesh was cold and his bones brittle yet he did not kick like you if Perrine were here to see this what a sight the liberator of his country god's blood laguerre the sea is with you that makes five times but you are tiring i see what a sight for her the hero of a hundred battles dangling like a strangled parrot it is not so hard to die monsieur it uh a cry of horror arose from the crew who had gathered forward for petitome laguerre dizzied with spinning had finally fetched up with a crash against the mast he ricocheted the swing of the pendulum became irregular for a time or two then the roll of the vessel set it going again time after time he missed destruction by a hair's breadth while the voice from below jibed at him then once more there came the sound of a blow dull yet loud and of a character to make the hearers shudder the victim struggled less violently he no longer drew his weight upward like a gymnast but he was a man of great vitality his bones were heavy and thickly padded with flesh therefore they broke one by one and death came to him slowly the sea played with him maliciously saving him repeatedly only to thresh him the harder when it had tired of its sport it was a long time before the restless caribbean had reduced him to pulp a spineless boneless thing of putty which danced to the spring of the resilient spruce they let him down finally and slid him into the oily water overside but the breeze refused to come and the stella continued to wallow drunkenly the sky was glittering the pitch was oozing from the deck in the distance the haitian mountains scowled through the shimmer innocencio turned toward the approaching gunboat which was very close by now a rusty ill-painted ill-manned tub her blunt nose broke the swells into foam from her peak depended the banner of the black republic symbolic of the motto liberty equality fraternity the captain of the stella rolled and lit a cigarette then seated himself upon the cabin roof to wait and as he waited he drummed with his naked heels and smiled for he was satisfied end of story two part two story three innocencio part one captain innocencio prepared to let himself over the side of the schooner outside the caribbean was all agleam save where the coral reef teeth gnashed it into foam inside a sand beach yellow in the moonlight curved east and west like a causeway until the distance swallowed it back of that lay the groves of coconut trees their plumes waving in the undying undulations that had never ceased since first the trade winds breathed upon them beneath the palms themselves the jungle was ink black patched here and there with silver the air was heavy with the slow rumble of an ever restless surf and all about the sea was whispering whispering as if minded to tell its mysteries to the moon not yet two hours high it was the sort of night that had ever awakened wild impulses in captain innocencio's breast it was on such a night that he had first felt the touch of a woman's lips 
it was on such another night that he had first felt a man's warm blood upon his hands that had been long ago to be sure in far haiti and since that time both of those sensations had lost much of their novelty for he had lived fast and hard and his exile had plunged him into many evils it was on such a night also that he had begun his wanderings fleeing southward between moonrise and moonset southward whither all the scum of the indies floated but even to this day when the full of a february moon came round with the fragrant salt trades blowing and the sound of a throbbing surf beneath it the sated stagnant blood of captain innocencio went hot his thin mulatto face grew hard and a certain strange exultance blazed within him his crew had long since come to recognize this frenzy and had they now beheld him poised half nude at the rail his fierce eyes bent upon the forbidden shore they would have ventured no remark as it happened however they were all asleep all three of them and the captain's lip curled scornfully what could black men know about such subtleties as the call of moonlight what odds to them if yonder palm fronds beckoned they had no curiosity no resentfulness otherwise they too might have dared to break the sandblast law it was four years now since he had begun to sail this coast and even though he was known on every quay and bay from nombre de dios to tiburon and even though it was recognized that the signor bill williams paid proper price for cocoa and ivory nuts his head trader had never beaten down the people's distrust on the contrary their vigilance had increased if anything and now after four years of scrupulous fair dealing he captain innocencio was still compelled to sleep off shore and under guard like any common stranger it had made the haitian laugh at first for who would wish to harm a san blas woman with the streets of cologne but a hundred miles to the west then as the months crept into years and for voyage after voyage he never saw a san blas woman's face he became furious next he grew angry then sullen and a sense of injury burned into him he set his wits against theirs but invariably the sight of his schooner's sails was a signal for the women to melt away invariably when night came and he and his blacks had been herded back aboard their craft the women returned and the sound of their voices served to fan the flame within his breast night after night in sheltered coves or open river mouths the captain of the espirita had lain belly down upon the little roof of the deck-house his head raised serpent-wise his gloomy eyes fixed upon the cook-fires in the distance and when some woman's figure suddenly stood out against the firelit walls or when some maiden's song came floating seaward he had breathed curses in his bastard french and directed a message of hate at the sentinel he knew was posted in the jungle shadows at times he had railed at his crew of spiritless jamaican niggers and lusted for a following of his own kind men with the french blood of his island in their veins men who would follow where the moonlight flickered he had even gone so far at one time as to search the waterfronts from port limon to santa marta in quest of such fellows he had winnowed the off-scourings of the four seas gathered there but without success they were villainous chaps for the main part crossed with many creeds and colours and ready for any desperate venture but he could not find three helpers of sufficient hardihood to tamper with the san blas virgins instead they had retold him the tales he already knew by heart tales of swift and sudden retribution overtaking blacks and whites retribution that did not halt even at the french or the hated americanos they told him that of all the motley races gathered here since earliest spanish days the san blas blood alone retained its purity it was his boss the signor williams who had gone back farthest into history and it was he likewise who had threatened him with prompt discharge if he presumed to trespass the signor williams was not one to permit profitable trade relations to be jeopardized by the whim of a haitian mulatto innocencio had listened passively then when alone smiled 
he owed no loyalty he had no law even the name he went by was a fiction he continued to make his trips and when he came driving in ahead of the humming trade winds his schooner laden with the treasures of the islands the back streets of cologne awoke to his presence and prepared to greet him but however loud the music in the cantinas however fierce the exultation of the liquor in him however wild the orgy into which he plunged he could never quite drown the memory of those sleepless vigils far to the eastward ever in his quiet moments he heard the faint song of san blas women wafted by the breath of the sea ever in his dreams he saw the slim outlines of girlish figures black against a flaring campfire four years this thing had grown upon him during which he had haunted the san blas coast and then one night he slipped overside and swam ashore it was not so dangerous as it seemed for once he had gained the shelter of the jungle no less than a pack of hounds could have followed him inasmuch as the thickets were laced by a network of trails that gave forth no sound to naked souls and the rustling branches overhead played upon by the never-ceasing breeze drowned all signal of his presence once he had defied the tribal law he knew no further peace it was like the first taste of blood to an animal thereafter inocencio the outlaw whose name was a symbol of daring became a jackal prowling through the midnight glades tasting the scent of the villages and staring with hungry eyes from just beyond the shadow's edge rather he became a panther for in his caution was no cowardice only a feline patience village after village he hunted until he had marked his prey then he waited to spring to be sure he had never spoken with the girl nor even seen her clearly but the sound of her voice made him tremble to accomplish even this much had taken many trips of the espirita had meant many sleepless nights and some few tense moments when only the shadows saved him from betrayal there had been times for instance when the quick simulation of a wild pig's grunt or the purr of el tigre had served to explain the sound of his retreat other times when he had stood motionless in the shadows the evil rust-red blade of his machete matching the hue of his half-nude body to-night he crouched behind the deck-house and ran his eyes over the schooner in one final glance of caution it was well that all should be in readiness for the moment of his springing might come within the hour or if not to-night then to-morrow night or a week a month a year from to-night and then a tackle fouled or a block jammed might spell destruction he thrust his head through a loop of the leathern scabbard and swung the huge knife back until it lay behind the crease between his shoulders then he seized the port stay and let himself softly downward overside the water rose to his chin without a ripple he glided into the moonlight astern and a moment later his round black head was no more than a piece of bobbing drift borne landward by the current down past the village he swam noting the rows of dugouts on the beach he saw a blot in the big mahogany cayuca a great canoe hewn from one priceless trunk and recognized it for the sentinel on he floated then worked his way ashore behind the little point once he felt the hard smooth sand beneath his soles he waited until a cloud obscured the moon and when the light broke through again he was dripping underneath a wide-leaved breadfruit tree at the jungle's edge removing the machete from his neck he wrung the water from his cotton trousers over his head a night-bird croaked hoarsely the girl was at her father's house tending a fire on the dirt floor it was a large house for the old man was rich in daughters and by the san blas rule their husbands had come to live with him he had waxed fat long ago on their labors and now only his youngest one remained unmarried but the ceremony was set inocencio had heard the news upon his arrival three days before and had grudgingly bought a big store of tortoise-shell from the groom-to-be knowing full well that the money was intended for the wedding celebration marquina was the fellow's name a straight upstanding youth who more than once had excited the haitian's admiration for his skill with a canoe but since that day the latter had regarded him with smouldering eyes 
the big thatched roof with its bark floored loft stood on post blackened by the smoke of many feasts there were no walls the jungle crept close to it from the rear and hence the watcher could witness every movement of the girl as she passed between the hammocks or stooped to her task he could see for instance the play of her dark round shoulders above the neck of her shift he ground his yellow teeth and gripped the moist earth with the soles of his naked feet as a tiger bears its claws before the leap it was very hard to wait for an hour he stood there once a dog came to him and sniffed then recognizing a frequent visitor returned to the house and resumed its slumber beside the fire from the houses beyond came the sound of voices of a child crying querulously and of a woman quieting it people came and went an old hag began pounding grain in a mortar crooning in a broken voice the girl's father came rolling into view and after a word to her struggled heavily up the ladder to his bed he was snoring almost before the structure had ceased to creak beneath him in the thicket a multitude of nocturnal sounds arose the insect chorus of the night and then before innocencio realized what she was up to the girl had stolen swiftly out and passed him so close that he could hear the scruff of her sandals on the beaten path the next instant he had glided from cover and fallen in behind his pulses leaping his long lithe muscles rippling but he moved as silently as a shadow had he been a less accomplished bushman he might have lost her for she plunged into the jungle unhesitatingly however he had long ago learned these trails by daylight and knew them better than the lines of his own palm hence every moonlit turn every flash of her white slip found him close upon her track it puzzled him at first to discover her reason for this unexpected sally but soon he decided she must be bent upon some mission then when he saw that she purposely avoided the village and was bending toward the open palm grove abreast of his anchorage he knew she must be going to a tryst so marquina was the sentinel that fellow in the mahogany cayuca was her lover Innocencio, the dissolute felt a flame of rage suffuse him when at last his quarry emerged into the mysterious half-light under the high roof of palms and paused he strode after her she gave the melancholy call of the night-bird that had sounded in the breadfruit tree over his head earlier in the evening then seeing him close beside her uttered a little cry of pleasure not until he was too near for flight did she discover her mistake and then she seemed to freeze her utter silence was more menacing than a scream it was the instant for which he had schooled himself so he spoke to her in her own tongue make no outcry i will not arm you she drew back at which he laid his great bony hand upon her his eyes blazing she was deathly frightened being little more than a child i have waited for you many nights he explained i feared you would never come then as she continued to stare up at him uncomprehendingly he ran on i am innocencio the traitor every night i have watched you at your work i want you for my woman her voice had forsaken her utterly but she struggled weakly so he tightened his grip until his fingers sank into her flesh she began to gasp as if from a swift run the open neck of her garment slipped down over one shoulder her eyes were distended until he saw them ringed about with white the terror of this tall yellow man with the hungry eyes robbed her of power and she let him drag her toward the lapping water as if she were no more than some weak wild thing that he had trapped of course she knew him for while the san blas law may banish women it cannot blind them and she too had studied him from concealment although his words had made no impression whatever upon her his grasp and the direction he was drawing her had at last translated what was in his mind then she burst into life but she made no outcry for it takes strength to scream and every atom of her force was directed against his she began to moan her every muscle writhed with her free hand she tore at his entwining fingers but they were like jungle creepers that no human strength could serve to loosen and all the time he drew her with him speaking softly 
then she felt him pause and her distracted vision beheld another figure entering the shadows from the shore she called to her lover hoarsely and saw him halt at the strange note peering inward for a sight of her she voiced words now for the first time crying the stranger the stranger then hearing the scrape of her captor's machete as he drew it from its scabbard she renewed her struggle more fiercely captain inocencio held the girl at his left side until the last moment balancing the great knife blade as if to try his arm then when the indian was close upon him coming straight as a dart he freed himself a slanting moonbeam showed marquina's ferocious visage and his upraised weapon but the haitian met the falling blow with a fierce upward stroke that once before had done him service it was the stroke that had made him an exile years before inocencio's physical strength had ever been his pride if also his undoing above all things he prided himself upon the dexterity and vigor of his wrist his early training on that blood-red caribbean isle and a later life in thicket and swamp had served to transform the cumbrous native weapon into a thing of life at his hands more than once for instance he had harried a serpent until it struck for the mere satisfaction of severing its head in mid-course and now he felt the wide blade enter flesh before his antagonist could cry out twice he had slashed again this time downward as if to split a green coconut the next instant he had seized the girl as she fled into the jungle but she had found her voice at last and he was forced to muffle her with his palm when they were out into the moonlight however with the dry sand up to their ankles he let her breathe then pointing with his machete to the espirita lying white and ghost-like in the offing he drove her down into the warm sea until it reached her waist swim he ordered and when she would have renewed the alarm he raised his blade grimly threatening to call the sharks with her blood swim he repeated and she struck out with him at her shoulder but the village was roused a confused clamor betrayed its bewilderment and before the swimmers had won more than halfway to the schooner figures came running along the shore inocencio cautioned the girl to hold her tongue and she obeyed thoroughly cowed by his roughness she turned upon her side and swam with her face close to his her eyes fixed upon him curiously wonderingly her easy progress through the water showed that her fright had largely vanished and showed likewise that had the haitian been no common swimmer himself she might have distanced him all the way out to the boat she stared at him with that same fixed look maintaining her position at his side the moon and the salt brine in his eyes played him tricks else he might have fancied her to be half smiling as if in some strange exultation akin to his own not until he finally dragged her panting to the deck of the espirita and her white-clad figure stood out clearly from the shore did her tribesmen realize the nature of the alarm then the vibrant turmoil suddenly stilled for the space of a full minute while the enormity of the outrage made itself felt they drew together at the edge of the sea staring open-mouthed amazed before they raised their blood cry the man and woman arrested a moment their eyes upon the shore and where they stood twin pools of water blackened the deck then inocencio turned to look upon his prey the girl's flimsy cotton shift was molded to her figure and he saw that she was even fairer than he had pictured in spite of his need for haste he paused to gloat about the favor the moon and the salt sea had rendered him as for her she flung his glance back bravely until he wrenched open the cabin hatch and pointed to the dark interior then she weakened but she had a will of her own it seemed for she refused to be locked inside he strode toward her and she clutched the rigging desperately turning her glance to one of appeal you may come up in a moment he translated but still she clung to the stay if you try to escape he scowled upon her terribly at which she shook her head having already tasted her strength he knew that there was no time to force her so he leaped at his crew 
the three blacks were snoring forward of the deck-house so he seized a bucket of water at the rail and sluiced them into wakefulness keeping his eye upon the girl meanwhile when he saw that in truth she made no move he let his caution slip and raged over the ship like a tiger beating his half-clad crew ahead of him with the flat of his machete by the time they had gained their wits the tribesmen were massing at the canoes as the mainsail rose creaking he broke out the jib with his own hand then with one stroke of his knife severed the manila mooring rope and the espirita fell off slowly ahead of the breeze innocencio ran back to spur his befuddled niggers to further activity only to find the girl still motionless her eyes following his every movement under the curses the schooner slowly raised her wings and the night wind began to strain at the cordage but at last when the jamaicans were fully awake to the state of affairs they threatened mutiny whereat the mulatto flung himself upon them so savagely that they scattered to arm themselves with whatever weapons lay at hand then they huddled amidship rolling their eyes and praying for out from the shore came a long mahogany cayuca and it was full of straight-haired men it takes a sailing craft some time to gain its momentum and as yet the full strength of the trades had not struck the espirita hence the canoe overtook her rapidly innocencio called to one of his men and gave him the tiller then took stand beside the girl the naked blade of his weapon once more beneath his arm the schooner's helmsman gave himself to god while the cordage overhead began to whine as the deck rose it was upon the haitian's lips to warn his pursuers off when one of them called to the girl bidding her leap innocencio heard the breath catch in her throat but she made no move and the command was repeated this time she answered by some exclamation that he did not understand whereat the canoemen ceased paddling as if her word had paralyzed them they hurled their voices at her savagely but she remained motionless the while the waters beneath her began to foam and bubble the espirita's crew ceased their prayers and in the silence that ensued the sea whispered at the bow as the craft listed more heavily under the full force of the wind innocencio could not fathom the meaning of the subdued colloquy among the sandblast men so he shouted a warning but strangely enough they made no answer they only crouched with paddles motionless staring at the dimming figures facing them until the espirita wing and wing ahead of the trades was no larger than a seagull as yet they had not learned of the other tragedy hidden in the shadow of the palms had they suspected what lay weltering at the edge of a trampled moonlit glade behind them no threat of innocencio's no plea of his new-found woman could have held them back once the schooner was under way the haitian led the girl to the deck-house and thrust her roughly inside closing the hatch then with his own hands he took his craft through the reef and out into the leaping caribbean not until the sandblast coast was a mere charcoal line upon the port quarter and the salt spray was driving high did he deliver over the helm at last however he gave his crew instructions for the night and went below closing and bolting the hatch behind him when the smoky lamp that swung between the bunks was lit and its yellow gleam had illumined the interior he saw the girl's eyes fast upon him he went toward her across the tilting floor and she arose to meet him smiling end of story three part one part two signor bill williams was in a fine rage didn't you like your job he questioned innocencio shrugged languidly oh yes the job was good you knew i'd fire you see si. the american tempered his indignant glare with a hint of curiosity you must love that sandblast girl what do you say you must love her better than your job at least si senor i suppose so what is she like innocencio well she is like other women all women are alike only some are fat one time i had a female from martinique and she acted just the same as this one hm if she is like all the others what the devil made you do it 
signor you have plenty of money and yet one night i saw you bet two thousand pesos on the rouge why did you do that eh that is altogether different the haitian smiled i am tired of these females at cologne they are common people very common then too those san blas people they are so scared that somebody is going to steal a woman maybe if they had left me asleep on shore i would never have noticed no woman at all but they don't trust me so sure enough i steal one and you say she came willingly queried williams incredulously oh yes when her people commanded her to jump from my schooner she refused them i did not understand at the time but by and by she told me he swelled his chest with pride i guess she never seen so brave a man as me before eh senor i guess i never will sabe you niggers acknowledged the american innocencio corrected his recent employer but without show of the slightest heat i am no nigger senor i am haitian she is san blas indian my father was not even so dark as me black men have thick heads and you have to beat them but nobody ever beat me not even a white man when those niggers sleep i lie awake and study i make schemes that is why i left haiti do you understand that you've got me into a hell of a fix i've got to take a trip down there myself to square things innocencio lighted a black cigarette and blew the smoke through his nose evidently other people's troubles did not concern him recognizing the futility of reproach or indignation the former speaker continued but see here now this girl you can't keep her ah who's going to take her away interrogated the haitian quickly bah one man tried that and i killed him with my machete his thin lips drew back at the memory and for an instant his yellow face showed a hint of what had made his reputation she won't stay with you oh yes she will she was wild very wild at first but she will stay and how about her people they're bad hombres even the government lets them alone fortunately for you they won't make no trouble about that marquina he is quite dead i think by jove you're a cold-blooded brute signor you told me once that nobody had ever married a san blas female eh? yes even the old spaniards tried it but the blood is clean so far something unusual too in this country innocencio began to laugh silently as if at a joke some day maybe you will see a san blas half-breed playing in the streets of cologne said he i don't believe it i'll bet you my wages two hundred pesos come i'll show you you get out of here said the american roughly that's something i don't allow anybody to joke about and when the mulatto had gone he continued aloud by heaven this is sure a tough country for a white man innocencio strode through the streets toward the swamp that lies behind the town oblivious to the grilling midday heat that smote him from above from the concrete walks beneath and from the naked walls on every side it was before the days of the american occupation and the streets were nothing more than open cesspools the stench from which offended sorely buzzards flapped among the naked children at play in the mire beside the sewer ditches the place was filled with everything unhealthy and had long been known as the earth's great festering sore neither the orient nor the farthest tropics boasted another spot like cologne or aspenwall as it had been called with its steaming hip-deep streets and its brilliant flowering graveyards so hateful had it proved in fact that when seamen signed articles binding themselves to work their ships into any corner of the globe they inserted a clause exempting them from entering aspenwall now however the town was lively for this was the dry season when the fever was at its lowest and the resorts were filled with the flotsam and jetsam of a tropic world it was a polyglot town moreover set upon a fever-ridden mangrove isle serving as one terminus of the world's short-cut and in it had collected all the parasites that live upon the moving herd the french work of digging had but served to augment the natural population by a no less desperate set from overseas and now from the open doors of their cubbyholes women of every colour greeted the passer-by innocencio whose last exploit was already a thing of gossip received unusual attention there being no colour line in cologne town 
white yellow and black women fawned upon him and bade him tarry but he merely paused to listen or to fan their admiration by a word then idled onward pleased at the notice he evoked once fairly out of the pest hole he threaded his way through the swamp toward the other shore of the island blue land crabs scuttled among the mangrove roots at his approach the place was noisy with the hum of insects on every hand the heated mud gave forth a sound like the smack of huge moist lips but on the other side he came into a different domain here the sea breeze banished the hovering miasma the shore was of powdered coral sand a litter of huts drowsed beneath a grove of cocoa palms while a fleet of cayucas lay moored to stakes inside the breakers or bleaching in the sun captain inocencio was a person of some importance here for besides his occupation as a trader he exacted toll from a score or more of lazy blacks they were a lawless crew gathered from the remotest corners of the indies composed of jamaicans bayans and st lucians all reared to easy life and ripe for such an occasional crafty pilgrimage as inocencio might devise they had gathered around him naturally paying him scant revenue to be sure yet offering a certain loyalty that had its uses although the village was but a mile from the town itself inocencio's word was law when the colombian soldiers were called upon to visit the spot they came in numbers never singly the girl was seated on the rickety porch of his cabin her feet drawn under her her chin upon her knees the other women were gossiping loudly staring at her from a distance but her black eyes only smouldered sullenly he swore at the curious negro wenches and sent the girl about her household duties then stretched himself in the shade and eyed her complacently until he fell asleep it was a week later that one of his men came to him breathlessly to announce that the san blas indians were in the town how many queried inocencio four boatloads did they come to trade oh yes boss this was no unusual thing for they often displayed their little cargoes of nuts and fruits and vegetables upon the waterfront inocencio rose lazily and stretched then calling the woman explained the tidings to her i will go see them he announced finally oh boss cried the black man they will kill you he shrugged his brawny shoulders and thrusting the machete beneath his arm took the trail out through the mangrove swamp straight to the cologne waterfront he went and there flaunted himself before the men from down the coast here and there he strolled casting back their looks of hatred with a bravado that attracted all the idlers in the neighborhood wenches nudged one another and tittered nervously pointing him out and telling anew the story of his daring men watched him with wondering admiration and he heard them murmuring ah oh, that inocencio el diablo and so brave he would fight an army see the great arms of him and the eye like a tiger it was the keenest pleasure he had ever tasted as for his enemies they kept their silence they bartered their stock and having made their purchases raised sail and scudded away down the coast whence they had come inocencio got drunk that night for who could withstand the lavish flattery that poured from every cantina up and down the length of bottle alley who could resist the smiles of the chalk-faced females of cash street all eager to laud his bravery some time before morning he reeled into his shack beneath the palms to find the woman waiting fearfully he cursed at her for staring at him so and fell upon his bed in the months that followed he seldom lost an opportunity of showing himself to the san blas men when they came to town but in time this pleasure palled as all others had for the woman's kindred seemed incapable of resentment gradually also he became accustomed to her presence and spent much of his time among the women of cash street on one occasion he returned from an orgy of this sort to find her talking to one of his men a young barbadian with a giant frame it was only by accident due to the liquor in him that his hand went wild and he missed killing the fellow then he beat the woman unmercifully chancing to meet the senor williams on the street some time later he said buenos dias senor you see captain inocencio is still alive and the woman has not run away his former employer grunted as if neither phenomenon were worthy of comment 
i've heard how you rub it into those san blas fellows williams remarked i can't understand why they never avenged marquina bah they have heard of me said the haitian boastfully then with a grin you remember our bet senor i never made you a bet the american denied hotly but i've a mind to i've been here ten years and i think i know those people two hundred pesos you'll never have a child by her they won't allow it they'll get her and you too in ample time i tell you their blood is clean two hundred pesos that she brings me a san blas half-breed within two months smiled the mulatto insolently and williams exclaimed i'll do it it's worth two hundred silver to see a miracle bueno i'll bring him to you when he comes thereafter inocencio gave over beating the woman back at the little settlement beyond the swamp the coming event did not pass without comment and although the black women were kind to their straight-haired neighbor she never made friends with them nor did she ever accompany inocencio to town on the contrary she seemed obsessed by an ever-present dread and whenever she heard that her own people were near she concealed herself and did not appear again until they were gone bred into her deepest conscience was the certainty that her tribe would make desperate attempt to preserve its most sacred tradition and hence as the days dragged on and her condition became more pronounced her fears increased likewise she began to look forward to the birth of the child as the crisis upon which her own life hinged inocencio did his best to dissipate her fears explaining boastfully that the mere mention of his name was ample protection for her and did he wish it not even the army of the republic could take her from him but still she would not be convinced and then in the dark of the december moon the expected came it was that season when the rains were at their heaviest when rust and rot might be felt by the fingers a gray mold had crept over all things indoors a myriad of insect pests burdened the air in the rare intervals between showers every faintest draught deluged the huts from the dripping palm leaves overhead from the swamp arose a noxious vapor whenever the sun exposed itself tree toads shrilled incessantly outside the surf maintained its sullen murmur through the gloom of starless nights its phosphorescent outlines rushed across the reef like phantom serpents in parade in the dead of a night like this the visitors arrived even the heavy animal slumber of the blacks was broken by the scream that issued from the hut of captain inocencio and then the sound of such fighting the negroes might have rushed to the assistance of their leader had it not been for the echo of that awful woman cry hovering over the village like a shadow it filled the air and hung there saturating the breathless night with such unnameable terror that the awakened children began to whimper and the women buried their heads in the ragged bedding to keep it out death was among them and the bravest cowered while through the quivering silence there came the sounds of a mighty combat lasting for such an interminable time that the listeners became hysterical at length they discovered that the night was dead again save for the sudden patter of raindrops on the thatches when the palm fronds stirred one of them called shrilly another answered but they did not venture forth afterward they fancied they had heard the thrust of paddles in the lagoon and strange voices dwindling away to seaward but they were not sure eventually however the stillness got upon them more fearfully than the former noises and they stirred then in time they heard the voice of inocencio himself cursing faintly as if from a great distance a light showed through the cracks of a hut and nicholas the least timid emerged with a lantern held on high he summoned the rest around him then went toward the black shadow of inocencio's dwelling with a score of wide-eyed dusky faces at his shoulder the door was down and from the threshold they could see what the front room contained it was nicholas who with clattering teeth and nerveless fingers dragged a blanket from the bed and covered the woman's figure it was he who traced the feeble voice to the wreck of a room behind and strove to lift inocencio out of the welter in which he lay but the haitian blasted him with curses for opening his wounds so they propped him against the wall by his direction and bound him about with strips torn from the mattress 
then he called for a cigarette and its ashes were upon his breast when the french doctor arrived from the hospital on the point when the white man's work was done the mulatto addressed him weakly will monsieur do me a great favor certainly monsieur is acquainted with the american signor williams oui will monsieur le docteur please to tell him that captain innocencio has won his wager i don't understand listen in the room yonder under the bed monsieur will find a little boy baby rolled up in a blanket the woman heard them at the door and she was just in time oh she knew they would be coming the french doctor nodded his comprehension but your wife herself said he perhaps when you are well again you can have your vengeance the soldiers will bah what is the use interrupted intensencio the world is full of women then strangely enough he bared his yellow teeth in a smile of rarest tenderness but this boy of mine they came to kill him monsieur and to show that the san blas blood cannot be crossed but the woman was too quick of wit they did not find him praise god le docteur has seen many children perhaps but never a child like this he ran on with a father's tender boastfulness monsieur will note the back and the legs of him and see he did not even cry poor little man oh he is like his father for bravery he will be my vengeance for he has the san blas blood in him he will be a man like me too bring him to me quickly i must see him again he was still babbling fondly to the negroes about him when the doctor reappeared empty-handed the child is dead said the white man simply in the silence innocencio rose to a sitting posture his fierce eyes grew wild with a fright that had never been there until this moment then before they could prevent him he had gained his feet he waved them aside and went into the room of death walking like a strong man a candle guttering beside the open window betrayed the utter nakedness of the place with one movement of his great bony hands he ripped the planks of the bed asunder and stared downward then he turned to the east and raising his arms above his head gave a terrible cry he began to sway and even as the doctor leaped to save him he fell with a crash it was nicholas who told the priest that the french doctor would not let them move him for he lay upon his face at the feet of the san blas woman his arms flung outward like the arms of a cross end of story three part two story four the wag lady her real name was june well the rest doesn't matter for no one ever got beyond that point it was the scrap iron kid who first bore news of her coming to the wag boys knowing him for a poet they put down his perverted description as the logical outpouring of a romantic spirit reddy summed it up neatly by saying the kid has fell for another quilt that's all i ain't fell for no frill the kid stoutly declared i've saw too many to lose me out this gal's a thoroughbred another recruit for simons i suppose llewellyn yawned i'll drop in at the theatre and look her over ah she ain't no actor either scrap iron declared she's going to start a hotel bah if she's as good-looking as you claim some swede will marry her before she can buy her dishes sure they must all pull something like that to start with said the dummy who was a woman-hater then when you've played em straight they hest the pirate's flag and go to palm and percentage checks in some dance-hall but again the idealistic scrap iron kid came stubbornly to the defense of the newcomer the argument was growing warm when thomasville and the swede entered with two caddies of tobacco which they had managed to acquire during the confusion at the waterfront thus ending the discussion there were six of the wag boys six as bold and unscrupulous gentlemen as the ebb and swirl of the northern gold rush had left stranded beneath the rim of the arctic and they had joined forces drawn as much perhaps by their common calling as by the facilities thus afforded for perfecting any alibis that a long and lonesome winter might render necessary nor is it quite correct to state that they were stranded for it takes more than the buffets of a stormy fate to strand such men as the dummy and george llewellyn and the scrap-iron kid and their three companions 
llewellyn was the gentleman of the outfit owing to the fact that the polish of an early training had not been utterly dulled by a four years trick at deer lodge penitentiary the dummy had gained his name from an admirable self-restraint which no third-degree methods had ever served to break thomasville was so called because of a boyish pride in his georgia birthplace while reddy and the swede but this is the story of the wag lady and we digress to begin with june was young with a springtime flush in her cheeks and eyes as clear as glacier pools yet with all her youth and beauty she possessed a poise that held men at a distance she also had a certain fearlessness that came perhaps from worldly innocence and was far more effective than the customary brazenness of frontier women she went ahead with her business asking neither advice nor assistance and almost before the wag boys knew what she was up to she had leased the p c warehouse near their cabin and had carpenters changing it into a bunkhouse in a week it was open for business on the second night after it was full then she built a tiny cabin near her hotel and proceeded to keep house for herself sleeping daytimes and working nights say she's coinin money the scrap iron kid advised his companion some time later she's got fifty bunks at a dollar apiece and each one is full of swede you ought to drift by in a business hours it sounds like a sawmill if she's getting the money so fast why don't you grab her kid inquired llewellyn you cut that out snapped the former speaker there ain't nobody going to grab that dame i'd croak any guy that made a crack at her and that goes seeing a familiar light smouldering in the kid's eyes llewellyn desisted from further comment but he made up his mind to become acquainted with june at once now while he succeeded it was in quite an unexpected manner for before he had formulated any plan thomasville came to him with a proposition that drove all thoughts of women from his mind and sent them both out to the mines shortly after dark each provided with a six-shooter and a bandana handkerchief with eye-holes cut in it jane had returned to her cabin the following morning and was preparing for bed when she heard a faltering footstep outside she glanced down at her money sack filled with the nice receipts of her hotel then at the fastenings of her door she knew that law was but a pretense and order a mockery in the camp but the next instant she slid back the bolt and let in a flood of morning sunlight there leaning against her wall was a tall dark young man whose head was hanging loosely and rolling from side to side his hair beneath the gray stetson was wet his boots were sodden and muddy one arm was thrust limply into the front of his coat as if paralyzed she saw that the sleeve was caked with blood even as she spoke he sagged forward and slid down at her feet she was not the sort to run for help and so taking him under the armpits she had him on her bed and his sleeve cut away before he opened his eyes it was but an instant's work to heat a basin of water then she fell to bathing the wound when she drew forth the shreds of cloth that had been taken into the flesh by the bullet the man's face grew ghastly and she heard his teeth grind but he made no other sound that hurt didn't it she smiled at him and he tried to smile back how did it happen she queried accident you have come a long way he nodded why didn't you ask for help it wasn't worth while she looked at him wonderingly admiring his gameness then was surprised to hear him say so you're june yes he closed his eyes and lay still while she poured some brandy for him then he said please don't bother i must be going not till you've eaten something she laid a soft cool palm upon his forehead when he endeavored to rise and he dropped back again watching her curiously he had barely finished eating when another footstep sounded outside and a heavy knock followed hey june called a voice are you up it was jim devlin the marshal and the girl rose only to stop at the look she saw in the wounded man's face his dark eyes had widened desperation haunted them what is it mr devlin she answered have you seen anything of a wounded man within the last half hour she flashed another glance at her guest to find him staring at her defiantly but there was no appeal in his face what in the world do you mean 
there was a hold-up at anvil creek and some shootin we're pretty sure one of the gang was hit but he got away pete the waterman says he saw a sick-looking fellow crossing the tundra in this direction i thought you might have noticed him again june's eyes flew back to the pale face of the stranger he had risen now and seeing the frank inquiry in her gaze he shrugged his shoulders and turned his good hand palm upward as if in surrender whereupon she answered the marshal i'm sorry you can't come in mr devlin but i'm just going to bed oh that's all right i'll take a look through your bunkhouse sorry to disturb you when the footsteps had died away the stranger moistened his lips and asked why did you do that i don't know you are brave and brave men aren't bad besides i couldn't bear to send any person out of god's sunshine into the dark you see i don't believe in prisons when llewellyn told the other wag boys of june's part in his escape his story was met with exclamations that would have pleased her to hear but the scrap-iron kid broke in to say menacingly look here george don't aim to take no advantage of what she done for you when you was hurt or i'll slip her off ah oh, rats cried llewellyn furiously what do you take me for then staring coldly at the kid he said it won't do her any good to have you hanging around either june's action toward llewellyn and her mode of life gained the admiration and respect of the wag boys and although they avoided her carefully they watched over her from a distance nor was it long before they found a means of serving her although she did not hear of it for many months the dummy came home one night to inform his partners that sammy sternberg who owned the miners rest was boasting of his conquest of june whereupon sammy was notified by llewellyn acting as a committee of one that his lies must cease sammy got a little drunk a few nights later and boasted again with the result that the scrap iron kid who was playing blackjack promptly floored him with a cloud of his forty-five and the swede who was standing near by kicked the prostrate sternberg in the most conspicuous part of his green and purple waistcoat thereby loosening a rib it was not long before the sporting element of the camp learned to treat june with the highest courtesy and since she had been adopted in a measure by the wag boys she became known as the wag lady meanwhile june was prospering the homeless men who patronized her place began to entrust their gold sacks to her care so she went to harry hope the p c agent and bought a safe in which to deposit her lodger's valuables frequently thereafter she sat guard all night over considerable sums of money while the owners snored peacefully in the big back room when winter closed down june began to see more and more of harry hope and she began to like him too for he was the sort to win women's hearts being big and boyish and full of merriment he had spent several years in the northland and its winds had blown from him many of the city-born traits leaving him unaffected impulsive and hearty while the frontier takes away some evil qualities it also takes some good ones and harry hope was not by any means a saint as the nights grew longer he gained the habit of dropping in to talk with june on his way uptown one evening he paused before leaving and asked can you take care of something for me june of course she answered he flung a leather wallet into her lap laughing you're the banker for the community so lock that up overnight if you please oh she gasped there are thousands of dollars i'd rather not come you must i didn't get it in time to put it in the company safe and if i carry it around somebody will frisk me where are you going down to sternberg's i'm going to outguess his faro dealer this is my lucky night you know realizing full well the lawlessness of the camp june felt a bit nervous as she laid the money away in the course of the evening however she gradually lost her fears some time after midnight when the big front room of the bunkhouse was empty the outside door opened emitting a billow of frost out of which emerged two men they were strangers to june and when she asked them if they witched the beds they said no they backed up to the stove and began staring at their surroundings curiously it had never been june's practice to forbid any man the comfort of her coal burner even though he lacked the price for a bed but remembering the money in her safe she sharply ordered these two out neither man stirred they blinked at her in a manner that sent little spasms of nervousness up her spine i tell you it's too late you can't stay that's too bad said one of them 
he crossed toward the desk behind which she sat at which she softly closed the heavy safe door it gave out a metallic click however which caused the fellow's eyes to gleam that safe ain't locked eh he inquired yes it is she lied he smiled as if to put her at her ease but it was an evil leer and set her heart to pounding violently she was tempted to cry out and arouse her lodgers but merely flung back the fellow's glance defiantly the stranger ran his eye over the place and then said i guess we'll set a while drawing a chair up beside the door he motioned to his partner to do the same they tilted back at their ease and june fancied they were listening intently for a half hour an hour they sat there following her every movement now and then exchanging a word in a tone too low for her to hear she was well-nigh hysterical with the strain of waiting when she saw both men lower the front legs of their chairs and rise together the next instant the door swung violently yet noiselessly inward and a masked man with a gun in his hand leaped out of the night another man was at his heels and they covered her simultaneously then a most amazing thing occurred june's mysterious visitors pounced upon them from behind there was a brief breathless struggle and the next instant all four swept out into the snow amid a tangle of arms and legs followed the sounds of a furious scuffle of heavy blows curses and groans and then a voice beat it now or we'll croak the two of you and peddle the word that no rough stuff goes here do you get that there was the impact of a boot planted against flesh and the next instant june's deliverers had re-entered and closed the door one of them was sucking a wound in the fleshy part of his hand where a falling revolver hammer had punched him but he inquired in a thoroughly business-like tone got a little hot water june june emerged weakly from behind her desk well what does it all mean oh it's all right they won't trouble you no more they came to rob me and you knew it sure harry hope got full and told about leaving eight thousand dollars with you so we beat him to it but why didn't you say so you frightened me we wasn't sure they'd try it and we didn't like to work you up please who are you us why we're wag boys llewellyn's our pal i'm charlie fitzhugh they call me the dummy and this is thomasville thomasville nodded and mumbled greetings without removing his thumb from his mouth whereupon june began to express her gratitude but thanks threw the wag boys into confusion it seemed and they quickly bade her an embarrassed good night now that they had removed the weight of obligation that had rested upon them the wags became more neighborly the wellen and the scrap iron kid called to explain that the dummy in thomasville had broken all rules of friendship by hogging the spotlight and to express their own regret at having been absent during the attempted hold-up june was eating her midnight lunch when they came and after they had left llewellyn said she didn't have any butter kid notice it sure butter's pillock rotstein cornered the supply and he's holding it for a raise where does he keep it in that big tent back of his store along with his other stuff now the wag boys did nothing by halves about dusk the following day the rotstein watchman was accosted by a stranger who had just munched in from the creek the two gossiped for a moment then as the stranger made off he slipped and fell injuring himself so painfully that the watchman was forced to help him down to kelly's drug store upon returning from his labor of charity the watchman discovered to his amazement and horror that during his absence two men had entered the tent by means of a six-foot slit in the rear wall they had brought a sled with them moreover and had made off with about five hundred dollars worth of rothstein hart's blood labeled cold brook creamery extra fine the next morning when june returned to her cabin she found a case of butter a few days later the dummy discovered a string of ptarmigan hanging beside the rear door of a restaurant and desiring to offer june some delicate little attention he returned after dark and removed them as ptarmigan were selling at five dollars a brace he was careful to protect the girl he sat on the back steps of the restaurant and picked the birds thoroughly scattering the feathers with a careless hand scarcely a day passed that june did not receive something from the wags but of course she never dreamed that her gifts had been stolen 
as for her admirers it was the highest mark of their esteem thus to lay at her feet the choicest fruits of their precarious labours and although they were common thieves uh, nay worse than that they stole rather from love of excitement than for hope of gain and the more fantastic the adventure the more it tickled their distorted fancies they were most amusing and june grew to like them immensely she began to mother them in the way that pleases all women she ruled them like a family of wayward children she settled their disputes and they submitted with subdued though extravagant joy she asked llewellyn once about that wound in his arm but he lied fluently and she believed him for she was not the kind to credit evil of her friends once they had received encouragement they fairly monopolized her she was never safe from interruption for the wag boys never slept they came to her cabin singly and collectively at all hours of day or night during her absence or during her presence and they never failed to leave something behind them roddy was a good cook but he loathed a stove as he loathed a policeman yet he donned an apron and at the cost of much profanity and sweat produced a chocolate cake that would have done credit to a new england housewife furthermore it bore june's name in a beautiful scroll surrounded by a chocolate wreath and she found it on her bed when she came home one morning chancing to express a liking for oysters in the hearing of the scrap iron kid she mysteriously received a whole case of them when she knew very well that there were none in camp of course she did not dream that in securing them the kid had put his person in deadly peril on returning from her duties at another time she found that during the night the interior walls of her cabin had been painted and although she did not want them painted and although the smell gave her a violent headache she pretended to be overcome with delight in order to beautify her little nest reddy had burgled a store and stolen all the paint there was of the particular shade that pleased his eye now the wag boys pretended to be carefree and happy as time went on in reality they were gnawed by a secret trouble it was june's growing fondness for harry hope after careful observation they decided that the p c agent would not do at all he was too wild he had undeniably lost his head and was gambling heavily tempted perhaps by the lax morality of the camp and the license of good times it was the dummy who finally proposed a means of safeguarding june's wandering affections somebody's got to split her away from this hope he declared it's up to us and llewellyn's the only one in her class the scrap iron kid's face assumed an ugly yellow cast as he inquired quietly do you mean george is to marry her hardly exploded the dummy just toll her away why shouldn't i marry her llewellyn demanded i can think of five reasons the kid retorted he tapped his chest with his finger here's one and there's the other four he pointed to the other wag boys do you think we'd let you marry her huh i'd sooner marry her myself llewellyn ended the discussion by stamping out of the cabin cursing his partners with violence business of the p c company took harry hope to council city in february so the wags felt easier but only for a time they found that june was grieving for him and were plunging into deep despair until scrap iron came home with the explanation that the lovers had quarrelled before parting it was a signal for a celebration during which reddy cooked wildly for a week making puddings and pies and pastries most of which were smuggled into june's cabin thomasville journeyed out to a certain roadhouse run by a frenchman and returned with a case of eggs wrapped up in a woolen comforter it required the combined perjury of the other wags to prove an alibi for him but june had an omelette every morning thereafter then just as they were weaning her away as they thought the blow fell it came with a crushing force that left them dumb and panic-stricken june took pneumonia the scrap iron kid brought the first news of her illness and he blubbered like a baby while dummy the woman hater cursed like a man bereft how do you know it's pneumonia queried thomasville the doc says so me and george dropped in with some beefsteaks we copped from the butcher and found her in bed coughing like the devil she couldn't get up pains in her bosom we run for doc whiting and fellers it's true george is there now 
the kid swallowed bravely and two tears rolled down his cheeks the wag boys broke out of their cabin on the run then strung out down the snow-banked street toward june's cabin where they found dr whiting very grave and llewellyn with his face blanched and his lips tight drawn they tiptoed in and stood against the wall in a silent stricken row twirling their caps and trying to ease the pain in their throats the wag lady was indeed very ill her yellow hair was tumbled over her pillow and she was in great pain but she smiled at them and made a feeble jest which broke in her throat for she was young and all alone and very badly frightened it was too much for the scrap iron kid who stumbled out into the freezing night and fought with his misery he tried to pray but from long inexperience he fancied he made bad work of it an hour later they assembled and laid plans to weather the storm she's worried about her hotel llewellyn announced if that was off her mind she'd have a better chance well let's manage it for her the dummy offered i'll watch it tonight. and who'll watch you queried the kid do you reckon i'd run out on a pal like june stormed the dummy whereat scrap iron assured him he was positive that he would not for the very good reason that he and reddy would take care that no opportunity offered you run the joint like you say and we'll look out her game for her then to-morrow night the other three can do it we'll take turns and turn about and them that's off shift will nurse her i've been thinking now if only we knowed something about women folks i've been married once or twice if that's any good thomas vale ventured to confess whereupon he was elected head nurse by virtue of his experience and accordingly they went to work dr whiting had promised to secure a woman to care for the sick girl but women were scarce that winter and he was only partly successful so the greater portion of the responsibility fell upon the wags he also spoke of removing june to the excuse for a hospital but they would not hear to this and so the battle for her life began it was a battle too for she grew rapidly worse and soon was delirious babbling of strange things which tore at the hearts of the wag boys day after day night after night she lay racked and tortured fighting the brave fight of youth and through it all the six thieves tended her they were ever at her side coming and going like the wraiths of her distorted fancy and while three of them divided the day into watches the other three ran the bunkhouse keeping strict account of every penny taken in they okayed one another's books and it would have fared badly indeed with any one of them had he allowed the least discrepancy to appear in his reckoning it was a strange scene this a sick and friendless girl mothered by a gang of crooks when june's condition improved they rejoiced with a deep ferocity that was pitiful when it grew worse they went about hushed and terror-stricken through it all she called incessantly for harry hope and it was llewellyn who finally volunteered to go to council city and fetch him an offer that showed the others he was game but before the weather had settled sufficiently to allow it hope came he arrived one night in a blinding smother which whined down over the treeless wastes, driving men indoors before its fury. Hearing of June's illness, he had taken the trail within an hour, fighting his way for a hundred trackless miles through a blizzard that daunted even a wag boy, and he showed the marks of battle. His face was bitten deeply by the cold, his dogs were dying in the harness, and it was evident that he had not slept for many hours he whimpered like a child when llewellyn met him at june's door then he heard her wearily babbling his name as she had done these many many days and he went in kneeling beside her with his frozen breath still caked upon his parka hood llewellyn stood by and heard him tenderly calling to the wandering girl saw the peace that came into her face as something told her he was near then the wag boy who had once been a gentleman came forward and gave hope his hand and thanked him for his coming june began to mend after that and it was not long before whiting said she might recover if she had proper food she would however need nourishment milk but there was only one cow in camp and other sick people and not sufficient milk to go around the wag boys lumped their bank rolls and offered to buy the animal from its owner but he refused so they stole the cow and all her fodder now it is no difficult matter to steal a cow even in a mining camp in the dead of winter 
but it is not nearly so easy for a cow to remain stolen under such conditions and the wags were hard put to prevent discovery it would have been far easier they realized to steal a two-story brick house or a printing office and then too not one of them knew how to secure the milk even after they had gained the cow's consent they made various experiments however one of which resulted in reddy's having the breath rammed out of him and another causing thomasville to adopt crutches for a day or so but eventually june got her milk a gallon of it daily every night or two the cow had to be moved every day they gagged her to muffle her voice then when discovery was imminent they made terms of surrender exacting twenty-five per cent of the gross output as the consideration for her return they breathed much easier when the cow was off their hands spring was in sight when june became strong enough to take up her duties and she was surprised to find her hotel running as usual also a flour sack full of currency beneath her bed together with a set of books showing her receipts it was signed by llewellyn and witnessed by the other wags there was no record of disbursements one day whiting advised her to get out in the air and the scrap iron kid volunteered to take her for a dog ride i didn't know you had a team she said who me sure i got as good a team as ever you see he declared and when she accepted his invitation he proceeded to get his dogs together in a startling manner he tied a soup bone on a string and walked the back streets then when he beheld a likely-looking husky he dragged the bone behind him enticing the animal by degrees to the wag boy's cabin where he promptly tied it up he repeated the performance seven times the matter of harness and sled was but a detail so june enjoyed a ride that put pink roses into her cheeks and gave the scrap iron kid a feeling of pure exalted joy such as he had never felt in all his adventurous career the day she walked over to the wag house unassisted was one of such wild rejoicing that she was forced to tell them shyly of her own happiness a happiness so new that as yet she could scarcely credit it she was to be mrs harry hope and asked them to wish her joy llewellyn made a speech that evoked the admiration of them all even to the kid who was miserably jealous and june went home with her heart very warm and tender toward these six adventurers who had been so true to her it was to be expected that hope would share in his sweetheart's extravagant gladness for he loved her deeply with all the force of his big strong nature yet he acted strangely as time went on now he was sad and worried again he seemed tortured by a lurking disquietude of spirit this alarmed the wag lady and she set out to find the secret of his trouble the ice was breaking when he made a clean breast of it and when he had finished june felt that her heart was breaking also it was the commonplace story of a young man tempted beyond his strength hope's popularity had made him a host of friends while his generosity had made no a difficult answer he had plunged into excesses during the early winter gambled wildly not to win but for the fun of it he had lost company money trusting to his ability to make it good from his own pocket when the time came the time was coming and his pockets were empty spring was here the first boats would arrive any day and with them would come the p c men to audit his accounts it was possible to cover it up to be sure but he scorned to falsify his books i should have stayed in council city he said but when i heard you were sick he buried his brown face in his hands the girl's lips were white as she asked how much is it well, nearly twenty thousand she shook her head hopelessly i haven't nearly that much harry but perhaps they would let us pay off the balance as we are able june he cried i wouldn't let you i'll go to jail first i i, I suppose you don't want to marry me now that you know i love you more than twenty thousand dollars worth she replied we'll face it out together if only i had time i could pay it back and they'd never know for i have property that will sell once the season opens then you must take time i can't sternberg will tell what has sternberg to do with it i lost the money in his place his books will show he suspects even now and he's talking about it he doesn't like me you know since he heard of our engagement 
the days fled swiftly by the hills thrust their scarred sides up through the melting snow the open sea showed black beyond the rim of anchor ice as nature awoke and blossomed june faded and shrank until she was no more than the ghost of her former self then one day smoke was reported upon the horizon and the town became a bedlam for the door of the frozen north was creaking on its hinges and just beyond lay the good glad world of men and things june could stand it no longer so she told her sorrow to llewellyn who had half guessed it anyhow and he in turn retold it to his fellow wags the scrap-iron kid was for killing hope at once and argued that it was by far the simplest way out of june's trouble carrying with it also an agreeable element of retribution hope had hurt the wag lady therefore the least atonement he could offer was his blood but dummy the foxy old alibi man of the outfit said i've got a better scheme hope wants to do the right thing and june'll make him if she has a chance the company will get its coin she'll get her square guy and nobody'll be hurt provided he has time to swing himself the ace in the hole is sammy sternberg he's got the books now what's the answer steal the books chorus the wags and dummy smiled why sure you can't stick up no saloon full of roughnecks and sleepers said scrap iron sammy catches his books in the safe when he's off ship and we can't blow the safe cause the joint never closes but the dummy only grinned for this was the sort of job he liked and then he proceeded to make known his plan those were terrible hours for june she prayed with all the earnestness of her earnest being that her lover might be spared repeatedly she strained her tear-filled eyes to the southward as for hope he had tasted the consequences of his guilt and his face grew lined and haggard with the strain of waiting he could have met the future with some show of resignation had it not been for the knowledge of his sweetheart's suffering but as the hours passed and that thin black line of soot still hung upon the horizon he thought he would go mad on the second day a steamer showed hull down having wormed her way through the floes and nome marched out upon the shore ice in a body june and harry went with the others hand in hand and the man walked as if he were marching to the gallows it was not the p c steamer after all it was the whaler genie the fleet was in the offing however so she reported and would be in within another twenty-four hours if the pack kept drifting hope ground his teeth and muttered poor little june i wish it were over for your sake and she nodded wearily but as they neared the shore again they heard rumors of strange doings in their absence there had been a daring daylight hold-up at the miners rest six masked men had taken advantage of the exodus to enter and clean out the place at the point of the gun and now sammy sternberg was poisoning the air with his complaints details came flying faster as they trudged up into front street and doc whiting paused to say that's the nerviest thing yet huh harry was anybody hurt no damage done except to sammy's feelings they surely didn't get much money oh no their total clean-up wasn't a hundred dollars but they lugged off sammy's books june felt herself falling and grasped weakly at her lover's arm for she saw it all come she said and dragged him up to her own cabin then on to the wag boy's door they were all there sprawled about and smoking you did this she said shakingly you did it for me did what they asked in chorus looking at her blankly oh we know said harry hope you've given me a chance and i'll make good his own voice sounded strange in his ears there was an instant's awkward pause and then the scrap iron kid said simply you'd better and the others nodded llewellyn spoke up saying reddy is our regular chef but i'd like to have you see me cook a goose then he drew from his inside pocket what seemed to be a leaf torn from a ledger and unfolding it he struck a match then lighted it i suppose i ought to be a man and face the music hope managed to stutter but i'm going to cheat the ends of justice for june's sake i'm much obliged to you when they had gone off hand in hand the scrap iron kid nodded approvingly to george saying that was sure some cooking you did pal 
and llewellyn answered yeah i cooked your goose and mine but she'll be happy anyhow end of story four story five man proposes the story of a man who wanted to die part one there were seventeen policies in all and they aggregated an even million dollars it thrilled butler murray to note his own name neatly typed upon the outside of each those papers possessed a remarkable fascination for him not only because they meant the settlement of his debt to muriel but because his life instead of being the wholly useless thing he had come to regard it was really by virtue of these documents a valuable asset upon which he could realize at once one million dollars was a great deal of money even to butler murray and yet it was so easy why it was even easier to make that amount than it had been to spend it although the former process might not prove so amusing it at least offered a degree of interest wholly lacking in the latter when devoe entered murray greeted him warmly i'm glad i caught you henry they told me you've been out west somewhere yes i'm promoting you know mines devoe flung off his fur coat and settled into an easy chair getting along all right no my friends either know too little about mines or too much about me i've a good proposition though and if i could ever get started i'd clean up a million well it's not so hard to make a million dollars how the deuce do you know you've never had to try by the way why are you living here at the club where is mrs murray she is at the farm with the children we have uh, separated no jove i'm sorry what does it mean the road to reno i hardly think she will divorce me on account of the publicity although she ought to woman scrape i suppose oh nothing like that i've spent all her money devoe opened his eyes in amazement oh see here now you couldn't spend it all why she had even more than you it's all gone hers and mine good lord yes i was always extravagant but i've been speculating lately i thought i'd get a sensation either way the market went but i was disappointed i dare say i have exhausted my capabilities for excitement it's a long story and i won't bore you with it but to be exact all i have left is the town house and the farm and the place in virginia there isn't enough income however to keep any one of them going well well you have been stepping along why it's inconceivable devoe stirred uneasily in his chair the calm indifference of this broad-shouldered immaculate fellow amazed him he could not tell whether it was genuine or assumed and in either event he was sorry he had come for he did not like to hear tales of misfortune butler murray the millionaire was a good man to know but i sent for you because i need see here butler the younger man broke in abruptly you know i can't lend i'm borrowing myself in fact i was going to make a touch on you oh i don't want your money i want your help i think perhaps i'm entitled to it eh henry flushed a trifle you're welcome to that at all times of course and if i had a bank roll i'd split it with you but i just can't seem to get started suppose you had twenty five thousand dollars cash would that help help good heavens i could swing this deal it would put me on my feet i'm ready to pay you that amount for a few weeks of your time take a year of it two years take my life's blood twenty five thousand you needn't tell me any more just name the job and i'll take my chances of being caught but oh i say you just told me you were broke i received about fifty thousand dollars from the sale of the yacht and i invested the money i want you to help me realize on that investment murray tossed the packet of papers he had been examining into devoe's lap after scrutinizing them an instant the latter looked up with a crooked startled stare are you joking why these are your insurance policies exactly there are seventeen of them and they foot up one million dollars the limit in every company they began to expire in march and i don't intend to renew them in fact i couldn't if i wanted to 
the two men regarded each other silently for a moment and then the younger paled are you crazy he gasped the doctors don't think so and that is the heaviest life insurance carried by any man in america with a few exceptions do you think they would have passed me if i'd been wrong up here he tapped his forehead i intend that you shall receive twenty five thousand dollars of that money the rest will go to muriel devoe continued to stare alternately at the policies and his friend then cleared his throat nervously let's talk plainly by all means you will need to know the truth but you are the only one outside of myself who will for some time i have felt the certainty that i am going to die nonsense you are an ox the more i've thought about it the more certain i've become until now there isn't the slightest doubt in my mind i took my last dollar and bought that insurance do you understand i'm considered rich therefore they allowed me to take out a million dollars sir god almighty man devoe's sagging jaw snapped shut with a click let me finish then you can decide whether i'm sane or crazy and whether you want that twenty five thousand dollars enough to help me to begin with i'll grant you that i'm young only forty healthy and strong but i'm broke henry i don't believe you realize what that means to a chap who has had two fortunes handed to him and has squandered both i'm really twice forty years of age perhaps three times for i have lived faster than most men i have been everywhere i have seen everything i have done everything except manual labor and of course i don't know how to do that i have had every sensation i'm sated and old and sometimes i'm a bit tired i have no enthusiasm left and i'm bankrupt to make matters worse i have a wife who knows the truth and two lovely children who do not those kids believe i'm a hero and the greatest man in all the universe in their eyes i'm a sort of demigod but in a few years they'll learn that i have been a waster and thrown away not only my own fortune but the million that belonged to them that will be tough for all of us muriel knows how deeply i've wronged her but she is too much a thoroughbred to make it public nevertheless she detests me and i detest myself she may decide to divorce me at any rate i have wrecked whatever home life i used to have for i'll never be able to support her even if i sell the three places i'll be known as a failure i'll be ridiculed by the world on the other hand if i should die before next march she would be rich again murray's eyes rested upon the package of policies perhaps time would soften her memory of me the youngsters would have what they're entitled to and they would always think of me as a grand old handsome parent who was taken off in his prime he smiled whimsically at this that is worth something to a fellow isn't it i don't want them to be disillusioned henry i don't want to endure their pity and toleration i don't want to be in their way and hear them say hush here comes poor old father do you understand oh, to a certain extent then you really intend to kill yourself devoe glanced about the cosy room as if to assure himself that he was not dreaming decidedly not that insurance wouldn't be payable if it was suicide i intend to die from natural causes before the first of march what do you want me to do very little keep me company answer questions about my illness perhaps attend to a few things after i'm gone you might even have to prove that i didn't take my own life do you agree whew that's a cold-blooded proposition are you really in earnest it took nearly my last dollar to buy that insurance i will execute a promissory note to you for twenty five thousand dollars payable one year from date borrowed money understand the executors will see that it is paid is that satisfactory but you say you can't kill yourself and yet good lord how calmly we're discussing this thing what makes you think you'll die of natural causes within the next three months well i shall see that i do oh i've thought it all out i've studied poisons but there is the danger of discovery when one uses them they'll do to fall back upon if necessary but there is a better way which is quite as certain reasonably quick and utterly above suspicion what is it questioned devoe interestedly 
pneumonia i had a touch of it once and i know they nearly lost me it takes us big robust fellows off with particular ease and expedition you and i will take a hunting trip it is winter i will suffer some unexpected exposure you'll do what you can to save me but medical attention will come too late it won't take two weeks altogether if you're looking for pneumonia i know the place when i left ten days ago men were dying like flies you won't need to go hunting it it will come hunting you out west somewhere uh, the nevada desert that's where i'm mining uh, deserts are usually hot devoe shivered not this one at this season it's a hell of a country butler five thousand feet elevation biting winds blizzards and all that you just can't keep warm but the danger is in the pogonip the what the pogonip what they call the breath of death out there it's a sort of frozen fog peculiar to that locality then you accept my offer again devoe hesitated are you really going to do it well then uh, yes if i don't take your money i suppose you'll employ somebody else good we'll leave tomorrow can you get your affairs in shape by then i don't want them in shape don't you understand oh, i see after a moment the younger man continued it's all very well for us to plan this way but i'm not sure we'll succeed in our enterprise why not pray well i dare say i'm a good deal of a rotter i must be to go into a thing like this but i have a superstitious streak in me possibly it's reverence at any rate i believe there is a power outside of ourselves which appoints the hour of our coming and the hour of our going i'm not so sure you can pull this off until that power says so murray laughed nonsense what is to prevent my shooting myself at this moment if i want to nothing if you want to but you don't want to why don't you want to because that power hasn't named this as your time i don't make myself very clear i think i see what you're driving at but you're wrong we are masters of our own destinies we make our lives as full or as empty as we choose i have emptied mine of all it contained and i don't consider that i am doing any one an injury in disposing of what belongs alone to me now we'll complete the details the speaker drew a blank note from his desk and filled it in it was with a very natural feeling of interest that butler murray watched the desert unfold before his car window a few days later as his train made its way southward from the main line and into the badlands of the nevada gold fields there was snow everywhere not enough for warmth but enough to chill the landscape with a gray forbidding aspect it lay loose-piled and shifting behind naked rocks or streamed over the knife-edge ridges swirling and settling in the gullies like filmy winding sheets all the world up here was barren burned out and cold like his own life it was a fitting place in which to end an existence which had proven such a mockery and failure goldfield was a conglomerate city in the hectic stage of its growth rough uncouth primitive it lay cradled in the lap of inhospitable hills upon the denuded slopes of which derricks towered like gallows the whole naked country spoke of death and desolation a bitter wind laden with driving particles of sleet met the travellers as they stepped off the train devoe's headquarters consisted of a typical mining camp shack in the heart of the town containing a bare little office and two sleeping rooms the hindermost of which gave egress to a yard banked in snow and flanked by other frame buildings murray selected the coldest apartment and unpacked his belongings the most precious of which was a folding morocco case containing three photographs one of muriel and one each of the boy and the girl then followed a week of careful preparation together the two men made frequent excursions to various mining properties murray mingled with the heterogeneous crowd of brokers promoters gamblers and mine owners he took options on claims and made elaborate plans to develop them he was interviewed by reporters from the local papers 
articles were printed telling of his proposed activities when he had laid a secure foundation he announced to devoe that the time had come it appeared that the latter had by no means exaggerated the dangers of this climate for men were really dying in such numbers as to create almost a panic the hospitals were overcrowded and murray had been repeatedly warned to take the strictest care of himself if he wished to preserve his health the altitude combined with the cold and wet and the lack of accommodation was to blame it seemed and accounted for the high mortality rate doctors assured him that once a man was stricken with pneumonia in this climate there was little chance of saving him that evening he let the fire die out of the stove in his room then went next door to a little turkish bath establishment and proceeded to sweat for an hour instead of drying himself off he flung a greatcoat over his streaming shoulders slipped into boots and trousers then stepped across the snow-packed yard to his own quarters where he found devoe bundled up to the chin and waiting his brief passage across the open snow had chilled him for the wind was cruel but he blew out the light in his chamber flung off his overcoat then standing in the open door drank the frost burdened air into his overheated lungs god you're half naked chattered the onlooker you'll freeze the moisture upon murray's body dried slowly he began to shake in every muscle but he continued his long deep breaths breaths that congealed his lungs he became cramped and stiff he suffered terribly he felt constricting bands about his chest darting numbing pains ran through him he could not tell how long he continued thus but eventually the sheer agony of it drove him back he closed the door and crept into bed the clammy cotton sheets of which were warm against his flesh through rattling teeth he bade good-night to his friend saying D -d -d don't mind anything i do or say during the night devoe lost no time in seeking his own warm room where murray heard him stamping and threshing his arms to revive his circulation there could be but one outcome to such a suicidal action the frozen man reflected stronger fellows than he were dying daily from half such exposure why already he could feel his lungs congesting although the agony was almost unendurable he forced himself to lie still then traced the course of his blood as it gradually crept up through his veins eventually he fell asleep tortured but satisfied henry found him slumbering peacefully late the next morning and when he arose he felt better and stronger than he had for years jove i'm hungry he said as he dressed himself well, i expected to find you mighty sick his friend exclaimed wonderingly i slept cold all night it seems i didn't catch it that time i must be stronger than i thought he ate a hearty breakfast and although he tramped the hills all day in the snow and cold watching himself carefully for signs of approaching illness he was disappointed to discover none whatever at bedtime he repeated his performance of the night before but with the same result when he awoke on the second morning however he found the desert town wrapped in the dark folds of a fog that chilled his marrow and clung to his clothing in little beads it was a strange phenomenon for the air was bitterly cold and yet saturated with moisture mountain and valley were hidden in an impalpable dust that was neither fog nor snow but a freezing uncomfortable combination of both devoe hugged the fire all day saying to his guest you'll have to do the trick alone butler it's too deucedly unpleasant sitting there in the cold every night i'll get sick it's not very agreeable for me either and the least you can do is to keep me company that's the agreement you know after some argument devoe acceded saying oh if you want me to hold your hand while you freeze i suppose i'll have to do it although i can't see the use of it that night when murray had regained his cheerless room after taking his turkish bath he drank a goblet of raw whisky then flung wide the door and standing upon the sill half nude and gleaming with perspiration inhaled the deadly pogonap 
when the fiery liquor had driven the last drop of his hot blood to the surface he seized a bottle of alcohol and upending it drenched his body if he had suffered previously he now endured supreme agony as the alcohol evaporated upon his naked skin it fairly froze the blood he had forced up from his heart's cavities he groaned with the pain of it again he felt as if his body were coating with ice his lungs contracted with that agonizing grip this is t -t too cold for me devoe chattered finally i'm going to beat it as butler murray cowered and shook in his bed an hour later he decided that his third and final effort had succeeded for not only did he plainly feel the effects of that terrible ordeal but by every law of nature and hygiene he was doomed he had drunk the whisky to increase the peripheral circulation of his body to the highest point then by the use of the alcohol had reduced his temperature to a frightful extent and driven his blood back frozen and sluggish that was inevitably suicidal as the least knowledge of medicine would show it could not be otherwise he was very glad too for this suffering was more than he had bargained for he awoke in the morning feeling none the worse for his action he did not even have a cold devoe's amazement at this miracle was mingled with annoyance which he showed by complaining see here butler are you kidding you might at least have a little consideration for my feelings this suspense is awful my dear fellow i'm doing all i can murray filled his chest then pressed it gingerly with his palm there was not a trace of soreness his muscles lacked even a twinge of rheumatism that day he had another window cut in the wall of his room immediately over his bed and after exposing himself as usual upon retiring left it open and slept in the draught finding that this had no effect he undertook to sleep without covers but the bitter weather would not permit so he purchased drugs and after returning from his turkish bath swallowed a sleeping potion when he could no longer keep his eyes open he lay down nude and dripping where the frigid wind sucked over him some time somehow before morning he must have covered himself for he awoke between the sheets as usual with the exception of a thick feeling in his head however which quickly wore off he possessed no ill effects day after day night after night he exposed himself with a deliberate methodical recklessness that seemed fatal time after time his good constitution threw off the assault devoe declared querulously that his friend looked even better than when they had arrived and the scales showed he had put on five pounds of weight the affair assumed an ironical grisly sort of humour which amused murray but it was maddening to devoe one howling stormy afternoon the former bundled his accessory into warm clothes and took him for a long walk leaving the town behind them they ploughed up through the snow to the summit of a nearby mountain where the gale raged past in all its violence henry was cursing the cold and grumbling at his idiocy in coming along and when he had regained his breath growled understand butler this ends it for me i never agreed to kill myself hereafter you can make your alpine trips alone i've had a cold now for a week murray laughed good-naturedly remember if i fail i can't pay you for heaven's sake then get it over with i need that money and i have nerves the former speaker opened his coat and devoe saw that he had left the house with no protection whatever beneath it except trousers and footwear his body was wet from the climb but he exposed it openly to the storm until he was blue with cold while the younger man stamped about threshing his arms and lamenting his own discomfort that night murray repeated his turkish bath swallowed his usual narcotic and lay down upon his draughty couch to be awakened some time after midnight by a cry of fire he noted dully that a vivid glare was flickering through his open windows and saw that the roofs adjoining were silhouetted against a redly glowing sky he heard a great clamor of shouting voices gunshots bells running feet so arose and dressed himself 
instead of donning his regular clothing however he drew on a pair of trousers thrust his bare feet into rubber boots then buttoned a rubber coat over his naked shoulders when he undertook to rouse devoe henry refused to get up murmuring sourly beneath his blankets it's too cold and i've just fallen asleep been tossing around for hours very well if it should spread in this direction i'll come back and help get the things out the blizzard of the previous day had increased in violence and as murray stepped out into it the cold sank through his thin garb and cut him to the bone his raincoat was almost no protection the rubber boots upon his bare feet froze quickly but he smiled with a grim distorted sense of satisfaction as he decided that here perhaps was his long-awaited opportunity a winter fire in a desert mining camp is a serious calamity water is scarce at all times and at this particular season goldfield was even drier than usual volunteers had already joined the insufficient fire department but the blaze was gaining headway in spite of all the wind played devilish pranks serving not only to fan the conflagration but to deaden human hands and reduce human bodies to helpless clumsy things butler murray plunged into the fight with an abandon that won admiration even in this chaos he had no fear he courted danger he led where others shrank from following in and out of the flames he went now blistered by the heat now numbed by the wintry gale his body became drenched with sweat only to be caked in ice from the spray a moment later icicles clung to his brows his boots filled with water it was he who laid the dynamite it was he who set it off and raised the buildings in the path of the conflagration checking the swift march of destruction although he labored like a giant taking insane risks at every opportunity his life seemed charmed and dawn found him uninjured although staggering from weakness women brought him hot coffee and sandwiches then when the fire was under control he returned to his quarters half naked as he had set out it had been one long battle against the blind god luck and he had emerged unscathed and yet he had not lost for no human body could withstand a strain like this his previous exposures had been as nothing compared with what he had undergone these many hours if this did not bring pneumonia nothing could as he lurched up the frozen street men cheered him and something warm awoke in his heart but when he stumbled into devoe's room he found that young man still in bed his cheeks flushed and feverish henry was coughing and groaning he complained of pains in his head and chest an hour later a doctor pronounced it pneumonia and when the patient grew rapidly worse he was moved to the wretched excuse for a hospital murray snatched a few hours sleep that night as he sat by his friend's bedside and the next day found him as fit as ever but in spite of every attention devoe's fever mounted his lungs began to fill and on the second night he died the suddenness of this tragedy stunned butler murray and its mockery enraged him he had promised devoe toward the last to take his body east and now decided it was just as well to do so for he had proven to his own satisfaction at least that he could not catch pneumonia no matter how hard he tried a few hours later therefore he was on the overland train bound for new york he had wasted a month of valuable time but as to relinquishing his purpose the idea never occurred to him end of story five part one part two the physical comfort of his club was most agreeable after his recent ordeal but he enjoyed it only a few days then began to look about for a suitable place in which to end his grim comedy he selected the spot with little delay a sharp turn in a hillside road that wound down from the heights near spiten devil he had often passed it in summer and knew the danger well if his automobile went over the edge now that the roads were icy who could say it was not accidental he did not advise muriel of his return fearing to trust himself either to write or to telephone but spent much time in front of the morocco case with its three photographs longing desperately to see her and the children 
when he felt that an auspicious time had arrived he phoned his friend dr herkimer and invited himself to dinner herkimer was delighted and a few evenings later the clubman motored out toward yonkers where he was made welcome and spent an agreeable evening where's your chauffeur the doctor inquired as his guest drew on his fur coat and driving gloves preparatory to leaving i let him go to-night i thought i'd enjoy running the machine for a change the roads are bad be careful you don't skid on the hills i nearly went over to-day murray promised to heed the warning and a few moments later was gliding toward the city the beauty of this cold sharp night was inspiriting the moon was brilliant the air was charged with life and vigor it gave him a thrill to realize that he was sweeping to probable death that nothing now could intervene to thwart him and while of course there was the unpleasant possibility that a plunge over the declivity might do no more than maim him he had studied the place carefully and intended to reduce that chance to a minimum by driving his car down the hill with sufficient velocity to hurl it far out over the edge there were railroad tracks beneath anything short of instant death would be miraculous as he came out upon the heights at last it occurred to him that he was behaving very well for a man about to die his hands were steady his heart was not greatly quickened and he was absolutely sane and healthy and full of the desire to live a short distance from the crest he stopped his machine then sat motionless for a few moments drinking in the beauty of the night and taking his farewell of muriel when he had arrived at peace with himself he fixed his wife's image in his mind then thrusting down the accelerator let in the clutch there was a jar a jerk a spasmodic shudder of the machinery the motor went dead this unexpected interruption affected murray oddly until he realized that after stopping the car he had neglected to shift his gears to neutral with an imprecation at his stupidity he clambered out and cranked the motor when it failed to start he primed his carburetor and cranked again it was an expensive foreign-built machine and one turn should have served to set it going but strangely enough there was no explosion for fifteen minutes he did everything his limited knowledge permitted but the car remained stationary upon the crest of the hill a stubborn lifeless mass of metal evidently that jerk had wrought havoc with some delicate adjustment he reasoned perhaps the wiring but it was too dark to diagnose just where the trouble lay it was cold also and his numb fingers refused to be of much assistance he gave over his efforts finally and stared about with a troubled look in his eyes this was childish utterly idiotic he wanted to laugh but instead he cursed then cranked the motor viciously until the sweat stood out upon his forehead an hour later he was towed into town behind a rescue car summoned by telephone from the nearest garage as he left his machine to board a subway train the mechanic announced maybe it was a good thing you broke down before you hit that hill boss there was a bad accident at the turn to-day the police are trying to close the street till spring murray was not superstitious but recalling his many failures at goldfield he decided he would make no further attempt to do away with himself by means of his motor-car now that this particular road was closed to traffic he knew of no other place so favorable to his project and inasmuch as the time was growing short to be only partially successful in his attempt would mean utter ruin with no little regret therefore he made up his mind to fall back upon poison which at least was certain even though possessed of obvious drawbacks his experience with devoe had rendered him a bit cynical regarding the value of friendship hence it was with no fear of a checkmate that he telephoned to dr herkimer and made an appointment for that afternoon when the doctor arrived at the club murray laid the matter before him in a concise cold-blooded manner and was relieved to hear him voice exactly the words devoe had used what do you want me to do i want you to call here for me to-morrow morning you will find me dead in my bed i want you to examine me and call it heart failure or whatever you think best 
your word will be sufficient there will be no suspicion no further examination at least until the poison i intend to use will have had time to disappear or change its form and why should i do this the doctor looked his friend over oddly here is one reason which i hope is sufficient murray held out a promissory note for the same amount as the one he had executed for devoe herkimer took it then as he read the figures his face paled crushing it in his palm he rose and in a voice harsh with fury unloosed a stream of profanity that surprised his hearer you contemptible short-bred loafer he concluded what do you take me for what makes you think i'd do such a rotten thing as that murray smiled you'll have to old man it isn't pleasant of course but you won't allow muriel and the children to lose that money i like your spirit but i shall kill myself just the same and it's up to you to see that they are not ruined again herkimer became incoherent oh swear as much as you please i'm going to do it nevertheless i've made a wretched failure of everything else but i intend to right one of my wrongs while there is time right wrong bellowed the physician damn it man you're asking me to help you steal a million dollars does that occur to you the end justifies the means in this case you're not rich that twenty-five thousand herkimer flung the paper at the speaker well if you won't take my money you'll have to help me out of friendship at nine o'clock tomorrow morning i shall be dead knowing the truth and all it means you'll have to come you can't stay away oh is that so the doctor mocked furiously i'll show you whether i can or not he jerked his watch from his pocket and consulted it there's a train for boston in twenty minutes and i'm going to take it i couldn't get back here in time even if i wanted to now kill yourself and be damned to you he seized his hat and rushed out of the room slamming the door behind him a moment later murray heard a taxicab whir noisily away from the clubhouse door manifestly there were more difficulties in the way of this enterprise than he had counted upon without the cooperation of some reliable physician the clubman dared not do away with himself in new york coroners are curious medical attention is too prompt he was too well known the very existence of that tremendous amount of life insurance would lead to investigation he decided to go hunting and he knew just the right place to go too he thought several years before he had joined a gunning club which owned a vast expanse of rice fields and marshlands in north carolina and knowing the place thoroughly he concluded that it offered perfect facilities for such an action as he contemplated accordingly he packed his guns wired for a guide and boarded a train for the south that very night in his pocket he carried a vial containing twenty-five grains of powdered cocaine the club launch met him at boonville the nearest station and during the twenty-mile trip down the sound he learned all he wished to know the shooting was well nigh over there were no other members at the clubhouse he could have the place all to himself for several days he hunted diligently taking pains to write numerous letters to his friends and among others to muriel it was his first letter since their parting and the strain of holding his pen within formal bounds was almost too much for him it was a pity she would never understand his motives in doing this thing he reflected it was a pity he had never understood his own feeling before it was too late manlike he had thrown away the only precious thing of his life while searching for counterfeit joys and manlike he regretted his folly now that he had lost her that evening he informed his guide that he intended to hunt by himself on the following morning and in answer to the old negro's warning assured him that he knew the channels well and was amply able to handle a canoe he rose early forced himself to eat a substantial breakfast for the sake of appearances then set out in his peterborough the morning was chilly and he had purposely donned a heavy sweater shell vest leather coat and hip boots he paddled down the river for a mile or more then let his craft drift with the current far away on one horizon was a dark low-lying fringe of pines marking the mainland two miles to seaward sounded the slow rumble of the restless atlantic 
on every hand were acres upon acres miles upon miles of waving marsh grass interlaced with creeks and channels nowhere was there a sign of human life he took the little bottle from his pocket reached over the side and filled it with water he replaced the cork and shook the vial until the white powder it contained was thoroughly dissolved there were twenty-five grains of it eight fatal doses and he had seen that it was fresh this time there could be no question of failure he reasoned nor was there much chance of discovery for after that drug had remained in his body for a few hours it would be exceedingly difficult of identification even at the hands of an expert toxicologist but there were no experts in this country no doctors at all in fact this side of boonville twenty miles away he marvelled at his coolness as he flung the cork into the stream and raised the bottle to his lips his pulse was even his mind was untroubled he drank the contents filled the bottle and let it sink then rose to his feet and bearing his weight upon the gunwale of his canoe swamped it burdened as he was with shells and hunting gear he sank but the cold water sent him fighting and gasping to the surface again the blind instinct of self-preservation mastered him and being a powerful swimmer he struck out he had planned too well however his boots filled his clothing became wet and he went down for a second time then commenced a senseless terrible struggle the more terrible because the man fought against his own determination he rose slowly to the surface but the shore was far away the canoe bottom up was out of reach he gasped wildly for breath as his face emerged but instead of air he inhaled water into his lungs he choked horrible convulsions seized him his limbs threshed his arms roared his chest was bursting he rose and sank rose and sank enduring the agony of suffocation all the time fighting with a strong man's desperation after a time he seemed to hear shouting something tugged and hauled at him he discovered he could breathe again his senses wavered left him returned he saw faces bending above him a moment later he heard his name spoken then found himself awash in the bottom of a gamekeeper's bateau as in a dream he heard his rescuers explain that they had been out in search of poachers and had rounded the bend below in time to behold him struggling for his life they were hurrying him back to the clubhouse now as fast as arms and oars could propel them and after he had gained sufficient strength he sat up he strove to answer their excited questions but could not speak a strange paralysis numbed his vocal cords he could not swallow his tongue was thick and unmanageable this silence alarmed the wardens but murray knew it to be nothing more than a local anesthesia due to the contact of the cocaine he became conscious of feeling very wretched they helped him up to the clubhouse and on the way he caught glimpses of horrified black faces he saw the superintendent preparing to send to boonville for a doctor but knowing that the launch had already left calculated the time it would take for a canoe to make the trip and was vaguely amused to realize that all this excitement was useless he experienced a feeling of triumph in the knowledge that he had succeeded in spite of all a short time later he was in bed packed in warm blankets and hot water bags but through it all he maintained that distressing numbness despite the artificial heat his hands and feet tingled as if asleep then became entirely numb and he reasoned that the cocaine had begun to affect his circulation he noted how the chill crept upward slowly showing that the drug was working on the mantel opposite he saw muriel smiling at him from the morocco case and realized that she was very beautiful after a time her outlines became less distinct which told him that his optic nerve was becoming affected next the contents of the room grew hazy that was quite as it should be he was much interested to note his heart action which by now had become very erratic every pulsation that ran through him sounded as plainly in his ears as a drumbeat he noticed that they were regular for a time then gradually increased in speed until his heart raced like a runaway motor then ceased suddenly 
began again slowly faintly grew slower and fainter until with every flutter he thought this is the end when this phenomenon had been repeated time after time the sick man endeavoured to assist the poison's effect at each feeble recovery of his heart he held his breath and strained with all his might striving by every force of will to stop the systolic action as he had often heard that men live again their evil deeds in the hour of dissolution and while he had perhaps more than the average number of sins upon his soul he determined to die thinking only of pleasant things if possible he recalled his wedding day and pictured muriel as she had appeared that morning how sweet and gentle she had been what a wonderful time it had proved for him they had sailed for the mediterranean on the following morning landing at naples where they had spent a week from there they had gone to rome for three dreamlike months and then to nice and to cairo all the time in a lover's paradise from egypt they had turned back to morocco yes morocco and how she had loved it there thence they had journeyed uh, where to spain of course murray realized that his mind was working more slowly which meant that the circulation to his brain was becoming sluggish in a few moments he would be unable to think at all it would be over muriel would be rich again she was still young she might marry some good man from spain they had gone by rail to paris no the riviera it was very difficult to think in germany he remembered they had taken an old castle for the from germany they had gone gone yes um, muriel was gone murray awoke to find a trained nurse at his bedside he was still in his room at the club and after a time reasoned that the cocaine must be working very slowly at the first words the nurse laid a hand upon his lips saying don't speak please you have been very ill stepping to the door she called someone whereupon a man came quickly murray recognized him instantly as the famous dr stormfield they had met here three years previous and shot from the same blind hello murray the doctor began i'm glad you came around finally you've given us the devil of a fight how long have i been ill whispered the sick man two days unconscious all the time lucky for you that i ran down for a little shooting and happened to be on the launch from boonville the morning you upset we picked up your messenger on his way to town and i got here just in time now don't talk you're not out of danger by any means that evening the physician explained further you must have suffered a terrible shock in that cold water i never saw a case quite like it your heart puzzled me it behaved in the most extraordinary manner you say i am not out of danger far from it your heart is nearly done for and the slightest exertion might set you off if you got up if you raised yourself off the bed you might go out like that stormfield snapped his fingers i suppose my wife has been notified yes the doctor looked at his patient curiously would you like to have her come no 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 a frightened look leaped into murray's eyes that's not necessary you know after a time he said leave me please I i'm tired when the doctor had closed the door he lifted himself to his elbow swung his feet out upon the floor and stood up then faint as he was he began to stoop and raise himself flexing his arms meanwhile as if performing a calisthenic exercise he was possessed by the one idea that he must succeed while there was still time the nurse found him face downward upon his bed and sounded a quick alarm all that night stormfield sat beside him his eyes grave his brow furrowed anxiously at intervals a woman came to the door then at a sign from the watcher disappeared noiselessly thereafter murray was never left alone a day or two later he complained of this over-attention saying that the nurse's constant presence annoyed him but stormfield paid no attention after a time the physician startled him by inquiring abruptly see here murray what did you take i don't understand yes you do 
why what makes you think i took anything come come i'm a specialist i have some intelligence there was a pause then the sick man finally admitted i took twenty-five grains of cocaine twenty-five grains god it's incredible eight grains is the largest dose on record you're dreaming or else the drug was stale i was particular to see that it was fresh stormfield paced the room shaking his head and muttering i wouldn't dare report such a thing i'd be called a faker and yet there are no hard and fast laws of medicine he stopped and stared at his patient what the devil prompted you to do it with such a wife that's just it the latter cried miserably oh you've done for her a great injury by saving me doctor but i won't allow it i won't i see the doctor went to the door where he summoned someone to enter a woman rose from her chair in the hall and came swiftly to the bedside her face showed the signs of a long and sleepless vigil but her eyes were aflame with a hunger that held butler murray spellbound and amazed you he said weakly when did you come i have been here for days she answered did you think i could stay away ah oh, my muriel he held up his shaking arms whereupon she knelt and took his tired head to her breast i thought i was doing right he confided after he had told her everything but i see now that i was all wrong god will name the day she declared simply and until he does no man can say i will are you quite sure you have acted wisely in showing me my folly remember we are poor even yet i might make you rich again for there is time and i'm not worth this great sacrifice sacrifice this is the day of our triumph dear when we had all those other riches we never knew contentment love or happiness now we can start again with nothing but ourselves and our children we don't have time to be unhappy are you willing to try with me he stroked her soft hair lovingly and smiled up into her eyes devoe was right there is a power i shall pray god every day to spare me sweetheart for now i want to live end of story five part two story six told in the storm the front room of the roadhouse was deserted save for the slumbering bartender back tilted in a corner his chin upon his chest and one other man who sat in the glare of a swing lamp playing solitaire it was perhaps three hours after midnight the last carouser had turned in there was no sound save the scream of the black night and the cry of the salt wind at intervals only when the storm lulled there came from the back room the sound of many men asleep i stumbled out from the rear room heavy-eyed half-clad and of a vicious temper dressing in sour silence beside the stove did they wake you up the card-player inquired ah yes me too i'd rather bunk in with a herd of walrus in the mating season he was a long slim man with blue-black hair and a gas-bleached face of startling pallor from which glittered two wild and roving eyes that flitted in and out of my visual line toward to and past me with a baffling elusive glimmer like that of jet spangles his hands were slender and bony and colourless but while he talked they worked each independently they performed queer wizard antics with the cards one-handed cuts rapid fluttering shuffles and frame-ups after each pass leaving the pile of pasteboards as square-edged and even as before while he observed me over his shoulder one hand wandered to some scattered poker chips which clicked together beneath his touch into a solid ivory column as if separately magnetized he shuffled and dealt and cut the discs and made them do odd capers like the cards i slept in a menagerie tent once said he but these people have got it on the animals he nodded toward the sleeping quarters the open life seems to make a pan's pipe out of the human nose said i with disgust my indignation was intense and underlaid with a sullen fury at losing my rest i seized the stranger and led him with me to the open door saying roughly listen to that 
the room was large and low dim lighted and walled with tiers of canvas bottomed standees three high the door was a litter of boots the benches piled with garments every bed was full and the place groaned with sounds of strangulation asphyxiation and other disagreeable demises the bunks were peopled by tortured bodies which seemed to cry of throttlings garrotings and sundry hideous punishments my nervous system unable to stand it had risen a quiver then shrieked for mercy from the nearest sleeper came the most unhappy sounds he snored at free and easy intervals with the voice of a whistling buoy in a ground swell a handsome resonant intake that died away reluctantly then changed to a loathsome gurgle as if he blew his breath through a tube into a pot of thick liquid now and then he smacked his lips and ground his teeth until the goose flesh arose on my neck that's the fellow that drove me out said my new acquaintance as we went back to our seats beside the stove i had the berth below him i sleep light anyhow since i woke up one night down on the texas panhandle and found a chinaman a straddle of my brisket with a butcher knife well, that must have been nice said i at random what did you do oh i doubled up my legs and kicked him into the campfire the stranger was dealing the cards again this time into a fan-like intricate solitaire much affected by gamblers i tried the trick again to-night but i went wrong i tried to stop the swan song of the guy over my head so i lifted up my feet and put them where the canvas sagged lowest then i stretched my legs like a jap juggler but i fetched away my own bunk and came down on the man below I broke a snore short off in him. He'll never get it out unless he has it pulled. That was us, you heard, two hours ago. I was too tired and sleepy to talk, for I had come down from the hills the previous afternoon to find the equinoxial raging, and as a result the roadhouse full from the floor to ridgepole with the motley crew that had sifted out from the interior the coastwise craft were hugging the lee of the sandy islet waiting for the blow to abate telephone wires were down and bering's waters had piled in from the south until they flooded the endless sloughs and tide flats behind solomon city destroyed the ferries and cut us off both east and west by land and by sea it were better i had thought to wait on the coast for a day or so watching for a chance to dodge to nome than to return to the mines so i had lugged my war bag into anderson's place and made formal demand for shelter the proprietor had apologized as he assigned me a bunk it's the best i've got said he i've got you alongside of the stove so if the boys snore too loud you can heave coal at em them big lumps is better than your boots i had tried both fuel and footgear fruitlessly and when my outraged ears would not permit further slumber i had given up the attempt now while the blue-haired man with insomnia dealt idiot's delight i sat vaguely fascinated by the play of his hands half dozing under the drone of his voice the wind rioted without whipping the sea spray across the sand dunes until it rattled upon our walls like shot meanwhile my companion adventured aimlessly his strange and vagrant fancies calling for no answer his odd and morbid journeyings matching well with the whimpering night his stories were without beginning and they lacked any end they commenced without reason led through unfrequented paths then closed for no cause through them ran no thread of relevancy they were neither cogent nor cohesive their incidents took shape and tumbled forth irrelated and inconsequent wherefore i knew them for the truth and found myself ere long wide-eyed and still my brain as keen as ever nature made it the story of the dead frenchman has seemed strained and gruesome to me since but that night the storm made it real and the stranger's unsmiling earnestness robbed it of offence his words told me a tale of which he had no thought and painted pictures quite apart from those he had in mind his very frame of mind his pagan superstition his frank irreverent philosophy disclosed queer glimpses of this land where morals are of the fourth dimension where life is a gamble and death a joke 
whether he really believed all he said or whether he made sport of me i do not know it may be that the elfin voices of the storm roused in him an impulse to gratify his distorted sense of humour at my expense or at his own he began somewhat as follows it's a good night for a dead man to walk then seeing the flicker in my eyes he ran on you don't think they can do it huh well i didn't believe it neither and i'm not sure i believe it now but i've seen queer things queer things and i've only got one pair to draw to either they happened as i saw em or i'm crazy he leaped at his story boldly i'm pretty tired and hungry when i hit council city late one fall for i'd upset my rowboat, lost my outfit and mushed it one hundred and fifty miles my whole digestive paraphernalia is in a state of innocuous dissuetude if you know what that is because all i save from the wreck is a flour sack full of cigarette papers and a package of chocolate pills about the size of a match head each one of these pellets is warranted to contain sufficient nourishment to last the germany army for one month i read it on the label they may have had it in them i don't know i swallowed one every morning and then filled up on reindeer moss till i felt like the leaping pad in a circus now when i reach camp i find there ain't any fresh grub to speak of but i can't get away so i stick on until spring see in time we begin to have scurvy something terrible one man out of every five cashes in i'm living in a cabin with a lot of frenchmen and we bury seven from this one shack seven that's all it gets on my nerves finally i don't like dead men now the last two who fall sick is old man mannard and my pal young pete defoe pete has a ten dollar gold piece and mannard owns a dog in as much as they both knew that they can't weather it out till the break-up pete bets his ten dollars against the dog that he'll die before maynard well this is something new in the sporting line and we began to string our bets pretty free there ain't much excitement going on so the boys visit the cabin every day look over the entries then go outside and make book i open up a paris mutual the old man is a seven to one favorite at the start because he had all the best of it on form but the youngster puts up a grand race for three weeks they seesaw back and forth first one looks like a winner then the other it's as pretty running as i ever see then pete lets out a wonderful burst of speed zings over the last quarter noses out maynard at the wire and brings home the money he dies at three a m and wins by four hours i cop eighty four dollars six pairs of suspenders a keg of wire nails and a frying pan which constitutes all the circulating medium of the camp i'm the stakeholder for the late deceased also so i find myself the administrator of maynard's dog and the ten dollars that pete put up now seeing that it had been a killing finish we arrange for a double-barreled burial and a swell funeral the ground is froze of course but we dig two holes through the gravel till we break a pick point and decide to let it go at that the bareheaded kid is clergyman because he has a square-cut coat that buttons up the front to his chin there ain't any bibles in camp so he read some recipes out of a baking powder cookbook after which deaf mike tries to play taps on the cornet but he's held the horn in his mitt during the services and the temperature being forty degrees below friso when he wets his lips to play they stick to the mouthpiece and crab the hymn as a whole it is an enjoyable affair however and the best conducted funeral of the winter everybody has a good time though nothing rough now i've been friendly to young pete defoe him and i bunk together and the next night he comes to me saying that he can't rest i see him as plain as i see you what's wrong says i are you cold no the ground is chilly but it ain't that maynard the old hellion won't let me sleep he's doing a sand jig on my grave he says i won that bet crooked and died ahead of time just to get his dog he's sore on you too what's he sore on me for says i he says he's an old man and he'd a died first if you hadn't put in with me to double cross him he's laying for you says pete well i'm pretty sick myself with a four months diet of pea soup and oatmeal and when i wake up i think it's a dream 
but the next night pete is back again complaining worse than ever it seems the ghost of old man maynard is still buck and winging on pete's coffin and he begs me to come down and call the old reprobate off so that he can get some rest he comes back the third night the fourth and the fifth and by and by maynard himself comes up to the cabin and begins to abuse me he says he wants his dog back but naturally i can't give it to him it gets so that i can't sleep at all finally when pete ain't sittin on my bunk maynard is calling me names and gritting his teeth at me i begin to fall off in weight like a jockey in a sweat bath it gets so i have to sit up all night in a chair and make the fellers prod me in the stomach with a stick whenever i doze off i tell you stranger it was worse than horrible i don't know how i made it through till spring well in the early summer i get a letter from the steamboat agent at nome saying maynard's people out in the states have slipped him some coin with instructions to send the old man out so they can give him decent burial he offers me one fifty to bring him down to the coast now this decent burial talk makes me sore for i staged the obsequies myself and they were in perfect form it was one of the tastiest funerals i ever mixed with however i'm broke so i agreed to deliver what is left of maynard at the mouth of the river and the agent says he'll have a first-class coffin shipped down to the trader at chinnick our landing when i deliver maynard ready for shipment i get my hundred and fifty i give you my word i ain't tickled pink with this undertaking i'm not strong on body snatching and i have a hunch that the shade of old maynard is still hanging around somewhere however a bird in the hand is the noblest work of god and i need that roll so i make ready it takes me half a day to get drunk enough to want to do the job and when i get drunk enough to want to do it i'm so drunk i can't then i have to sober up and begin all over again the minute i get sober enough to do the trick i realize i ain't drunk enough to stand the strain i jockey that way for quite a spell till i finally strike an average being considerable scared and reckless to the same extent i remembered that we planted the old man in the left-hand grave but when i get to the graveyard i can't recollect whether i stood at the foot or at the head of the hole during the services a pint of that mining camp hooch would box the compass for any man so i think i'll make sure i have brought along three tools a pick a shovel and a bottle of rye the ground is froze so i use all of em naturally i can't afford to get the wrong frenchman so i pry up the lid of the first box i uncover and take a good rubber well sir it is a shock instead of rags and bones like i'm expecting there is old maynard in statuary quo so to speak froze maybe so anyhow he grins at me that's what i said he grins at me and i take it on the lamb understand i have no intentions of running away in fact i don't know i'm doing it until i fetch up back in the saloon it seems i just balanced my body on my legs and they did all the work well i'm pretty well rattled so i blot up another pint of painkiller and finally the bartender goes back with me and helps load maynard into my peterborough i'm pretty wet by this time we get the box into the canoe all right but it's too big to fit under the seat so we place the foot of it on the bottom of the boat and rest the other end on a paddle laid across the gunnels this sort of gives maynard the appearance of lounging back on an incline you see when i ripped up the boards to take a look i broke off a piece at a knot hole and that allows him a chance to look out with one eye he seems to approve of the position however so i get in at the stern facing him and ask if he's ready he gives me the nod and i shove off just for company i take my grave digging tools along that is all but the pick and the shovel it was pretty near full when i started but i lose the cork and drink it up for safety i don't remember much about the first part of the trip except that i get awful lonesome by and by i begin to sing oh the frenchmen are in the bay said the sean van vocht the french are in the bay said the sean van vocht the french are in the bay they'll be here without delay but the colors will decay said the sean van vocht i've got a mean singing voice when i'm sober but when i'm kippered it's positively insulting it makes my passenger sore and he shows it now i'm not saying that maynard wasn't as dead as a dried herring 
he was past and gone and he'd made his exit all right he'd moved out and his lease had expired but i saw that box move it shifted from side to side i quit singing my song fountain ran dry says i to myself i just neglected to lash you down mr maynard you didn't really turn over it was the motion of the boat then just to make sure i break forth into johnny crapaud keeping my eye on the right lens of the old man where it showed through the broken board this time there ain't a doubt of it he lurches box and all clean out of plumb and nearly capsizes me his one lamp blazes yes sir blazes i tries to get out of range of it but it follers me like a searchlight i creeps forward to cover it up with my coat but the old frog-eater leans to starboard so far that i have to balance on the port gunwale to keep from going over we begin to spin in the current maynard sees he has me buffaloed and it pleases him he wags his head at me and grins like he did when he came to me in my sleep well sir that eye enthralls me it destroys my chain of thought i feel the chills stealing into my marrow and that one hundred and fifty dollars looks mighty small and insignificant by and by i begin to figure it out this way says i i've outrun him once to-day and if i can't get ashore i'll try it again but when i turn the canoe toward shore maynard heels over till we take water lie still you blame fool says i if you feel that way about it i'll stay with the ship of course i can see the corner of his mouth curl up at that and he slides back into position then i know that he'll let me stick as long as i don't try to pull out and leave him flat you really can't blame a corpse much under the circumstances however i can't swim so i try to square myself i make conversation of a polite and friendly nature and the old boy settles back to enjoy himself well this one-sided talk fest gets tiresome after a while i run out of topics so i tell him funny stories sometimes he likes em and sometimes he most jumps out of the box sore say when i pull a wheeze that he don't like he makes it known quick and i sit clutching the gunnels with my hair on end while he rocks the boat like a demon when i get to the mouth of the river it's night i find a stiff breeze blowing and the bay covered with whitecaps so i try to convince maynard that we'd better camp but i no more than suggest it till i have to bail for dear life seeing that he's dead set to keep going i kiss myself good-bye and paddle out across the bay how we ever made it i don't know but along about midnight we blow into chinook with me singin songs to my passenger and cracking joe miller's that came over in seventy six i'm still pretty drunk the trader tells me that the coffin hasn't come from nome yet but the steamer is due before morning so i ask him to cash maynard somewhere and wake me up when the boat comes then i go to the hay i'm tuckered out it seems that the coaster comes in a few hours later but the trader is dealing a stud game and tells the purser to dump his freight on the beach they do as ordered then pull out about daylight the wind shifts the tide rises and begins to wash the merchandise away two roughnecks get busy saving their outfit when what comes bobbin past on the waves but a handsome zinc-lined casket the one from nome hey bill cop that box it'll make a swell bathtub says one so the other pulls up his rubber boots wades out and brings it in the trader hearing that his goods are in danger adjourns the game long enough to see about it he hurries down to the beach looks over his stuff then inquires where's my coffin you ain't got no more coffin than a rabbit says one of the miners oh yes i have that's it right there i guess not that's my coffin i copped it on the high seas flotsam and jetsam says the roughneck what's more i'm going to use it for a cupboard or a cozy corner if you want it bad pay me fifty dollars salvage and it's yours naturally the trader belched all right if you don't want it i'll use it myself says the miner it's the first one i ever had and i like it fine there's no tellin when i'll get another said time ain't but a minute observes the trader unless you give me that freight there is some further dispute till the miner being a quick-tempered party reaches for his gat after the smoke clears away it is found that he has made an error of judgment that the storekeeper is gifted as a prophet and that the roughneck is ready for his coffin 
now inasmuch as this had been a purely personal affair and the boys was anxious to reopen the stud game they exonerated the trader from all blame complete and he being ever anxious to maintain a reputation for fair dealing and just to show that there ain't no animus behind his action gives the coffin to the man who had claimed it what's more he helps me to lay him out with his own hands naturally this is considered conduct handsome enough for any country in an hour the man is buried and the poker game is open again the trader apologizes to the boys for the delay saying ah the box is mine all right and i'm sorry this play come up but the late lamented was so set on having that piece of bric-a-brac that it seemed a shame not to give it to him at this point the narrator fell silent much to my surprise for throughout this weird recital i had sat spellbound forgetful of the hour the storm outside and the snoring men in the bunk-room when he had gone thus far he began with a bewildering change of topic did you ever hear how dawson sam cut the ears off a bank dealer hold on said i what's the rest of this story what become of maynard oh he's there yet for all i know said the stranger as he shuffled the cards his folks wouldn't send no more money the steamboat agent at nome had done his share and the trader at chinnick said he wasn't responsible and you didn't you get your one hundred and fifty dollars no you see it was c o d shipment i wake up long about noon put my head under the pump and then look up the trader he is still playing stud where's my casket says i i've got my dead man but i don't collect on him till he's crated and f o b the trader has an ace in the hole and two kings in sight so he says over his shoulder i'm sorry old man but while you was asleep a tenderfoot jumped your coffin now this dawson sam has a crooked bank dealer named i think i'll go back to bed said i end of story six story seven the weight of obligation this is the story of a burden the tale of a load that irked a strong man's shoulders to those who do not know the north it may seem strange but to those who understand the humours of men in solitude and the extravagant vagaries that steal in upon their minds as fog drifts with the night it will not appear unusual there are spirits in the wilderness eerie forces which play pranks some droll or whimsical others grim johnny cantwell and mortimer grant were partners trailmates brothers in soul if not in blood the ebb and flow of frontier life had brought them together its hardships had united them until they were as one they were something of a mystery to each other neither having surrendered all his confidence and because of this they retained their mutual attraction had they known each other fully had they thoroughly sounded each other's depths they would have lost interest just like husbands and wives who give themselves too freely and reserve nothing they had met by accident but they remained together by desire and so satisfactory was the union that not even the jealousy of women had come between them there had been women of course just as there had been adventures of other sorts but the love of the partners was larger and finer than anything else they had experienced it was so true and fine and unselfish in fact that either would have smilingly relinquished the woman of his desires had the other wished to possess her they were young strong men and the world was full of sweethearts but where was there a partnership like theirs they asked themselves the spirit of adventure bubbled merrily within them too and it led them into curious byways it was this which sent them northward from the states in the dead of winter on the heels of the stony river strike it was this which induced them to land at katmai instead of iliamna whither their land journey should have commenced there are two routes over the coast range the captain of the dara told them and only two iliamna pass is low and easy but the distance is longer than by way of katmai i can land you at either place katmai is pretty tough isn't it grant inquired we've understood it's the worst pass in alaska cantwell's eyes were eager it's a heller nobody travels it except natives and they don't like it now iliamna we'll try katmai eh mort sure they don't come hard enough for us cap we'll see if it's as bad as it's painted 
so one gray january morning they were landed on a frozen beach their outfit was flung ashore through the surf the lifeboat pulled away and the dora disappeared after a farewell toot of her whistle their last glimpse of her showed the captain waving good-bye and the purser flapping a red tablecloth at them from the after-deck cheerful place this grant remarked as he noted the desolate surroundings of dune and hillside the beach itself was black and raw where the surf washed it but elsewhere all was white save for the thickets of alder and willow which protruded nakedly the bay was little more than a hollow scooped out of the alaska range along the foothills behind there was a belt of spruce and cottonwood and birch it was a lonely and apparently unpeopled wilderness in which they had been set down seems good to be back in the north again doesn't it said cantwell cheerily i'm tired of the booze and the street cars and the dames and all that civilized stuff i'd rather be broke in alaska with you than a banker's son back home soon a globular russian half-breed the katmai trader appeared among the dunes and with him were some native villagers that night the partners slept in a snug log cabin the roof of which was chained down with old ship's cables Pedalin, the fat little trader explained that roofs and katmai had a way of sailing off to seaward when the wind blew he listened to their plans of crossing the divide and nodded it could be done of course he agreed but they were foolish to try it when the Yamna route was open still now that they were here he would find dogs for them and a guide the village hunters were out after meat however and until they returned the white men would need to wait in patience there followed several days of idleness during which cantwell and grant amused themselves around the village teasing the squaws playing games with the boys and flirting harmlessly with the girls one of whom in particular was not unattractive she was perhaps three-quarters aleut the other quarter being plain coquette and having been educated at the town of kodiak she knew the ways and the wiles of the white man cantwell approached her and she met his extravagant advances more than halfway they were getting along nicely together when grant in a spirit of fun entered the game and won her fickle smiles for himself he joked his partner unmercifully and johnny accepted defeat gracefully never giving the matter a second thought when the hunters returned dogs were bought a guide was hired and a week after landing the friends were camped at timberline awaiting a favorable moment for their dash across the range above them white hillsides rose in irregular leaps to the gash in the sawtooth barrier which formed the pass below them a short valley led down to katmai and the sea the day was bright the air clear nevertheless after the guide had stared up at the peaks for a time he shook his head then re-entered the tent and lay down the mountains were smoking from their tops streamed a gossamer veil which the travellers knew to be drifting snow clouds carried by the wind it meant delay but they were patient they were up and going on the following morning however with the indian in the lead there was no trail the hills were steep in places they were forced to unload the sled and hoist their outfit by means of ropes and as they mounted higher the snow deepened it lay like loose sand only lighter it shoved ahead of the sled in a feathery mass the dogs wallowed in it and were unable to pull hence the greater part of the work devolved upon the men once above the foothills and into the range proper the going became more level but the snow remained knee-deep the indian broke trail stolidly the partners strained at the sled which hung back like a leaden thing by afternoon the dogs had become disheartened and refused to heed the whip there was neither fuel nor running water and therefore the party did not pause for luncheon the men were sweating profusely from their exertions and had long since become parched with thirst but the dry snow was like chalk and scoured their throats cantwell was the first to show the effects of his unusual exertions for not only had he assumed a lion's share of the work but the last few months of easy living had softened his muscles and in consequence his vitality was quickly spent 
his undergarments were drenched he was fearfully dry inside a terrible thirst seemed to penetrate his whole body he was forced to rest frequently grant eyed him with some concern finally inquiring feel bad johnny cantwell nodded their fatigue made both men economical of language what's the matter thirsty the former could barely speak there won't be any water till we get across you'll have to stand it they resumed their duties the indian swish swished ahead as if wading through a sea of swans down the dogs followed listlessly the partners leaned against the stubborn load a faint breath finally came out of the north causing grant and the guide to study the sky anxiously cantwell was too weary to heed the increasing cold the snow on the slopes above began to move here and there on exposed ridges it rose in clouds and puffs the clean-cut outlines of the hills became obscured as by a fog the languid wind bit cruelly after a time johnny fell back upon the sled and exclaimed i'm all in mort don't seem to have the guts he was pale his eyes were tortured he scooped a mitten full of snow and raised it to his lips then spat it out still dry here brace up in a panic of apprehension at this collapse grant shook him he had never known johnny to fail like this take a drink of booze it'll do you good he drew a bottle of brandy from one of the dunnage bags and cantwell seized it avidly it was wet it would quench his thirst he thought before mort could check him he had drunk a third of the contents the effect was almost instantaneous for cantwell's stomach was empty and his tissues seemed to absorb the liquor like a dry sponge his fatigue fell away he became suddenly strong and vigorous again but before he had gone a hundred yards the reaction followed first his mind grew thick then his limbs became unmanageable and his muscles flabby he was drunk yet it was a strange and dangerous intoxication against which he struggled desperately he fought it for perhaps a quarter of a mile before it mastered him then he gave up both men knew that stimulants were never taken on the trail but they had never stopped to reason why and even now they did not attribute johnny's breakdown to the brandy after a while he stumbled and fell then the cool snow being grateful to his face he sprawled there motionless until mort dragged him to the sled he stared at his partner in perplexity and laughed foolishly the wind was increasing darkness was near they had not yet reached the bearing slope something in the drunken man's face frightened grant and extracting a ship's biscuit from the grub box he said hurriedly here johnny get something under your belt quick cantwell obediently munched the hard cracker but there was no moisture on his tongue his throat was paralyzed the crumbs crowded themselves from the corners of his lips he tried with limber fingers to stuff them down or to assist the muscular action of swallowing but finally expelled them in a cloud mort drew the parka hood over his partner's head for the wind cut like a scythe and the dogs were turning tail to it digging holes in the snow for protection the air about them was like yeast the light was failing the indian snowshoed his way back advising a quick camp until the storm abated but to this suggestion grant refused to listen knowing only too well the peril of such a course nor did he dare take johnny on the sled since the fellow was half asleep already but instead whipped up the dogs and urged his companion to follow as best he could when cantwell fell for a second time he returned dragged him forward and tied his wrists firmly yet loosely to the load the storm was pouring over them now like water out of a spout it seared and blinded them its touch was like that of a flame nevertheless they struggled on into the smother making what headway they could the indian led pulling at the end of a rope grant strained at the sled and hoarsely encouraged the dogs cantwell stumbled and lurched in the rear like an unwilling prisoner when he fell his companion lifted him then beat him cursed him tried in every way to rouse him from his lethargy after an interminable time 
they found they were descending and this gave them heart to plunge ahead more rapidly the dogs began to trot as the sled overran them they pushed blindly into gullies fetching up at the bottom in a tangle and johnny followed in a nerveless stupefied condition he was dragged like a sack of flour for his legs were limp and he lacked muscular control but every dash every fall every quick descent drove the sluggish blood through his veins and cleared his brain momentarily such moments were fleeting however much of the time his mind was a blank and it was only by a mechanical effort that he fought off unconsciousness he had vague memories of many beatings at mort's hands of the slippery clean-swept ice of a stream over which he limply skidded of being carried into a tent where a candle flickered and a stove roared grant was holding something hot to his lips and then it was morning he was weak and sick he felt as if he had awakened from a hideous dream i played out didn't i he queried wonderingly you sure did grant laughed it was a tight squeak old boy i never thought i'd get you through played out i, I can't understand it cantwell prided himself on his strength and stamina therefore the truth was unbelievable he and mort had long been partners they had given and taken much at each other's hands but this was something altogether different grant had saved his life at risk of his own the older man's endurance had been the greater and he had used it to good advantage it embarrassed johnny tremendously to realize that he had proven unequal to his share of the work for he had never before experienced such an obligation he apologized repeatedly during the few days he lay sick and meanwhile mort waited upon him like a mother cantwell was relieved when at last they had abandoned camp changed guides at the next village and were on their way along the coast for somehow he felt very sensitive about his collapse he was in fact extremely ashamed of himself once he had fully recovered he had no further trouble but soon rounded into fit condition and showed no effects of his ordeal day after day he and mort travelled through the solitudes their isolation broken only by occasional glimpses of native villages where they rested briefly and renewed their supply of dog feed but although the younger man was now as well and strong as ever he was uncomfortably conscious that his trailmate regarded him as the weaker of the two and shielded him in many ways grant performed most of the unpleasant tasks and occasionally cautioned johnny about overdoing this protective attitude at first amused then offended cantwell it galled him until he was upon the point of voicing his resentment but reflected that he had no right to object for judging by past performances he had proved his inferiority this uncomfortable realization forever arose to prevent open rebellion but he asserted himself secretly by robbing grant of his self-appointed tasks he rose first in the morning he did the cooking he lengthened his turns ahead of the dogs he mended harness after the day's hike had ended of course the older man objected and for a time they had a good-natured rivalry as to who should work and who should rest only it was not quite so good-natured on cantwell's part as he made it appear mort broke out in friendly irritation one day don't try to do everything johnny remember i'm no cripple um you proved that i guess it's up to me to do your work oh forget that day on the pass can't you johnny grunted a second time and from his tone it was evident that he would never forget unpleasant though the memory remained sensing his sullen resentment the other tried to rally him but made a bad job of it the humor of men in the open is not delicate their wit and their words become coarsened in direct proportion as they revert to the primitive it is one effect of the solitudes grant spoke extravagantly mockingly of his own superiority in a way which ordinarily would have brought a smile to cantwell's lips but the latter did not smile he taunted johnny humorously on his lack of physical prowess his lack of good looks and manly qualities something which had never failed to result in a friendly exchange of badinage he even teased him about his defeat with the cat my girl cantwell did respond finally but afterward he found himself wondering if mort could have been in earnest 
he dismissed the thought with some impatience but men on the trail have too much time for their thoughts there is nothing in the monotonous routine of the day's work to distract them so the partner who had played out dwelt more and more upon his debt and upon his friend's easy assumption of pre-eminence the weight of obligation began to chaff him lightly at first but with ever-increasing discomfort he began to think that grant honestly considered himself the better man merely because chance had played into his hands it was silly even childish to dwell on the subject he reflected and yet he could not banish it from his mind it was always before him in one form or another he felt the strength in his lean muscles and sneered at the thought that mort should be deceived if it came to a physical test he felt sure he could break his slighter partner with his bare hands and as for endurance well he was hungry for a chance to demonstrate it they talked little men seldom converse in the wastes for there is something about the silence of the wilderness which discourages speech and no land is so grimly silent so hushed and soundless as the frozen north for days they marched through desolation without glimpse of human habitation without sight of track or trail without sound of a human voice to break the monotony there was no game in the country with the exception of an occasional bird or rabbit nothing but the white hills the fringe of alder tops along the watercourses and the thickets of gnarled unhealthy spruce in the smothered valleys their destination was a mysterious stream at the headwaters of the unmapped kuskuklim where rumor said there was gold and whither they feared other men were hastening from the mining country far to the north now it was a penalty of the white country that men shall think of women the open life brings health and vigor strength and animal vitality and these clamor for play the cold of the still clear days is no more biting than the fierce memories and appetites which charge through the brain at night passions intensify with imprisonment recollections come to life longings grow vivid and wild thoughts change to realities the past creeps close and dream figures are filled with blood and fire one remembers pleasures and excesses women's smiles women's kisses the invitation of outstretched arms wasted opportunities mock at one cantwell began to brood upon the katmai girl for she was the last her eyes were haunting and distance had worked its usual enchantment he reflected that mort had shouldered him aside and won her favor then boasted of it johnny awoke one night with a dream of her and lay quivering hell she was only a squaw he said half aloud if i'd really tried grant lay beside him snoring the heat of their bodies intermingled the waking man tried to compose himself but his partner's stertorous breathing irritated him beyond measure for a long time he remained motionless staring into the gray blur of the tent top he had played out he owed his life to the man who had cheated him of the cat my girl and that man knew it he had become a weak helpless thing dependent upon another's strength and that other now accepted his superiority as a matter of course the obligation was insufferable and it was unjust the north had played him a devilish trick it had betrayed him it had bound him to his benefactor with chains of gratitude which were irksome had they been real chains they would have galled him no more than at this moment as time passed the men spoke less frequently to each other grant joshed his mate roughly once or twice masking beneath an assumption of jocularity his own vague irritation at the change that had come over them it was as if he had probed at an open wound with clumsy fingers cantwell had by this time assumed most of those petty camp tasks which provoke tired trailers those humdrum duties which are so trying to exhausted nerves and of course they wore upon him as they wear upon every man 
but once he had taken them over he began to resent grant's easy relinquishment it rankled him to realize how willingly the other allowed him to do the cooking the dishwashing the fire building the bed making little monotonies of this kind form the hardest part of winter travel they are the rocks upon which friendships founder and partnerships are wrecked out on the trail nature equalizes the work to a great extent and no man can shirk unduly but in camp inside the cramped confines of a tent pitched on boughs laid over the snow it is very different there one must busy himself while the other rests and keeps his legs out of the way if possible one man sits on the bedding at the rear of the shelter and shivers while the other squats over a tantalizing fire of green wood blistering his face and parboiling his limbs inside his sweaty clothing dishes must be passed food divided and it is poor food poorly prepared at best sometimes men criticize and voice longings for better grub and better cooking remarks of this kind have been known to result in tragedies bitter words and flaming curses then perhaps wild actions memories of which the later years can never erase it is but one prank of the wilderness one grim manifestation of its silent forces had grant been unable to do his part cantwell would have willingly accepted the added burdens but mort was able he was nimble and handy he was the better cook of the two in fact he was the better man in every way or so he believed cantwell sneered at the last thought and the memory of his debt was like bitter medicine his resentment in reality nothing more than a phase of insanity begot of isolation and silence could not help but communicate itself to his companion and there resulted a mutual antagonism which grew into a dislike then festered into something more something strange reasonless yet terribly vivid and amazingly potent for evil neither man ever mentioned it their tongues were clenched between their teeth and they held themselves in check with harsh hands but it was constantly in their minds nevertheless no man who has not suffered the manifold irritations of such an intimate association can appreciate the gnawing canker of animosity like this it was dangerous because there was no relief from it the two were bound together as by gyves they shared each other's every action and every plan they trod in each other's tracks slept in the same bed ate from the same plate they were like prisoners ironed to the same staple each fought the obsession in his own way but it is hard to fight the impalpable hence their sick fancies grew in spite of themselves their minds needed food to prey upon but found none each began to criticize the other silently to sneer at his weaknesses to meditate derisively upon his peculiarities after a time they no longer resisted the advance of these poisonous thoughts but welcomed it on more than one occasion the embers of their wrath were upon the point of bursting into flame but each realized that the first ill-considered word would serve to slip the leash from these demons that were straining to go free and so managed to restrain himself the crisis came one crisp morning when a dog team whirled around a bend in the river and a white man hailed them he was the mail carrier on his way out from nome and he brought news of the inside where are you boys bound for he inquired when greetings were over and gossip of the trail had passed we're going to the stony river strike grant told him stony river up the kaskwakum yes the mailman laughed can you beat that ain't you heard about stony river no why it's a fake no such place there was a silence the partners avoided each other's eyes macdonald the fellow that started it is on his way to dawson there's a gang after him too and if he's caught it'll go hard with him he wrote the letters to himself and spread the news just to raise a grub stake he cleaned up big before they got on to him he peddled his tips for real money yes grant spoke quietly johnny bought one that's what brought us from seattle we went out on the last boat and figured we'd come in from this side before the break-up so fake by god gee you fellers bit good the mail carrier shook his head 
well you'd better keep going now you'll get to nome before the season opens better take dogfish from bethel it's four bits a pound on the yukon sorry i didn't hit your camp last night we'd a had a visit tell the gang that you saw me he shook hands ceremoniously yelling at his panting dogs and went swiftly on his way waving a mitten on high as he vanished around the next bend the partners watched him go then grant turned to johnny and repeated fake by god macdonald stung you cantwell's face went as white as the snow behind him his eyes blazed why did you tell him i bit he demanded harshly <laughs> didn't you bite two thousand miles afoot three months of hell for nothing that's biting some well the speaker's face was convulsed and grant's flamed with an answering anger they glared at each other for a moment don't blame me you fell for it too i mort checked his rushing words yes you now what are you going to do about it welch i'm going through to nome the sight of his partner's rage had set mort to shaking with a furious desire to fly at his throat but fortunately he retained a spark of sanity then shut up and quit chewing the rag you talk too damned much mort's eyes were bloodshot they fell upon the carbine under the sled lashings and lingered there then wavered he opened his lips reconsidered spoke softly to the team then lifted the heavy dog whip and smoked the malamutes with all his strength the men resumed their journey without further words but each was cursing inwardly so i talk too much grant thought the accusation struck in his mind and he determined to speak no more he blames me cantwell reflected bitterly i'm in wrong again and he couldn't keep his mouth shut a hell of a partner he is all day they plodded on neither trusting himself to speak they ate their evening meal like mutes they avoided each other's eyes even the guide noticed the change and looked on curiously there were two robes and these the partners shared nightly but their hatred had grown so during the last few hours that the thought of lying side by side limb to limb was distasteful yet neither dared suggest a division of the bedding for that would have brought further words and resulted in the crash which they longed for but feared they stripped off their furs and lay down beside each other with the same repugnance they would have felt had there been a serpent in the couch this unending malevolent silence became terrible the strain of it increased for each man now had something definite to cherish in the words and the looks that had passed they divided the camp work with scrupulous nicety each man waited upon himself and asked no favors the knowledge of his debt forever chafed cantwell grant resented his companion's lack of gratitude of course they spoke occasionally it was beyond human endurance to remain entirely dumb but they conversed in monosyllables about trivial things and their voices were throaty as if the effort choked them meanwhile they continued to glow inwardly at a white heat cantwell no longer felt the desire to merely match his strength against grant's the estrangement had become too wide for that a physical victory would have been flat and tasteless he craved some deeper satisfaction he began to think of the axe just how or when or why he never knew it was a thin-bladed polished thing of frosty steel and the more he thought of it the stronger grew his impulse to rid himself once for all of that presence which exasperated him it would be very easy he reasoned a sudden blow with the weight of his shoulder behind it he fancied he could feel the bit sink into grant's flesh cleaving bone and cartilages in its course a slanting downward stroke aimed at the neck where it joined the body and he would be forever satisfied it would be ridiculously simple he practised in the gloom of evening as he felled spruce trees for firewood he guarded the axe religiously it became a living thing which urged him on to violence he saw it standing by the tent fly when he closed his eyes to sleep he dreamed of it he sought it out with his eyes when he first awoke he slid it loosely under the sled lashings every morning thinking that its use could not long be delayed as for grant the carbine dwelt forever in his mind and his fingers itched for it 
he secretly slipped a cartridge into the chamber and when an occasional ptarmigan offered itself for a target he saw the white spot on the breast of johnny's reindeer parka dancing ahead of the lyman bead the solitude had done its work the north had played its grim comedy to the final curtain making sport of men's affections and turning love to rankling hate but into the mind of each man crept a certain craftiness each longed to strike but feared to face the consequences it was lonesome here among the white hills and the deathly silences yet they reflected that it would be still more lonesome if they were left to keep step with nothing more substantial than a memory they determined therefore to wait until civilization was nearer meanwhile rehearsing the moment they knew was inevitable over and over in their thoughts each of them enacted the scene ending it always with the picture of a prostrate man in a patch of trampled snow which grew crimson as the other gloated they paused at bethel mission long enough to load with dried salmon then made the ninety-mile portage over lake and tundra to the yukon there they got their first touch of the inside world they camped in a barra barra where white men had slept a few nights before and heard their own language spoken by native tongues the time was growing short now and they purposely dismissed their guide knowing that the trail was plain from there on when they hitched up on the next morning cantwell placed the axe bit down between the tarpaulin and the sled rail leaving the helve projecting where his hand could reach it grant thrust the barrel of the rifle beneath a lashing with the butt close by the handlebars and it was loaded a mile from the village they were overtaken by an indian and his squaw travelling light behind hungry dogs the natives attached themselves to the white men and hung stubbornly to their heels taking advantage of their tracks when night came they camped alongside in the hope of food they announced that they were bound for st michael's and in spite of every effort to shake them off they remained close behind the partners until that point was reached at st michael's there were white men practically the first johnny and mort had encountered since landing at katmai and for a day at least they were sane but there were still three hundred miles to be travelled three hundred miles of solitude and haunting thoughts just as they were about to start cantwell came upon grant and the a c agent and heard his name pronounced also the word katmai he noted that mort fell silent at his approach and instantly his anger blazed afresh he decided that the latter had been telling the story of their experiences on the pass and boasting of his service so much the better he thought in a blind rage that which he planned doing would appear all the more like an accident for who would dream that a man could kill the person to whom he owed his life that night he waited for a chance they were camped in a dismal hut on a wind-swept shore they were alone but grant was waiting also it seemed they lay down beside each other ostensibly to sleep their limbs touched the warmth from their bodies intermingled but they did not close their eyes they were up and away early with nome drawing rapidly nearer they had skirted an ocean foot by foot bering sea lay behind them now and its northern shore swung westward to their goal for two months they had lived in silent animosity feeding on bitter food while their elbows rubbed noon found them floundering through one of those unheralded storms which make coast travel so hazardous the morning had turned off gray the sky was of a leaden hue which blended perfectly with the snow underfoot there was no horizon it was impossible to see more than a few yards in any direction the trail soon became obliterated and their eyes began to play tricks for all they could distinguish they might have been suspended in space they seemed to be treading the measures of an endless dance in the centre of a whirling cloud of course it was cold for the wind off the open sea was damp but they were not men to turn back they soon discovered that their difficulty lay not in facing the storm but in holding to the trail that narrow two-foot causeway packed by a winter's travel and frozen into a ribbon of ice by a winter's frost afforded their only avenue of progress for the moment they left it the sled ploughed into the loose snow well-nigh disappearing and bringing the dogs to a standstill 
it was the duty of the driver in such case to wallow forward right the load if necessary and lift it back into place these mishaps were forever occurring for it was impossible to distinguish the trail beneath its soft covering however if the driver's task was hard it was no more trying than that of the man ahead who was compelled to feel out and explore the ridge of hardened snow and ice with his feet after the fashion of a man walking a plank in the dark frequently he lunged into the drifts with one foot or both his glazed mucklock soles slid about causing him to bestride the invisible hog track or again his legs crossed awkwardly throwing him off his balance at times he wandered away from the path entirely and had to search it out again these exertions were very wearing and they were dangerous also for joints are easily dislocated muscles twisted and tendons strained hour after hour the march continued unrelieved by any change unbroken by any speck or spot of colour the nerves of their eyes wearied by constant near-sighted peering at the snow began to jump so that vision became untrustworthy both travellers appreciated the necessity of clinging to the trail for once they lost it they knew they might wander about indefinitely until they chanced to regain it or found their way to the shore while always to seaward was the menace of open water of air-holes or cracks which might gape beneath their feet like jaws immersion in this temperature no matter how brief meant death the monotony of progress through this unreal leaden world became almost unbearable the repeated strainings and twistings they suffered in walking the slippery ridge reduced the men to weariness their legs grew clumsy and their feet uncertain had they found a camping-place they would have stopped but they dared not forsake the thin thread that linked them with safety to go and look for one not knowing where the shore lay in storms of this kind men have lain in their sleeping-bags for days within a stone's throw of a roadhouse or village bodies have been found within a hundred yards of shelter after blizzards have abated cantwell and grant had no choice therefore except to bore into the welter of drifting flakes it was late in the afternoon when the latter met with an accident johnny who had taken a spell at the rear heard him cry out saw him stagger struggle to hold his footing then sink into the snow the dogs paused instantly lay down and began to strip the ice pellets from between their toes cantwell spoke harshly leaning upon the handlebars well what's the idea it was the longest sentence of the day i've hurt myself mort's voice was thin and strange he raised himself to a sitting posture and reached beneath his parka then lay back weakly he writhed his face was twisted with pain he continued to lie there doubled into a knot of suffering a groan was wrenched from between his teeth hurt how johnny inquired dully it seemed very ridiculous to see that strong man kicking around in the snow i've ripped something loose here mort's palms were pressed in upon his groin his fingers were clutching something ruptured i guess he tried again to rise but sank back his cap had fallen off and his forehead glistened with sweat cantwell went forward and lifted him it was the first time in many days that their hands had touched and the sensation affected him strangely he struggled to repress a devilish mirth at the thought that grant had played out it amounted to that and nothing less the trail had delivered him into his enemy's hands his hour had struck johnny determined to square the debt now once for all and wipe his own mind clean of that poison which corroded it his muscles were strong his brain clear he had never felt his strength so irresistible as at this moment while mort for all his boasted superiority was nothing but a nerveless thing hanging limp against his breast providence had arranged it all the younger man was impelled to give raucous voice to his glee and yet his helpless burden exerted an odd effect upon him he deposited his foe upon the sled and stared at the face he had not met for many days he saw how white it was how wet and cold how weak and dazed then as he looked he cursed inwardly for the triumph of his moment was spoiled 
the axe was there its polished bit showed like a piece of ice its helve protruded handily but there was no need of it now his fingers were all the weapons johnny needed they were more than sufficient in fact for mort was like a child cantwell was a strong man and although the north had coarsened him yet underneath the surface was a chivalrous regard for all things weak and this the trail madness had not affected he had longed for this instant but now that it had come he felt no enjoyment since he could not harm a sick man and waged no war on cripples besides when mort had rested they could settle their quarrel this was as good a place as any the storm hid them they would leave no traces there would be no interruption but mort did not rest he could not walk movement brought excruciating pain finally cantwell heard himself saying better wrap up and lie still for a while i'll get the dogs under way his words amazed him dully they were not at all what he had intended to say the injured man demurred but the other insisted gruffly then brought him his mittens and cap slapping the snow out of them before rousing the team to motion the load was very heavy now the dogs had no footprints to guide them and it required all of cantwell's efforts to prevent capsizing night approached swiftly the whirling snow particles continued to flow past upon the wind shrouding the earth in an impenetrable pall the journey soon became a terrible ordeal a slow halting progress that led nowhere and was accomplished at the cost of tremendous exertion time after time johnny broke trail then returned and urged the huskies forward to the end of his tracks when he lost the path he sought it out laboriously hoisted the sledge back into place and coaxed his four-footed helpers to renewed effort he was drenched with perspiration his inner garments were steaming his outer ones were frozen into a coat of armor when he paused he chilled rapidly his vision was untrustworthy also and he felt snow blindness coming on grant begged him more than once to unroll the bedding and prepare to sleep out the storm he even urged johnny to leave him and make a dash for his own safety but at this the younger man cursed and told him to hold his tongue night found the lone driver slipping plunging lurching ahead of the dogs or shoving at the handlebars and shouting at the dogs finally during a pause for rest he heard a sound which roused him out of the gloom to the right came the faint complaining howl of a malamute it was answered by his own dogs and the next moment they had caught a scent which swerved them shoreward and led them scrambling through the drifts two hundred yards and a steep bank loomed above up and over which they rushed with cantwell yelling encouragement then a light showed and they were in the lee of a low-roofed hut a sick native huddled over a yukon stove made them welcome to his mean abode explaining that his wife and son had gone to unalaklik for supplies johnny carried his partner to the one unoccupied bunk and stripped his clothes from him with his own hands he rubbed the warmth back into mortimer's limbs then swiftly prepared hot food and holding him in the hollow of his aching arm fed him a little at a time he was like to drop from exhaustion but he made no complaint with one folded robe he made the hard boards comfortable then spread the other as a covering for himself he sat beside the fire and fought his weariness when he dozed off and the cold awakened him he renewed the fire he heated beef tea and rousing mort fed it to him with a teaspoon all night long at intervals he tended the sick man and grant's eyes followed him with an expression that brought a fierce pain to cantwell's throat you're mighty good after the rotten way i acted the former whispered once and johnny's big hand trembled so that he spilled the broth his voice was low and tender as he inquired are you resting easier now the other nodded maybe you're not hurt badly after all god that would be awful cantwell choked turned away and raising his arms against the log wall buried his face in them the morning broke clear grant was sleeping as johnny stiffly mounted the creek bank with a bucket of water he heard a jingle of sleigh bells and saw a sled with two white men swing in toward the cabin hello he called then heard his own name pronounced johnny cantwell by all that's holy 
the next moment he was shaking hands vigorously with two old friends from nome martin and me are bound for st mike's one of them explained where the deuce did you come from johnny the outside started for stony river but stony river the newcomers began to laugh loudly and cantwell joined them it was the first time he had laughed for weeks he realized the fact with a start then recollected also his sleeping partner and said shh mort's inside asleep during the night everything had changed for johnny cantwell his mental attitude his hatred his whole reasonless insanity everything was different now even his debt was cancelled the weight of obligation was removed and his diseased fancies were completely cured yes stony river he repeated grinning broadly i bit martin burst forth gleefully they caught macdonald at holy cross and ran him out on a limb he'll never start another stampede old man baker gun branded him what's the matter with mort inquired the second traveller he's resting up yesterday during the storm he johnny was upon the point of saying played out but changed it to had an accident we thought it was serious but a few days rest will bring him round all right he saved me at katmai coming in i petered out and threw up my tail but he got me through come inside and tell him the news sure thing well well martin said so you and mort are still partners eh still partners johnny took up the pail of water well rather we'll always be partners his voice was young and full and hearty as he continued why mort's the best damned fellow in the world i'd lay down my life for him end of story seven story eight the stampede from their vantage on the dump the red gravel of which ran like a raw scar down the mountainside the men looked out across the gulch above the western range of hills to the yellow setting sun far below them the creek was dotted with other tiny pay dumps of the same red gravel over which men crawled ant-like or upon which they labored at windlass thin wisps of smoke rose from the cabin roofs bespeaking the supper hour they had done a hard day's work these two and wearily descended to their shack which hugged the hillside beneath ten hours with pick and shovel in a drift where the charcoal gas flickers a candle flame will reduce one's artistic keenness and together they slouched along the path heedless alike of view or colour as crowley built the fire buck scoured himself in the wet snow beside the door emerging from his ablutions as cook the former stretched upon the bunk with growing luxury gee whiz i'm tuckered out twelve hours in that air is too much for anybody sure growled the other bet i sleep good tonight all right all right what's the use anyhow he continued disgustedly i'm sore on the whole works if the yukon was open i'd chuck it all what go back to the states give up well yes if you want to call it that though i think i've shown i ain't a quitter lord i've rustled steady for two years and what have i got nothing except my interest in this pauperized hill claim if two years of hard work gives you cold feet you ain't worthy of the dignity of prospector this here is the only honourable calling there is there's no competition and cuttin throats in our business nor we don't rob the widders and orphans a prospector is defined as a semi-human being with a low forehead but a high sense of honour a stomach that shies at salads but a heart that's full of grit they don't never lay down and the very beauty of the business is that you never know when you're due some day a guy comes along i hit her over yonder boy says he whereupon you insert yourself into a pack strap pound the trail and the next you know you're a millionaire or two bah no more stampedes for me i've killed myself too often there's nothing in em i'm sick of it i tell you and i'm going out to god's country no more wild scrambles and hardships for buck a step sounded on the chips without and a slender sallow man entered hello maynard they chorused and welcomed him to a seat what are you doing out here do you bring any chewin with you evidently he labored under excitement for his face was flushed and his eyes danced nervously he panted from his climb ignoring their question there's been a big strike over on the tanana four bits to the pan forgetting fatigue crawley scrambled out of his bunk while the cook left his steaming skillet when how'd you know 
it's this way i met a fellow as i came out from town he'd just come over one of the discoverers he showed me the gold it's coarse one nugget weighed three hundred dollars and there's only six men in the party they went up the tanana last fall prospecting and only just struck it three of em are down with scurvy so this one came over the mountains for fresh grub it'll be the biggest stampede this camp ever saw maynard became incoherent how long ago did you meet him crowley inquired excitedly about an hour i came on the run because he'd get into camp by eleven and at midnight we'll see five hundred men on the trail look at this he gave me a map the speaker gloatingly produced a scrap of writing paper and continued boys you've got five hours start of em we can't go we haven't got any dogs replied buck those people from town would catch us in twenty miles you don't want dogs maynard answered it's too soft you'll have to make a quick run with packs or the spring break-up will catch you i wish i could go it's big i tell you lord how i wish i could go they were huddled together their eyes feverish their fingers tracing the pencil markings a smell of burning food filled the room but there is no obsession more absolute than the gold lust get the packs together while me and buck eats a bite we'll take the fox robe and the navajo glad i've got a new pair of mucklucks cause we need lighter footwear but what will you wear boy them hip boots is too heavy you'll never make it here said maynard try these he slipped off his light gossamer sporting boots and buck succeeded in stamping his feet into them little tight but they'll do they snatched bites of food meanwhile collecting their paraphernalia maynard helped as he could each selected a change of socks and mittens then the grub was divided evenly tea flour bacon baking powder salt sugar there was nothing else for spring on the yukon finds only the heel of the grub steak each rolled his portion in his blanket and lashed it with light rope then an end of the bundle was thrust into the waist of a pair of overalls and the garment closely cinched to it the legs were brought forward and fastened forming two loops through which they slipped their arms balancing the packs or shifting a knot here and there a light axe a coffee pot frying pan and pail were tied on the outside and they stood ready for the run they stored carefully wrapped bundles of matches in pockets packs and in the lining of their caps the preparations had not taken twenty minutes too bad we ain't got some cooked grub like chocolates or dog biscuits said crowley but seein as we've got five hours start over everybody we won't have to kill ourselves maynard spoke hesitatingly say i told sully about it as i came along what crowley interrupted him sharply yes i told him to get ready and i promised to give him the location an hour after you left you see he did me a good turn once and i had to get back at him somehow he and canute are getting fixed now why what's up he caught a queer quick glance between his partners and noted a hardness settle into the lined face of the elder nothing much buck took up i guess you didn't know about the trouble huh crowley knocked him down day before yesterday and sully swears he'll kill him on sight it came up over that fraction on buster creek well well said maynard that's bad isn't it i promise though so i'll have to tell him sure that's all right crowley agreed quietly though his lip curled showing the strong close-shut ivory teeth his nostrils dilated also giving his face a passing wolfish hint there's neither white man nor swede that can gain an hour on us and if he should happen to he wouldn't pass be it known that many great placer fortunes have been won by those who stepped in the warm tracks of the discoverers while rarely does the goddess smile on the tardy in consequence no frenzy approaches that of the gold stampede passing sully's place they found him and his partner ready and waiting their packs on the sawbuck crowley glared at his enemy in silence while the others sneered wickedly back and big canute laughed in his yellow beard buck's heart sank could he outlast these two he was a boy they were reckless giants with thews and legs of iron canute was a gaunt-framed viking sully a violent florid man with the quarters of an ox through the quixotism of maynard this trip bade fair to combine the killing grind of a long fierce stampede with the bitter struggle of man and man and too well he knew the temper of his red-headed partner to doubt that before the last stake was driven either he or sully would be down 
from the glare in their eyes at passing it came over him that either he or canute would recross the mountain partnerless the trail was too narrow for these other men he shrank from the toil and agony he felt was coming to him through this then with it there came the burning gold hunger the lust that drives starving broken wrecks onward unremittingly over misty hills across the beds of lava and the forbidden tundra on into the new diggings it neared eight o'clock and although darkness was far distant the chill that follows the sun fell sharply as they swung out on the river their fatigue had dropped away and they moved with the steady loose gait of the hardened musher buck looked at his watch they had been gone an hour the race is on said he though unhurried their progress was likewise unhindered and the miles slipped backward as the darkness thickened hour by hour straight up the fifty-mile stream to its source over the great backbone and into the unmapped country their course led if they hurried they would have first choice of the good claims close about the discovery if they lagged sully and his oxeyed partner would overtake them and beyond that it was unpleasant to conjecture we'll hit water pretty soon crowley's voice broke hours of silence for they were sparing of language they neither whistled nor sang nor spoke for man is a potential body from which his store of energy wastes through tiny unheeded ways true to prophecy in the darkness of midnight they walked out upon a thin skin of newly frozen ice look out for the overflow she froze since dark crowley cautioned we're liable to go through on all sides it cracked alarmingly while they felt it sag beneath their feet it is bad in the dark to ride the ice of an overflow for one may crash through ankle-deep to the solid body beneath or plunge to his armpits they skated over the yielding surface toward safety till without warning crowley smashed in halfway to his hips he fell forward bodily and the ice led him through till he rolled in the water buck skimmed over more lightly and when they had reached the solid footing helped him wring out his garments straightway the cloth whitened under the frost and crackled when they resumed their march but there was no time for fires and by vigorous action he could keep the cold from striking in they had threaded up into the region where spring was further advanced and within half an hour encountered another overflow climbing the steep bank they wallowed through thickets waist deep in snow beneath the crust which cut knife-like it was wet and soggy so they emerged saturated then debouching on the glare ice the boy had a nasty fall for he slipped and his loose hung pack flung him suddenly nothing is more wicked than a pack on smooth ice the surface had frozen glass smooth and constant difficulty beset their progress their slick-soled footgear refused to grip it so that often they fell always awkwardly occasionally crushing through into the icy water beneath without warning buck found that he was very tired he also found that his pack had grown soggy and quadrupled in weight tugging sullenly at his aching shoulders as daylight showed they slipped harness and hurriedly gathering twigs boiled a pot of tea they took time to prepare nothing else yet even though the kettle sang speedily as they drank from around the bend below came voices crowley straightened with a curse and snatching his pack fled up the stream followed by his companion they ran till buck's knees failed him thereupon the former removed a portion of the youngster's burden adding it to his own and they hurried on for hours till they fell exhausted upon a dry moss hummock here they exchanged footgear as buck now found his feet were paining him acutely owing to the tightness of his rubber boots they proved too small for crowley as well and in a few hours his feet were likewise ruined noon found them limping among the bald hills of the river's source here timber was sparse and the snows too had thinned so to avoid the convolutions of the stream they cut across points floundering among niggerheads quaint wobbly hummocks of grass being thrown repeatedly by their packs which had developed a malicious deviltry this footing was infinitely worse than the reeking ice but it saved time so they took it 
now under their stiff mackinaws they perspired freely as the sun mounted until their heavy garments chafed them beneath arms and legs moreover mosquitoes which in this latitude breed within arm's length of snowdrifts continually whined in a vicious cloud before their features human nerves will weather great strains but wearing maddening unending trivialities will break them down and so although their journey in miles had been inconsiderable the dragging packs the driving panic the lack of food and firm footing had trebled it scaling the moss-capped saddle they labored painfully a hundred yards at a time back of them the valley unrolled its stream winding away like a gleaming ribbon stretching through dark banks of fir down to the yukon after incredible effort they reached the crest and gazed dully out to the southward over a limitless jangle of peaks on and on to a blue veiled valley leagues and leagues across many square miles lay under them in the black of unbroken forest it was their first glimpse of the tanana far beyond from a grovelling group of foothills a solitary giant peak soared grandly standing aloof serene terrible in its proportions even in their fatigue they exclaimed aloud it's mount mckinley yep tallest ward on the face of the continent there's the creek we go down see crowley indicated a watercourse which meandered away through canyons and broad reaches we foller it to yonder cross valley then east to there to buck's mind his gesture included a tinted realm as far-reaching as a state stretched upon the bare cyst commanding the back stretch they munched slices of raw bacon directly out toward the mountain's foot two figures crawled there they come and crowley led stumbling sliding into the strange valley as this was the south and early side of the range they found the hills more barren of snow water seeped into the gulches till the creek ice was worn and rotted this'll be fierce the irishman remarked if she breaks on us we'll be hung up in the hills and starve before the creek's lower enough to get home small streams freeze solidly to the bottom and the spring waters wear downward from the surface thus they found the creek awash and following farther it became necessary to wade in many places they came to a box canyon where the winter snow had packed forming a dam and as there was no way of avoiding it without retreating a mile and climbing the ragged bluff they floundered through their packs aloft the slushy water armpit deep we'd oughta took the ridges buck chattered language slips forth phonetically with fatigue no fellers apt to get lost drop into the wrong creeks come out fifty mile away i bet the others do anyhow buck held stubbornly it's lots easier going wish sully would but he's too wise no such luck for me a long pause i reckon i'll have to kill him before he gets back again they relapsed into miles of silence crowley's fancy fed on vengeance hatred livening his work-worn faculties he nursed carefully the memory of their quarrel for it helped him travel and took his mind from the agony of movement and this aching sleep hunger the feet of both men felt like fearful shapeless masses their packs leaned backward sullenly chafing raw shoulder sores and always the ravenous mosquitoes stung and stung and whined and whined at an exclamation the leader turned miles back silhouetted far above on the comb of the ridge they descried two tiny figures that's what we ought to done they'll beat us in no they won't they'll have to camp tonight or get lost while we can keep going we can't go wrong down here can't do more than drown buck groaned at the thought of the night hours he couldn't stand it that was all enough is enough of anything and he had gone the limit just one more mile and he would quit yet he did not all through that endless phantom night they floundered encased in freezing garments numb and heavy with sleep but morning found them at the banks of the main stream you look like hell said buck laughing weakly his mirth relaxed his nerves suddenly till he giggled and hiccuped hysterically nor could he stop for many minutes the while crowley stared at him apathetically from a lined and shrunken countenance his features standing out skeleton-like 
the younger man evidenced the strain even more severely for his flesh was tender and he had travelled the last hours on pure nerve his jaws were locked and corded however while his drooping eyes shone unquenchably eventually they rounded a bluff on to a cabin nestled at the mouth of a dark valley near it men were working with a windlass so stumbling to them they spoke huskily sorry we ain't got room inside the stranger replied but three of the boys is down with scurvy and we're all cramped up plenty more folks comin i s'pose eh the two had sunk on to the wet ground and did not answer buck fell with his pack still on utterly lost and the miner was forced to drag the bundle from his shoulders as he rolled him up he was sleeping heavily crowley awakened while the sun was still golden his joints aching excruciatingly they had slept four hours he boiled tea on the miner's stove and fried a pan of salt pork but was too tired to prepare anything else so they drank the warm bacon grease clear with their tea as buck strove to arise his limbs gave way weakly so that he fell and it took him many moments to recover their use where's the best chance partner they inquired of the men on the dump well there ain't none very close by we've got things pretty well covered how's that there's only six of you you can't hold but six claims besides discovery oh yes we can we've got powers of attorney got em last fall in st michael got em recorded too crowley's sunken eyes blazed them's no good we don't recognize em in this district one claim is enough for any man if it's good and too much if it's bad what district you alludin at questioned the other ironically you're in the skookum district now takes six men to organize well we organized we made laws we elected a recorder i'm it if you don't like our rules yonder is the divide we've got the u s government back of us see crowley's language became purely local but the other continued unruffled we knew you all was comin so we sort of loaded up if there's any ground hereabouts that we ain't got blanketed it's purely an oversight there's plenty left farther out though and he swept them a mocking gesture help yourselves and pass up for more i'll record em what's the fee ten dollars apiece crowley swore more savagely you done a fine job of hoggin didn't you it's two and a half everywhere else but the recorder of the skookum district laughed carelessly and resumed his windlass sorry you ain't pleased maybe you'll learn to like it as they turned away he continued i don't mind giving you a hunch though tackle that big creek about five miles down yonder she prospected good last fall but you'll have to go clean to her head cause we've got everything below eight hours later by the guiding glare of the northern lights the two stumbled back into camp utterly broken they had followed the stream for miles and miles to find it staked by the powers of attorney of the six coming to the gulch's head to be sure they found vacant ground but refused to claim such unpromising territory then the endless homeward march through the darkness out of thickets and through drifts they burst while fatigue settled on them like some horrid vampire from the darkness every step being no longer involuntary became a separate labor requiring mental concentration they were half dead in slumber as they walked but their stubborn courage and smouldering rage at the men who had caused this drove them on they suffered silently because it takes effort to groan and they hoarded every atom of endurance many many times buck repeated a poem timing his steps to its rhythm rendering it over and over till it wore a rut through his brain his eyes fixed dully upon the glaring fires above the hilltops for years a faintness came over him with the memory of these lines then dark they lie and stark they lie rookery dune and flow and the northern lights came down a nights to dance with the houseless snow reaching the cabin they found an army of men sleeping heavily upon the wet moss among them was the great form of canute but nowhere did they spy sully with much effort they tore off the constricting boots and using them for pillows sank into a painful lethargy awakened early by the others they took their stiffly frozen footgear beneath the blankets to thaw against their warm bodies but their feet were swelled to double size and every joint had ossified rheumatically eventually they hobbled about preparing the first square meal since the start two days and three nights 
still they saw no sully though crowley's eyes darted careful inquiry among the horde of stampeders which moved about the cabin later he seemed bent on some hidden design so they crawled out of sight of the camp then commencing at the upper stake of discovery he stepped off the claims from post to post it is customary to blaze the boundaries of locations on tree trunks but from topographical irregularities it is difficult to properly gauge these distances hence many rich fractions have been run over by the heedless to fall to him who chained the ground upon pacing the third one he showed excitement you walk this one again maybe i made a mistake buck returned crashing through the brush i make it seventeen hundred the claim above figured it likewise and they trembled with elation as they blazed their lines returning to camp they found the recorder in the cabin with the scurvy patience unfolding the location notices his face went black as he read while he snarled angrily fraction between three and four and fraction between four and five eh huh? you're crazy i reckon not said crowley lifting his lips at the corners characteristically there ain't any fraction there the other averred loudly we own them claims i told you we had everything covered you record them fractions i won't do it i'll see you and crowley reached forth suddenly and strangled him as he sat he buried his thumbs in his throat forcing him roughly back against a bunk farther and farther he crushed him till the man lay pinioned and writhing on his back then he knelt on him shaking and worrying like a great terrier at the first commotion the cripples scrambled out of bed shouting lustily through their livid gums their bloated features mottled and sickly with fright one lifted himself toward the winchester and it fell from his hands full cocked when buck hurled him into a corner where he lay screaming in agony drawn by the uproar the stampeders outside rushed toward the shack to be met in the door by the young man keep back what's up fight let me in a man bolted forward but was met with such a driving blow in the face that he went thrashing to the slush another was hurled back and then they heard crowley's voice rough and throaty as he abused the recorder strained to the snapping point his restraint had shattered to bits and now passion ran through him wild and unbridled from his words they grasped the situation and their sympathies changed they crowded the door and gazed curiously through the window to see him jam the recorder shapelessly into a chair place pen and ink in his hand and force him to execute two receipts it is not a popular practice this blanketing as the temper of the watchers showed there's em right the hogs some one said and he voiced the universal sentiment that night as they ravened over their meagre meal canute came to them hesitatingly he was greatly worried and apprehension wrinkled his wooden face they what you think about sully i don't know why by yingo i think he's loose lost how's that in his dialect broken by anxiety he told how sully and he had quarrelled on the big divide maddened by failure to gain on crowley the former had insisted on following the mountain crest in the hope of quicker travel the swede had yielded reluctantly till frightened by the network of radiating gulches which spread out beneath their feet in a bewildering sameness he had refused to go farther they had quarrelled in a fit of fury sully had hurled his pack away and canute's last vision of him had been as he went raving and cursing onward like a madman travelling fast in his fury canute had retreated dropped into the valley and eventually reached his goal there is no time for reliefs on a stampede the gentler emotions are left in camp with the women he who would risk life torture and privation for a stranger will trample pitilessly on friend and enemy blinded by the gold glitter or drunken with the chase of the rainbow for five days and nights the army lived on its feet streaming up gullies where lay the hint of wealth or swarming over the sombre bluffs and hourly the madness grew feeding on itself till they fought like beasts fabulous values were begotten giant sails were brooded about flying rumors of gold at the cross roots inflamed them to further frenzy a town site was laid out and a terrible scramble for lots ensued 
one man was buried in the plot he claimed his disputant being adjudged the owner by virtue of his quicker draw it was manslaughter they knew but no one spared the time to guard him so he went free nor did he run away one cannot while the craze is on five days of this and then the stream broke with it broke the delirium of the five hundred the valleys roared and bawled from bluff to bluff while the flats became seethes of seething ice and rubbish thus cut off from home they found their grub was gone for every one had clung till his food grew low as the obsession left them their brotherhood returned food was apportioned in community and they spoke vaguely of the fate of sully for still another half fortnight they lay about the cabin while the streams raged and then crawley spoke to his partner rolling their blankets they started and although many were tempted to go none had the courage preferring to starve on quarter rations till the waters lowered ascending for miles where the torrent narrowed they felled a tree across for a bridge and ascending the ridges took the direction of camp in a new and broken country not formed of continuous ranges this is difficult so to avoid frequent fordings they followed the high ground going devious confusing miles the snows were largely gone though the nights were cruel and thus they travelled at last when they had worked through to the yukon spurs one morning on a talus high above buck spied the flapping forms of a flock of ravens they fluttered ceaselessly among the rocks rising noisily only to settle again these are the gleaming baleful vultures of the north and often they attain a considerable size and ferocity the men gazed at them with apathy was it worth while to spin the steps to see what drew them by following their course they would pass far to the right i hate the damn things said crowley crossly i seen em once hangin on a caribou calf with a broken leg trying to pick his eyes out let's see what it is he veered to the left scrambling up among the boulders the birds rose fretfully perching near by but the men saw nothing as they rested momentarily the birds again swooped downward reassured then partly hidden among the detritus they spied that which made crowley cry out in horror while the sound of buck's voice was like the choking of a woman as they started one of the ebony scavengers dipped fiercely picking at a ragged object a human arm slowly arose and blindly beat it off but the raven's mate settled also and seeking its beak into the object tore hungrily with a shout they stumbled forward lacerated by the jagged slide rock only to pause aghast and shaking sully lay crouched against a boulder where he had crawled for the sun heat rags of clothing hung from his gaunt frame through which the sharp bones strove to pierce also at sight of his hands and feet they shuddered with the former he had covered his eyes from the ravens but his cheeks and head were bloody and shredded he muttered constantly like the thick whirring of machinery run down oh my god buck whispered crowley had mastered himself and knelt beside the figure he looked up and tears lay on his cheeks look at them hands and feet that was done by fire and frost together he must have fell in his own campfires after he went crazy the garments were burned off to elbow and knee while the flesh was black and raw tenderly they carried the gabbing creature down to the timber and laid him on a bed of boughs his condition told the grim tale of his wanderings crazed with hunger and hardship heating water they poured it into him dressed his wounds with strips from their underclothes of stimulants they had none but fed him the last pinch of flour together with the final rasher of salt pork although they knew that these things are not good for starving men for many days they had travelled on less than quarter rations themselves what will we do it ain't over twenty miles to the niggers he'll die before we can get help back do you reckon we can carry him it was not sympathy which prompted crowley for he sympathized with his boyish companion whose sufferings it hurt him sorely to augment it was not pity he pitied himself and his own deplorable condition nor did mercy enter into his processes for the man had mercilessly planned to kill him 
and he likewise had nursed a bitter hatred against him which misfortune could only dim it was not these things which moved him but a vaguer wilder quality an elemental unspoken indefinable feeling of brotherhood throughout the length of the north teaching subtly yet absolutely and without appeal that no man shall be left in his extremity to the cruel harshness of this forbidding land carry him buck cried no you're crazy what's the use he'll die anyhow and so will we if we don't get grub soon buck was new to the country and he was a boy no he won't he lived hard and he'll die hard for he's a hellion he is we gotta pack him in by god i won't risk my life for a corpse especially one like him the lad broke out in hysterical panic for he had lived on the raggedest edge of his nerve these many days now his every muscle was dead and numbed with pain only his mind was clear caused by the effort to force movement into his limbs when he stopped walking he fell into a half slumber which was acutely painful when he arose to re-drive his weary body it became freakish so that he fell or collided with trees he was bloody and bruised and cut carry a dead man it was madness and besides he felt an utter giving away at every joint he was too tired to make his reasoning plain his tongue was thick and crowley's brain too calloused to grasp argument therefore he squatted beside the muttering creature and wept impotently he was asleep with tears in his stubbly beard when his partner finished the rude litter yet he took up his end of the burden as crowley knew he would you kill us both damn you he groaned probably so but we can't leave him to them things the other nodded at the vampires perched observantly in the surrounding firs then began their great trial and temptation for hours on end the birds fluttered from tree to tree always in sight and hoarsely complaining till the sick fancies of the men distorted them into foul gibing creatures of the pit screaming with devilish glee at their anguish blindly they staggered through the forest while the limbs reached forth to block them thrusting sharp needles into their eyes or whipping back viciously vines writhed up their legs straining to delay their march and the dank moss curled ankle-deep slyly tripping their dragging swollen feet nature hindered them sullenly with all her heart-breaking implacability they reeled constantly under their burden and grew to hate the ragged barked trees that smote them so cruelly and so roughly tore their flesh oftentimes they fell rolling the maniac limply from his couch but they dragged him back and strained forward to the hideous racket of his mumblings which grew louder as his delirium increased they were forced to tie him to the poles but could not stop his ghastly shriekings at every pause the dismal ravens croaked and leered evilly from the shadows till buck shuddered and hid his face while crowley gnashed his teeth from time to time other birds joined them in anticipation of the feast till they were ringed about and the sight of this ever-growing grisly clamorous flock of watchers became awful to the men they felt the horny talons searching their flesh and the hungry beaks tearing at their eyeballs a dog sled and birch bark practice covering both banks of the yukon for two hundred miles yielded doc lewis sufficient revenue to grubstake a swede thus he slept warm kept his feet dry and was still a miner he did not believe in hardship and eschewed stampedes yet when he had seen the last able-bodied man vanish from camp on the skookum run he grew restless he scoffed at fake excitements to jarvis the faro dealer who also forbore the trail by virtue of his calling but he got no satisfaction a fortnight later he rolled his blankets and journeyed toilsomely up the river valley better late than never he thought arriving at the empty shack of the negroes he camped only to awaken during the night to the roar of the torrent at his door having seen other mountain streams in the break-up he waited philosophically hunting ptarmigan among the firs back of the cabin he had lost track of the days when down the gulch in the morning light he descried a strange party approaching two men bore between them a stretcher made from their shirts 
they crawled with dreadful slowness resting every hundred feet moreover they stumbled and staggered aimlessly through the nigger heads as they drew near he sighted their faces from which the teeth grinned in a grimace of torture and through which the cheekbones seemed to penetrate he knew what the signs boded for years he had ministered to these necessities and no man had ever approached his success it is the rape of the north they are doing he sighed we ravage her stores but she takes grim toll from all of us he moved the hot water forward on the stove cleared off the rude table and laid out his instrument case end of story eight story nine when the mail came in we didn't like montague prosser at first he was too clean he wore his virtue like a bathrobe flapping it in our faces it was whitewater kelly who undertook to mitigate him one day but being as the nuisance stood an even fathom high and had a double action football motion about him whitewater's endeavors kind of broke through the ice and he languished around in his bunk the next week while we sat up nights and changed his bandages yes monty was equally active at repartee or roughhouse and he knocked whitewater out from under his cap slick and clean just the way you snap a playing card out from under a coin which phenomenon terminated our tendencies to scoff and carp personally i didn't care if a man wants to wallow about in a disgusting daily debauch of cleanliness it is his privilege if he squanders the fleeting moments brushing teeth cleaning fingernails and such technicalities it stands to reason he won't have much time left to attend to his work and at the same time cultivate the essentials of life like smoking drinking and the proper valuation of a three-card draw but as i say it's up to him and outsiders who don't see merit in such a system shouldn't try to bust up his game unless they've got good footwork and a knockout punch it wasn't so much these physical refinements that riled us as the rarefied atmosphere of his general mental and moral altitudes to me there's eloquence and sentiment and romance and spiritual uplift in a real full-grown black-whiskered cuss-word it's a great help in a mountainous country profanity is like steam in a locomotive takes more to run you uphill than on the level and inasmuch as there's only a few men on the level a violent vocabulary is a necessity and appeals to me like a certificate of good character and general capability there wasn't a thing doing with prosser in the idiom line however his moral make-up was like his body big and sound and white and manicured and although his talk alongside of ours listened like it was skimmed and seminaried still when we got to know him we found that his verbal structures had vital organs and hair on their chest just like anybody else's and at the same time had the advantage of being fit to send through the mails he had left a widowed mother and come north on the main chance like the rest of us only he originated farther east what made the particular ten strike with us was the pride he took in that same mother he gloried in her and talked about her in that hushed and nervous way a man speaks about a real mother or a regular sweetheart we men folks liked him all the better for it i say we men for he was a shine with the women all nine of them the camp was fifteen hundred strong that winter over and above which was the aforesaid galaxy of nine stranded on their way up river to a dawson dance hall the yukon froze up and they had to winter with us of course there were the three married ladies too living with their husbands back on the birch ridge but we never saw them and they didn't count the others went to work at eckhart's theatre monty would have been right popular at eckert's he was a handsome lad but he couldn't see those people with a field glass they simply scandalized him to death i love to dance said he one night as we looked on and the music sends thrills through me but i won't do it why not i asked this is alaska be democratic you're not so awfully nice that a dance-hall girl will contaminate you oh it's not democracy that i lack nor contamination that i'm afraid of he replied it's the principle back of it all 
if we encourage these girls in the lives they lead we're just as bad as they are look here son when i quit salt water i left all that garbage and build water talk about guilt and responsibility behind the days are too short the nights are too cold and grub is too dear for me to spare time to theorize i take people the way i take work and play just as they come and i'd advise you to do the same no sir i won't associate with gamblers and crooks so why should i hobnob with these women they're worse than the men for all the gamblers have lost is their honesty every time i see these girls i think of the little mother back home it's awful suppose she saw me dancing with them well that's a bad line of talk and i couldn't say much of course when the actresses found out how he felt they came back at him strong but he wrapped himself up in his dignity and held himself aloof when he came to town so he didn't seem to mind it it was one afternoon in january cold and sharp that ollie merceau's team went through the ice just below our camp she was a great dog puncher and had the best team in camp seven fine malamutes which she drove every day when the animals smelled our place they ran away and dragged her into the open water below the hot springs she was wet for ten minutes and by the time she had got out and stumbled to our bunkhouse she was all in another ten minutes with the quick at thirty below would have finished her but we rushed her in by the fire and made her drink a glass of hooch martin got her parka off somehow while i slashed the strings to her mucklucks and had her little feet rubbed red as berries before she'd quit apologizing for the trouble she'd made a fellow learns to watch toes pretty close in the winter lord stop your talk we said this is the first chance we have had to do anything for a lady in two years it's a darn right pleasure for us to take you in this way indeed she chattered well it isn't mutual and we all laughed we roused up a good fire and made her take off all the wet clothes she felt she could afford to then wrung them out and hung them up to dry we made her gulp down another whiskey too after which i gave her some footgear and she slipped into one of martin's mackinaw shirts we knew just how faint and shaky she felt but she was dead game and joked with us about it i never realized what a cute trick she was till i saw her in that great coarse blue shirt with her feet in beaded moccasins her yellow hair tousled and the sparkle of adventure in her bright eyes she stood out like a nugget by candlelight backed as she was by the dingy bark walls of our cabin i suppose it was a bad instant for prosser to appear he certainly cued in wrong and found the sight shocking to his plymouth rock proprieties the raw liquor we had forced on her had gone to her head a bit as it will when you're fresh from the cold and your stomach is empty so her face was flushed and had a pretty reckless daring look to it she had her feet high up on a chair too not so very high either where they were thawing out under the warmth of the oven and we were all laughing at her story of the mishap monty stopped on recognizing who she was while the surprise in his face gave way to disapproval we could see it as plain as if it was blazoned there in printer's ink and it sobered us the girl removed her feet and stood up miss marceau has just had an accident i began but i saw his eyes were fastened on the bottle on the table and i saw also that he knew what caused the fever in her cheeks too bad he said coldly if i can be of any assistance you'll find me down in the shaft house and out he walked i knew he didn't intend to be inhospitable that was just his infernal notion of decency and that he refused to be a party to anything as devilish as this looked but it wasn't according to the alaska code and it was like a slap in the girl's face i am quite dry she said i'll be going now you will not you'll stay to supper and drive home by moonlight says we why you'd freeze in a mile and we made her listen to us during the meal prosser never opened his mouth except to put something into it but his manner was as full of language as an oration he didn't thaw out the way a man should when he sees strangers wading into the grub he's paid a dollar a pound for and when we'd finally sent the young woman off martin turned on him 
young feller said he and his eyes were black i've rattled around for thirty years and seen many a good and many a bad man but i never before seen such an intelligent damn fool as you are well, what do you mean said the boy you've broke about the only law that this here country boasts of the law of hospitality he didn't mean it that way i spoke up did you monty certainly not i'd help anybody out of trouble man or woman but i refuse to mix with that kind of people socially that kind of people yelled the old man and what's the matter with that kind of people you come creeping out of the milk and water east all pink and perfumed up and when you get into a bacon and beans country where people sweat instead of perspiring you wrinkle your nose like a calf and whine about the kind of people you find what do you know about people anyhow did you ever want to steal of course not said prosser who kept his temper did you ever want to drink whiskey so bad you couldn't stand it no did you ever want to kill a man no were you ever broke and friendless and hopeless why i can't say i ever was and you've never been downright hungry either where you didn't know if you'd ever eat again have you then what license have you got to blame people for the condition you find them in how do you know what brought this girl where she is oh i pity any woman who is adrift in the world if that's what you mean but i won't make a pet out of her just because she is friendless she must expect that when she chooses her life her kind are bad bad all through they must be not on your life decency runs deeper than the hives trouble with you said i you've got a juvenile standard things are all good or all bad in your eyes and you can't like a person unless the one overbalances the other when you are older you'll find that people are like gold mines with a thin streak of pay on bedrock and lots of hard digging above i didn't mean to be discourteous our man continued but i'll never change my feelings about such things mind you i'm not preaching and are asking you to change your habits all i want is a chance to live my own life clean the mail came in during march five hundred pounds of it and the camp went daffy monty had the dogs harnessed ten minutes after we got the news and we drove the four miles in seventeen minutes i've known men with sweethearts outside but i never knew one to act gladder than monty did at the thought of hearing from his mother you must come and see us when you make your pile he told me or what's better we'll go east together next spring and surprise her won't that be great we'll walk in on her in the summer twilight while she is working in her flower garden can't you just see the green trees and smell the good old smells of home the catbirds will be calling and the grass will be clean and sweet while well, i'm so tired of the cold and the snow and the white white mountains that i can hardly stand it he ran on in that vein all the way to town glad and hopeful and boyish and i wondered why with his earnestness and loyalty and broad shoulders he had never loved any woman but his mother when i was twenty-three my whole romantic system had been mangled and shredded from heart to gizzard still some men get their age all in a lump their boys up until the last minute then they get the rip van winkle while you wait this morning was bitter but the sourdoughs were lined up outside the store waiting their turns like a crowd of parsifal first-nighters so we fell in with the rest whipping our arms and stamping our moccasins till the chill ate into our very bones it took hours to sort the letters but not a man whimpered when you wait for vital news attention comes that chokes complaint there was no joking here nor that elephantine persiflage which marks rough men when they foregather in the wilderness they were the fellows who blazed the trail bearded shaggy and not pretty to look at for they all knew hardship and went out strong-hearted into this silent land jesting with danger and singing in the solitudes here in the presence of the mail they laid aside their cloaks of carelessness and saw one another bared to the quick timid with hunger for the wives and little ones behind there were a few like prosser in whom there was still the glamour of the northland and the mystery of the unknown but they were scattered and in their eyes the anxious light was growing also five months is a wearying time and silent suspense will sap the courage if only one could banish worry 
but the long unbearable nights when the mind leaps and scurries out into the voids of conjecture like sparks from a chimney well it's then you roll in your bunk and your sigh ain't from the snowshoe pain a half-frozen man in an ice-clogged dory had brought us our last news one october day just before the river stopped and now after five months the curtain parted again i saw mcgill the lawyer in the line ahead of me and noted the greyness of his cheeks the nervous way his lips worked and the futile wandering uselessness of his hands then i remembered when his letter came the fall before it said the wife was very low that the crisis was near and that they would write again in a few days he had lived this endless time with fear stalking at his shoulder he had lain down with it nightly and risen with it grinning at him in the slow cold dawn the boys had told me how well he fought it back week after week but now edging inch by inch toward the door behind which lay his message it got the best of him i wrung his hand and tried to say something i want to run away he quavered but i'm afraid to when we got in at last we met men coming out and in some faces we saw the marks of tragedy others smiled and these put heart into us old man tomlinson had four little girls back in idaho he got two letters one was a six months old tax receipt the other a laundry bill that meant three months more of silence when my turn came and i saw the writing of the little woman something gripped me by the throat while i saw my hands shake as if they belonged to somebody else my news was good though and i read it slowly some parts twice then at last when i looked up i found mcgill near me unconsciously we had both sought a quiet corner but he had sunk on to a box now as i glanced at him i saw what made me shiver the fear was there again naked and ugly for he held one lonesome letter and its inscription was in no woman's hand he had crouched there by my side all this time staring 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 at it afraid to read afraid to open it some men smile in their agony shifting their pitiful masks to the last others curse and no two will take their blows alike mcgill was plucking feebly at the end of his envelope tearing off tiny bits dropping the fragments at his feet now and then he stopped and when he did he shuddered buck up old pal i said then recognizing me he thrust the missive into my hand tell me for god's sake tell me quick i, I can't D no wait, wait not yet don't tell me i'll know from your face they said she couldn't live but she had and he watched me so fiercely that when the light came into my face he snatched the letter from me like a madman oh give it to me give it to me i knew it i told you they couldn't fool me no sir i felt all the time she'd make it why i knew it in my marrow what's the date i inquired september thirtieth he said then as he realized how old it was he began to worry again why didn't they write later they must know i'll eat my heart out suppose she's had a relapse that's it they wrote too soon and now they don't dare tell me she got worse died months ago and they're afraid to let me know stop it i said and reasoned sanity back into him monty had taken his mail and run off like a puppy to feast in quiet so i went over to eckert's and had a drink sam winked at me as i came in a man was reading from a letter go on i'm interested said the proprietor the fellow was getting full pretty fast and was down to the garrulous stage but he began again dear husband i am sorry to hear that you have been so unfortunate but don't get discouraged i know you will make a good miner if you stick to it long enough don't worry about me i have rented the front room to a very nice man for fifteen dollars a week the papers here are full of a gold strike in siberia just across bering sea from where you are if you don't find something during the next two years why not try it over there for a couple that's what i call a persevering woman said eckert solemnly she's a business woman too said the husband all i ever got for that room was seven fifty a week 
it seemed i'd missed montague at the store but when the crowd came out ollie marceau found him away in at the back having gone there to be alone with his letters she saw the utter abandon and grief in his pose and the tears came to her eyes impulsively she went up and laid her hand on his bowed head she had followed the frontier enough to know the signs oh mr prosser she said i'm so sorry is it the little mother yes he answered without moving not not she hesitated i don't know the letters are up to the middle of december and she was very sick then with the quick sentiment of her kind the girl spoke to him forgetting herself her life his prejudice everything except the lonely little gray woman off there who had waited and longed just as such another had waited and longed for her and inasmuch as ollie had suffered before as this boy suffered now in her words there was a sweet sympathy and a perfect understanding it was very fine i think coming so from her and when the first shock had passed over he felt that here among all these rugged men there was no one to give him the comfort he craved except this child of the dance halls compassion and sympathy he could get from any of us but he was a boy and this was his first grief so he yearned for something more something subtler perhaps the delicate comprehension of a woman at any rate he wouldn't let her leave him and the tender-hearted lass poured out all the best her warm nature afforded in a few days he braced up however and stood his sorrow like the rest of us it made him more of a man in many ways for one thing he never scoffed now at any of the nine women which taken as an indication was good in fact i saw him several times with the marceau girl for he found her always ready and responsive and came to confide in her rather than in martin or me which was quite natural martin spoke about it first i hate to see em together so much said he one of em is going to fall in love sure and it won't be reciprocated none it would serve him right to get it hard but if she's hit it'll be too damn pitiful you and i will have to combine forces and beat him up i reckon the days were growing long and warm the hills were coming bare on the heights while the snow packed wet at midday when we went into town to sled out grub for the clean-up we found everybody else there for the same purpose so the sap began to run through the camp we were loading at the trading post the next day when i heard the name of ollie marceau it was a big-limbed fellow from alder creek talking and as he showed no liquor in his face what he said sounded all the worse i have heard as bad many a time without offence for there is no code of loyalty concerning these girls but ollie had got my sympathy somehow and i resented the remarks particularly the laughter so did prosser the puritan he looked up from his work white and dangerous don't talk that way about a girl he said to the stranger and it made a sensation among the crowd i never knew a man before with courage enough to kick in public on such subjects as it was the man said something so much worse that right there the front busted out of the tiger cage and for a few brief moments we were given over to chaos i had seen whitewater walloped and i knew how full of parlor tricks the kid was but this time he went insane he knocked that man off the counter at the first pass and climbed him with his hobnails as he lay on the floor a fight is a fight and a good thing for spectators and participants for it does more to keep down scurvy than anything i know of but the thud of those heavy boots into that helpless flesh sickened me and we rushed prosser out of there while he struggled like a maniac i never saw such a complete reversal of form somewhere away back yonder that boy's forefathers were pirates or cannibals or butchers when the fog had cleared out of his brain the reaction was just as powerful i took him alone while the others worked over the alder creek party and all at once my man fell apart like wet sawdust what made me do it what, what made me do it he cried i'm crazy why i tried to kill him and yet what he said is true that's the worst of it it's true think of it i fought for her what am i coming to 
after the clean-up we came to camp waiting for the river to break and the first boat to follow it was then that the suspense began to tell on our partner he read and re-read his letters but there was little hope in them and now with no work to do he grew nervous added to everything else our food ran short and we lived on scraps of whatever was left over from our winter grub stake just out of cussedness the break-up was ten days late the ten longest days i ever put in but eventually it came and a week later also came the mail we needed food and clothes we needed whiskey we needed news of the great distant world but all we thought of was our mail the boy had decided to go home we were sorry to see him leave too for he had the makings of a real man in him even if he shaved three times a week but no sooner was the steamer tied than he came plunging into my tent like a moose laughing and dancing in his first gladness the mother was well again later i went aboard to give him the last lonesome good wishes of the fellow who stays behind and fights along for another year the big freighter with her neat staterooms and long glass burdened tables awoke a perfect panic in me to be going with him to shake this cruel country and drift back to the home and the wife and the pies like mother made i found him on the top deck with the marceau girl who was saying good-bye to him there was a look about her i had never seen before and all at once the understanding and the bitter irony of it struck me this poor waif hadn't had enough to stand so love had come to her just as kink had predicted a hopeless love which she would have to fight the way she fought the whole world it made me bitter and cynical but i admired her nerve she was dressed for the sacrifice trim and well curried as a thousand dollar pony back of her smile though i saw the waiting tears and my heart bled spring is a fierce time for romance anyhow there wasn't time to say much so i squeezed monty's hand like a cider press god bless you lad you must come back to us i said but he shook his head and i heard the girl's breath catch i continued come on ollie i'll help you ashore we stood on the bank there together and watched the last of him tall and clear-cut against the white of the wheelhouse and it seemed to me when he had gone that something bright and vital and young had passed out of me leaving in its stead discouragement and darkness and age would you mind walking with me up to my cabin ollie asked of course not i said and we went down the long street past the theatre the trading post and the saloon till we came to the hill where her little nest was perched every one spoke and smiled to her and she answered in the same way though i knew she was on parade and holding herself with firm hands as we came near to the end and her pace quickened however and i guessed the panic that was on her to be alone where she could drop her mask and become a woman a poor weak grief-stricken woman but when we were inside at last her manner astounded me she didn't throw herself on her couch nor go to pieces as i had dreaded but turned on me with burning eyes and her hands tight clenched while her voice was throaty and hoarse the words came tumbling out in confusion i've let him go she said yes and you helped me only for you i'd have broken down but i want you to know i've done one good thing at last in my miserable life i've held in here he never knew he never knew oh god what fools men are yes i said you did mighty well he's a sensitive chap and if you'd broken down he'd have felt awful bad what she grasped me by the coat lapels and shook me yes that weak little woman shook me while her face went perfectly livid he'd have felt badly eh huh? man man didn't you see are you blind why he asked me to go with him he asked me to marry him think of it that great wonderful man asked me to be his wife me olive marceau the dancer oh oh isn't it funny why don't you laugh i didn't laugh i stood there picking pieces of fur out of my cap and wondering if ever i should see another woman like this one she paced about over the skin rugs tearing at the throat of her dress as if it choked her there were no tears in her eyes but her whole frame shook and shuddered as if from great cold deep set in her bones 
why didn't you go i asked stupidly you love him don't you you know why i didn't go she cried fiercely i couldn't how could i go back and meet his mother some day she'd find me out and it would spoil his life no no if only she hadn't recovered no i don't mean that either i'm not his kind that's all oh god i let him go i let him go and he never knew she was writhing now on her bed in a perfect frenzy calling to him brokenly stretching out her arms while great dry coughing sobs wrenched her little one i said unsteadily and my throat ached so that i couldn't trust myself you're a brave girl and you're his kind or anybody's kind with that the rain came and so i left her alone with her comforting misery when i told kink he sputtered like a pinwheel and every evening thereafter we too went up to her house and sat with her we could do this because she'd quit the theater the day the boat took prosser away and she wouldn't heed eckert's offers to go back i'm through with it for good she told us though i don't know what else i'm good for you see i don't know anything useful but i suppose i can learn now if i wasn't married already i said hm snorted kink i ain't so young as neither one of my partners miss but i'm possessed of rare intellectual treasures she laughed at both of us when a week had passed after the first boat went down with prosser we began to look daily for the first up-river steamer bringing word direct from the outside world it came one midnight and as we were getting dressed to go to the landing our tent was torn open and montague tumbled in upon us what brought you back we questioned when we'd finished mauling him it was june and the nights were as light as day in this latitude so we could see his face plainly why uh he hesitated for an instant then threw back his head squared his great young shoulders and looked us in the eyes while all his embarrassment fled i came back to marry olive marceau said he i came to take her back home to the little mother he stared out wistfully at the distant southern mountains effulgent and glorified by the midnight sun which lay so close behind their crests and i winked at martin she's left what he whirled quickly the theatre and i don't suppose you can see her until tomorrow disappointment darkened his face besides kink added gloomily when you quit her like a dog i slicked myself up some and i ain't any way sure she'll care to see you now only just as a friend of mine notice i've cut my whiskers don't you we made monty pay for that instant's hesitation the last he ever had and then i said you walk up the river trail for a quarter of a mile and wait if i can persuade her to come out at this hour i'll send her to you no you couldn't find her she's moved since you left i wouldn't gamble none on her meeting you martin said discouragingly and combed out his new-mown beard with ostentation she was up the moment i knocked and when i said that a man needed help i heard her murmur sympathetically as she dressed when we came to our tent i stopped her he's up yonder a piece said i you run along while i fetch kink and the medicine kit we'll overtake you is it anything serious yes it's apt to be unless you hurry he seems to think he needs you pretty badly and so she went up the river trail to where he was waiting her way golden with the beams of the sun whose rim peeped at her over the far-off hills and there in the free still air among the virgin spruce with the clean sweet moss beneath their feet they met the good sun smiled broadly at them now and the grim yukon hurried past chuckling under its banks and swiggering among the roots while the song it sang was of spring and of long bright days that had no night end of story nine story ten mcgill the ice was running when mcgill arrived had he been two hours later he might have fared badly for the ramparts above ophir choke the river down into a narrow chute through which it hurries snarling and the shore ice was widening at the rate of a foot an hour 
Early in the day, the recorder from Alder Creek had tried to come ashore, but had broken through, losing his skiff and saving his life by the sheer good luck that favors fools and drunken men. It was October. The last mail had gone out a fortnight previous. The wiseacres were laying odds that the river would be closed in three days, so it was close running that McGill made six hundred miles in an open whip-sawed dory they heard him calling once he saw the lights and getting down to the water level they could make out his boat crunching along through the thin ice at the outer edge he was trying to force his way inward to a point where the current would not move him but the yukon spun him like a top and it looked as if he would go past fortunately however there happened to be a man in the crowd who had learned tricks with a lariat back in oklahoma a line was put out and mcgill came ashore with his bedding under one arm and a sheet-iron stove under the other stoves were scarce that winter and mcgill was no tenderfoot they obtained their first good look at him when he lined up with the crowd at hopper's bar ten minutes later by which time it was known who he was he had a great big frame with a great big face on top of it and judging from his reputation he had a great big heart to match them both some of the late comers recalled a tale of how he had lifted the gunnels out of a poling boat that was wedged in a timber jam above white horse and from the looks of his massive hands and shoulders the tale seemed true he was not handsome few strong men are but he had level blue eyes rather small and deep set and a jaw that made people think twice before angering him while his voice carried the rumbling bass note one hears at the edge of a spring freshet when the boulders are shifting i missed the last boat from circle he explained so i took a chance with the skiff looks like you'd be the last arrival before the trails open offered hopper i don't guess there's nobody behind you i didn't pass anybody said mcgill and it was plain from his smile that he had made good time aim to winter here dan i do minnick told me four summers ago that he'd found a prospect near here and i've always figured on putting some holes down but it looks like i'm late oh there's plenty of ground open you've got as good a chance as the balance of us any grub in camp nope ophir was struck too late in the fall mcgill laughed i didn't think there would be but that's nothing new didn't you bring none nary a pound there's women and children at the circle and there wasn't more than enough for them so i pulled out there's plenty below hopper assured him how far we don't know yet there's a boatload of chicago's bound for dawson somewhere between here and cochran's landing they'll be froze in now and tenderfeet always has grub soon's we get some more snow we'll do some freightin before he retired that night mcgill had bought a town lot and a week later there was a cabin on it for he was a man who knew how to work then during the interval between the close of navigation and the opening of winter travel he looked over the country and staked some claims he did not locate at random but used a discrimination based upon ten years experience in the arctics and when cold weather set in he felt satisfied with his work men with half his holdings reckoned their fortunes at extravagant figures transfers of unproved properties for handsome terms were common millions were made daily on paper soon after the winter had settled two strangers mushed in from down river for ten days they had pulled their own sled through the first dry trackless snow of the season and they were well spent but they brought news that the steamboat was in winter quarters a hundred and fifty miles below they assured mcgill moreover that there was plenty of food aboard so a day later he set off on their back trail with his dog team by now the melancholy autumn was gone the air was frozen clean of every taint the frost made men's blood gallop through their veins it changed mcgill into a boy again his lungs ached from the throbbing power within him his loping stride was as smooth as that of a timber wolf his loud deep laughter caused the dogs to yelp in answer when he finally burst out of the silence and into the midst of the gold seekers with tidings of the new camp only a hundred and fifty miles away they shook off their lethargy and awoke to a great excitement 
he told all he honestly knew about ophir and with nimble fancies they added two words of their own to every one of his they stopped work upon their winter quarters and made ready to push on afoot on hands and knees if necessary here was a man who had made a fortune in one short autumn for with the customary ignorance of tenderfeet they perceived no distinction between a mining claim and a mine a gold mine they reasoned was worth anything one wished to imagine from a hundred thousand to a million thirty gold mines were worth thirty millions figure it out for yourself the conservative ones cut the result in half and were well satisfied with it they were glad they had come the steamboat captain offered mcgill a bed in his own cabin for the log houses were not yet completed and that night at supper the miner met the rest of the big family among them was a girl once mcgill had beheld her he could see none of the others he became an automaton directing his words at random but focusing his soul upon her he could not recall her name for her first glance had driven all memory out of his head and during the meal he feasted his hungry eyes upon her feeling a yearning such as he had never before experienced he did not pause to argue what it foretold it is doubtful if he would have realized had he taken time to think for he had never known women well and ten years in the yukon country had dimmed what youthful recollections he possessed when he went to bed he was in a daze that did not vanish even when the captain after carefully locking the doors and closing the cabin shutters crawled under the bunk and brought forth a five-gallon keg of whiskey which he fondled like a mother her babe wait till you taste it crooned the old man nothing like it north of vancouver if i didn't keep it hid i'd have a mutiny he removed a steaming kettle from the stove then unearthing some sugar from the chart case mixed a toddy muttering just wait that's all you just wait with the pains of a chemist he divided the beverage into two equal portions rolled the contents of his own glass under his tongue with a look of beatitude on his wrinkled features then inquired what did i tell you it's great miguel acknowledged first real liquor i've tasted for months then he fell to staring at the fire after a time he asked who's the lady i was talking to the one with the red sweater yes miss andrews her first name is alice alice mcgill spoke it softly i suppose she's married of course no miss andrews mcgill started i thought she was the wife of that nice-looking feller barclay the captain grunted and then after a moment added she's an actor of some kind mcgill opened his eyes in genuine astonishment he opened his mouth also but changed his mind and fell to studying the flames once more she's plum beautiful he said at length all actors are beautiful the captain remarked wisely mcgill slept badly that night which was unusual for him but when he went to feed his dogs on the following morning he found miss andrews ahead of him what splendid creatures she said petting them do you like dogs he queried i love them you know these are the first i've ever seen of this kind then you never rode behind a team no i have only read about such things mcgill summoned his courage and said maybe you'd like me to, to, to give you a ride would you oh mr mcgill she clapped her hands and her eyes widened at the prospect he noted how the brisk air had brought the blood to her cheeks but broke off the dangerous contemplation of her charms and fell to harnessing the team his fingers stiff with embarrassment he helped her into the basket sled and then at her request tucked in the folds of her coat it was a novel sensation and one he had never dreamed of having for he would not have dared touch any woman without a command it was not much of a ride for the trails were poor but the girl seemed to enjoy it and to mcgill it was wonderful he felt that he was making an awful spectacle of himself however and hoped no one had seen them leave he was so big and so ungainly to be playing squire and above all he was so old he could think of nothing to say on the excursion but when she thanked him upon their return he was more than paid for his misery as they drove up barclay was watching them from the high bank and miss andrews waved a mitten at him later when mcgill had left for a moment the young man began sourly making a play for the old party eh 
he isn't old said miss andrews carelessly what's the idea i don't know that i have any idea why uh, i'm interested naturally you needn't be it's every one for himself up here and you don't seem to be getting ahead very fast i see mcgill's due to be a millionaire and i'm down and out barclay sneered well we're neither of us children if you can land him more power to you i wouldn't stand in your way said miss andrews coldly and i don't intend that you shall stand in mine is that the only way you look at it barclay wore an ugly frown that seemed genuine she met it with a mere shrug causing him to exclaim hotly if you don't care any more than that i won't interfere he turned and walked away those were wonderful days for mcgill instead of hurrying back to his work he loitered with a splendid disregard of convention he followed the girl about hourly and was too drunk with her smiles to hear the comment his actions evoked he had moments of despair when he saw himself as a great awkward bear more aptly designed to frighten than to woo a woman but these periods of depression gave way to the keenest delight at some word of encouragement from alice andrews he did not fully realize that he had asked her to marry him until it was all over but she seemed to understand so fully what was in his heart that she had drawn it from him before he really knew what he was saying and then the joy of her acceptance it stunned him when he had finally torn himself away from her side he went out and stood bareheaded under the northern lights to let it sink in there were no words in his vocabulary no thoughts in his mind capable of expressing the marvel of it the gorgeous colors that leaped from horizon to zenith were no more glorious than the riot that flamed within his soul she loved him dan mcgill and she was a white woman when he thought how beautiful and young she was his heart overflowed with a gentle tenderness which rivalled that of any mother still in a dream he related the miracle to the steamboat captain who took the announcement in silence this old man had wintered inside the circle and knew something of the woman hunger that comes to strong men in solitude he was observant moreover and had seen good girls made bad by the fires of the frontier as well as bad women made good by marriage there being no priest nearer than nulato it was perforce a contract marriage a lawyer in the party attended to the papers and it pleased the woman to have barclay sign as a witness then she and mcgill set out for ophir a trip he never forgot the sled was laden with things to make a bride comfortable so they were forced to walk but they might have been flying for all he knew alice was very ignorant of northern ways childishly so and it afforded him the keenest delight to initiate her into the mysteries of trail life and when night drew near and they made camp what joy it was to hear her exclamations of wonder at his adeptness she loved to see his axe sink to the eye in the frozen fir trunks and to join his shout when the tree fell crashing in a great upheaval of white then when their tiny tent nestling in some sheltered grove was glowing from the candlelight and the red-hot stove had rooted the cold he would make her lie back on the fragrant springy couch of boughs while he smoked and did the dishes and told her shyly of the happiness that had come upon him he waited upon her hand and foot he stood between her and every peril of the wilds and while it was all delightfully bewildering to him it was likewise very strange and exciting to his bride the deathly silence of the bitter nights illumined only by the awesome aurora borealis the terrific immensity of the solitudes with their white burdened forests of fir that ran up and over the mountains and away to the ends of the world the wild wolf-dogs that feared nothing except the voice of their master and yet fawned upon him with a passion that approached ferocity it all played upon the woman's fancy strangely for the first time in her tempestuous career she was nearly happy it was worth some sacrifice to possess the devotion of a man like mcgill it was worth even more to know that her years of uncertainty and strife were over his gentleness annoyed her at times but on the other hand she was grateful for the shyness that handicapped him as a lover on the whole however it was a good bargain and she was fairly well content 
as for mcgill he expanded he effloresced if such a nature as his could be said to bloom he explored the hindermost recesses of his being and brought forth his secrets for her to share he told her all about himself without the slightest reservation and when he was done she knew him clear to his last least thought it was an unwise thing to do but mcgill was not a wise man and the story seemed to please her above all she took an interest in his business affairs which was gratifying time and again she questioned him shrewdly about his mining properties which made him think that here was a woman who would prove a helpmate their arrival at ophir was the occasion for a rough spontaneous welcome that further turned her head mcgill was loved and once his townsmen had recovered from their amazement they did their best to show his wife courtesies which all went to strengthen her belief in his importance and to add to her complacence mcgill was ashamed of his cabin at first but she surprised him with the business-like manner in which she went about fixing it up before his admiring eyes she transformed it by a few deft touches into what seemed to him a paradise heretofore he had witnessed women's handiwork only from a distance and had never possessed a real home so this was another wonder that it took time to appreciate eventually he pulled himself together and settled down to his affairs but in the midst of his task it would sometimes come over him with a blinding rush that he was married and that he had a wife who was no squaw but a white woman more beautiful than any dream creature and so young that he might have been her father the amazing strangeness of it never left him but the adolescence of ophir was short it quickly outgrew its age of fictitious values and its rapturous delusions vanished as hole after hole was put to bedrock and betrayed no pay entire valleys that were formerly considered rich were abandoned and the driving snows erased the signs of human effort men came in out of the hills cursing the luck that had brought them there the gold-bearing area narrowed to a proved creek or two where the ground was taken and where there were ten men for every job the saloons began to fill with idlers who talked much but spent nothing one day the camp awakened to the fact that it was a failure there is nothing more ghastly than a broken mining town for in place of the first feverish exhilaration there is naught but the wreck of hopes and the ruin of ambitions mcgill's wife was not the last to appreciate the truth she saw it coming even earlier than the rest once she had lost the first glamour and fully attuned herself to the new life she was sufficiently perceptive to realize her great mistake but mcgill did not notice the change and saw nothing to worry about in the town's affairs he had been poor most of his life and his rare periods of opulence had ended briefly therefore this failure meant merely another trial ophir had given him his prize greater than all the riches of its namesake and who could be other than happy with a wife like this his very optimism combined with her own fierce disappointment drove the woman nearly frantic she felt abused she reasoned that mcgill had betrayed her and at last owned to the hunger she had been striving vainly to stifle for months past now that there was nothing to gain why blind herself to the truth she hated mcgill and she loved another there had never been an instant when her heart had not called and then to make matters worse barclay came he had spent most of the long winter at the steamboat landing being too angry to show himself in ophir but the woman hunger had grown upon him as upon all men in the north and it finally drew him to her with a strength that would have snapped iron chains hearing shortly after his arrival that mcgill was out on the creeks and never returned until dark he went to the cabin alice opened the door at his knock then fell back with a cry he shut out the cold air behind him and stood looking at her until she gasped why have you come here why because i couldn't stay away you knew i'd have to come didn't you mcgill she whispered and cast a frightened look over her shoulder does he know she shook her head i hear he's broke like the rest barclay laughed mockingly and she nodded have you had enough yes yes oh yes 
she wailed suddenly take me away bob oh take me away she was in his arms with the words her breast to his her arms about his neck her hot tears starting she clutched him wildly while he covered her face with kisses don't scold me she sobbed don't i'm sorry i'm sorry you'll take me away won't you hush he commanded i can't take you away there's no place to go to that's the worst of this damned country he'd follow and he'd get us you must bob you must i'll die here with him i've stood it as long as i can don't be a fool you'll have to go through with it now until spring once the river is open no 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 she cried passionately do you want us to get killed mrs mcgill shivered as if some wintry blast had searched out her marrow then freed herself from his embrace and said slowly you're right bob we must be very careful i don't know what he might do that evening she met mcgill with a smile the first she had worn for some time and she was particularly affectionate instead of returning down river barclay found lodgings and remained in ophir he was not the most industrious of men and before long became a familiar figure around the few public places mcgill met him frequently seeing which barclay's fellow-passengers from below raised their eyebrows and muttered meaningless commonplaces then when the younger man took to spending more and more of his time at the miner's cabin they ceased making any comment whatever these are things that wise men avoid and a loose tongue often leads to an early grave when fellows like mcgill are about some of the old-timers who had wintered with the miner in the upper country shook their heads and acknowledged that young barclay was a braver man than they gave him credit for being of course mcgill was the last to hear of it for he was of the simple sort who have faith in god and women and such things and he might have gone on indefinitely in ignorance but for hopper who did not care much for the barclay person the saloon man being himself uneducated and rough like mcgill cherished certain illusions regarding virtue and let drop a hint his friend could not help but heed the husband paid for his drink then went back to the rear of the room where he sat for an hour or more when he went home he was more gentle to his wife than ever he brooded for a number of days trying to down his suspicion but the poison was sown and he finally spoke to her barclay was here again this afternoon wasn't he she turned her face away to hide its pallor yes he dropped in he was here yesterday and the day before too wasn't he well he'd ought to stay away people are talking she turned on him defiantly what of it what do i care i'm lonesome i want company mr barclay and i were good friends you're my wife now your wife ah your wife she laughed hysterically yes don't you love me any more alice she said nothing i've noticed a change lately and i can't blame you none but if you loved me just a little if i had even that much to start on i wouldn't mind i'd take you away somewhere and try to make you love me more you'd take me away would you the woman cried gaining confidence from his lack of heat away where i'd be all alone with you don't you see i'm dying of lonesomeness now that's what's the matter i'm half mad with the monotony i want to see people and live and be amused i'm young and pretty and men like me you're old mcgill you're old and i'm young her husband withered beneath her words his whole big frame sagged together as if the life had ebbed out of it he felt weary and sick and burned out his brain held but one thought alice did not love him because he was old don't go on this way he said finally to check her i suppose it's true but i felt like a daddy and a mother to you along with the other feelings and i hoped you wouldn't notice it i don't reckon any young man could care for you like that you see it's all the loves of my whole life wrapped up together and i don't see i don't see what we can do about it we're married it was characteristic of him that he could devise no way out of the difficulty a calamity had befallen them and they must adjust themselves to it as best they could in his eyes marriage was a holy thing an institution of god with which no human hands might trifle 
no he continued you're my wife and so we've got to get along the best way we can i know you couldn't do anything wrong you ain't that kind his eyes roved over the homely little nest and the evidences of their married intimacy no you couldn't do that then you won't make it any harder for me than you can help no he rose stiffly you're entitled to a fair show at anything you want i don't like barclay but if you want him around i don't object try to be as happy as you can alice maybe it'll all come out right only i wish you'd known it wasn't love before you married me he put on his cap and went out into the cold during the ensuing week or two he devoted himself to his work spending every daylight hour on his claim in this way more than satisfying barclay and the woman who felt that a great menace had been removed but hopper determined that his friend should know all and not part of the truth for good men are rare and weak women in the way so he put on his parka and walked out to the place where mcgill was working and there under a bleak march sky with the snow flurries wrapping their legs about he told what he had learned hopper was a little man but he had courage i've heard it from half a dozen fellers he concluded and they'd ought to know because they come up on the same boat with them anyhow you can satisfy yourself easy enough mcgill moistened his lips and thanking his informant said now you'd better hustle back to camp we're due for a storm it was still early afternoon when he walked swiftly out of the gulch and into the straggling little town on his way down from the claim the blizzard had broken or so it seemed for the narrow valley had suddenly become filled with a whirling smother through which he burst like a ship through a fog when he emerged upon the flats he saw that it was no more than a squall and the wind was abating again his moccasins made no sound as he came up to his own house and the first inkling of his presence that the two inside received was when the door opened and he stood before them something in his bearing caused his wife to clutch at the table for support and barclay to retreat with his back to the opposite wall his hand inside his coat mcgill never carried a weapon having yet to feel the need of one he spoke now in a harsh cracked voice take your hands off that gun barclay what's the matter with you the younger man questioned mrs mcgill's eyes were wide with terror her frame racked by apprehension when her husband turned upon her and asked is it true do you love him he jerked his head in barclay's direction answer me he rumbled savagely as she hesitated her lips moved and she nodded without removing her gaze from him how long have you loved him when she still could not master herself he softened his voice you needn't be scared alice i wouldn't hurt you a long time she said finally mcgill leveled a look at the other man that's right barclay agreed you might as well know they tell me that you and her had mcgill ground his teeth and his little eyes blazed that she didn't have no right to marry without telling me something about you the former answered through white lips well everybody knew it except you and you could have found out i'd have married her some time myself if you hadn't come along mcgill's fingers opened slowly at which the woman burst forth no 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 don't do that you can't blame him dan i did it don't you understand i'm the one i loved him in frisco long before i saw you and i've loved him ever since take it out on me if you want to but don't hurt him i don't reckon i'd have minded it much if i'd known the truth at the start said mcgill most women have made mistakes at one time or another at least most of those i've known have no it ain't that but you married me knowing that you loved him all the time i tried to quit cried the wife i tried to but i couldn't and what's the rottenest of all mcgill's voice was ugly again you made him best man at the wedding or just the same he stood up with us didn't you barclay the wife flung herself into the breach once more with a self-sacrifice that wrenched her husband's heart he didn't want to but i made him i thought you had money and i was mad at him for letting me go so i tried to hurt him i wanted him to marry me but he wouldn't and i took you when it was over and i saw the kind of man you are i tried to love you honestly i did but i couldn't you're so i couldn't do it that's all 
she broke into a torrent of tears holding herself on her feet by an effort her wretched sobbing was the only sound in the cabin for a time then barclay inquired well what are you going to do mcgill turned to his wife ignoring barclay i guess i understand things pretty well now and i'm beginning to see your side of course i never aimed to hurt you alice i couldn't but i aimed to kill this man and i will if he stays here over his shoulder he flung out quickly oh the gun won't help you none you gotta go barclay i'll go with him cried mrs mcgill desperately if he goes i'll go too that's exactly what you've got to do you can't stay here now neither of you if he ain't able to take care of you why i will as long as i live but you've both got to go it's the best course under the circumstances barclay agreed with relief we'll take the first boat you'll go to-day now said the husband grimly before i have time to think it over but where to hell that's where you're headed we can't go afoot the woman cried in a panic i've got dogs and don't argue or i'll weaken i'm letting him go because you seem to need him alice only remember one thing both of you there ain't no town big enough to hold all three of us now go quick before i change my mind for if the sun ever goes down on barclay and me together so help me god it won't rise on both of us there ain't no place in the world that's big enough for him and me no place in the world mcgill stood on the river bank and watched them vanish into the ghostly curtain that sifted slowly down from the heavens and when they were finally lost to view he turned back to his empty cabin before entering he paused as usual to note the weather it was a habit he saw that the sky was strangely leaden and low and in spite of the fact that the quick was falling rapidly the air was lifeless and close if mcgill was any judge that squall had been but a warning and foretold more to follow he sighed miserably at the thought of the night his wife would have to face he cooked his supper mechanically then sat for hours staring at it the wind rattling at his door finally roused him to the knowledge that his fire was out and the room was chilly being unable longer to bear the silence and the mute evidences of her occupation that looked at him from every side he slipped into his parka and went down to hopper's place where there was life and human voices at least the night was yelling with a million voices when he stepped out the bitter wind snapped his fur garment as if to rend it to ribbons the whirling particles of snow rasped his face like the dry grains from a sand blast boreas had loosed his demons and they were lashing the night into chaos mcgill felt a sudden tender concern for the woman a concern so great as almost to destroy his bitterness but he reflected that he had seen to loading the sled himself and among the other paraphernalia had included a tent and a stove unless barclay was a fool therefore alice was perfectly safe there was wood aplenty and the spruce forest offered shelter from the gale the thought awakened a memory of those night camps he had made on that dreamlike wedding journey and brought forth a groan how old and spiritless he had become he could scarcely stand against the wind of course the story had gone broadcast hours before for other eyes than his had watched the man and woman take the outbound trail that afternoon so when he came stumbling into hopper's place a sudden silence fell he went directly to the bar and called for straight hooch to drive the cold from his bones but although it warmed his flesh his soul remained numb and frozen inside him was a great aching emptiness that even hopper's kindly words could not reach looks like the worst night we've had this year said the proprietor better have a drink with me mcgill's teeth rattled on the glass when he put it to his lips she's gone he whispered staring across the bar and i didn't kill him i, I couldn't on her account hopper nodded i'm awfully sorry it came out this way dan mcgill shivered and drew his head down between his gaunt shoulders talk to me will ya he begged i'm hit hard his friend did as he was directed but a few minutes later in the midst of his words the big man interrupted there wasn't room for all of us here he declared fiercely i told her that but she wanted him worse than her own life so i had to give in 
they were still talking at midnight after all but a few loiterers had gone home when they heard a man's voice calling from outside an instant later the front door burst open and a figure appeared it was cochran the trader from down river here give me a hand he bellowed through his ice burdened beard then plunged back into the hurricane to reappear with a woman in his arms i thought i'd never make it he declared there's a man in the sled too get some hooch and send for a doctor quick mcgill uttered a cry while the hand with which he gripped the bar went white at his pressure where did you get them he questioned ten miles below said cochran i was camped for the night when their dogs picked up my scent they were half dead when they got to me and he was in mighty bad shape so i came through i've been five hours on the road two men brought in barclay at which mcgill flung out a long arm and cried in a loud voice is that man dead no one answered so he strode forward only to have the weakened traveller raise his head and say no i'm not dead mcgill but we had to come back the wife was calling to her husband wretchedly don't do it dan we couldn't help it we'll go to-morrow we'll go please don't we'll go the onlookers knowing something of the tragedy drew back watching mcgill who still stared into the face of the man who had robbed him of everything do you remember what i told you he questioned inflexibly barclay nodded and the woman shrilled again don't let him do it men don't there ain't room for us here went on mcgill only to-night supplicated his wife the frost-bitten spots in her cheeks no more pallid than the rest of her countenance he can't go don't you see he isn't able wait dan i'll go if you want me to she struggled forward i'll go but he'll die if you send him out it's always him ain't it said the miner slowly you seem to want him pretty bad alice well you can have him and you can stay both of you he drew his cap down over his grizzled hair and turned toward the door but hopper saw the light in his eye and intercepted him i'll go home with you dan said he i ain't going home you mean there ain't room enough in ophir for barclay and me and the woman my god man listen to that blizzard it's suicide but mcgill only repeated dully there ain't room hopper there ain't room and with the gait of an old man shambled to the door when he opened it the storm shrieked in glee and rushed in wrapping him up to the middle in its embrace he closed the door behind him then went stumbling off into the night and as he crept blindly forth upon the frozen bosom of the river the bellowing wind wiped out his footprints an arm's length at his back end of story ten story eleven the brand part one the valley was very still no breath of wind had stirred it for many days it was smothered so heavily in snow that the firs were bent even the bare birch limbs carried precarious burdens and when gravity relieved some sagging branch the mass beneath welcomed the avalanche so softly that the only sound was a whisper as the bow returned to its position the brooding cold had cleared the air of sound as it had of moisture no birds piped there was no murmur of running water no evidence of animal life except an occasional wavering line etched into the white by the feet of some tiny rodent the rolling hills were sparsely timbered against an empty north sky a jumble of saw-toothed peaks were limbed like carvings and everywhere was the same unending hush of winter the desolation was complete yet there was life here for spaced at regular intervals across the gulch were mounds of white each forming the lips of a rectangular cavity resembling an open grave they were perfectly aligned and separated from each other by precisely thirty paces surrounding each was a clearing out of which freshly cut stumps protruded bearing snow caps fashioned like the chapeau of a drum major there were six of these holes and a seventh was in process of digging over the last one a crude windlass straddled and the heap of debris at its feet showed raw and dirty against the snow out of the aperture a thin vapour rose lazily coating the drum and rope with rime from the clearing a narrow trail wound to a cabin beside the creek bank 
mcgill came out into the morning and with him came his three giant malamutes wolf gray shaggy and silent like their master he eyed the drooping white-robed forest and the desolate ridges that shut him in then said in a voice harsh from disuse hello people anything happened yet he made it a practice to speak aloud whenever he thought of it for the hush of an arctic winter plays pranks with a person's mind and there is a certain effect of sanity in spoken words senseless though they be after a moment he repeated his greeting good morning i said can't you answer then his cheeks flamed above his heavy beard and he yelled loudly good morning you blank can't you say anything he glared reproachfully at a giant spruce from the lower limbs of which depended the quarters of several caribou tom you ain't gone back on me say hello you and me are friends speak up after a time he shook his head murmuring it's no use i've got to make all the noise there is if it would only blow or something i'd like to hear the wind he strode toward the prospect hole the dogs following sedately their feet making no sound in the snow they too felt the weight of isolation and never left his side arriving at the dump mcgill stood motionless beside the windlass for a long time staring into nothingness with eyes that were strained and miserable when the cold bit him he roused himself and addressed the steam-filled opening dispiritedly so you didn't freeze up on me that's good i'll get bedrock to-day and show you up for a dirty cheat pay bah there ain't none he descended a ladder at one end of the shaft gathered the charred logs tied them into a bundle with the end of the windless rope then mounting the ladder hoisted them to the surface next hooking on the ungainly wooden bucket he lowered it after which he descended for a second time there began a long and monotonous series of ascents and descents for every bucket of gravel meant two journeys the full depth of the pit it was a tedious and primitive process involving a tremendous waste of effort but he was methodical and each time the tub rose it carried a burden sufficient to tax the strength of two men he handled it easily however and by midday had removed the thawed ground and scraped a sample from close to frost he laid a light fire then took the heaping gold pan under his arm and set off for his cabin accompanied by the malamutes when he had prepared and eaten his lunch he seated himself before his panning tub a square box half filled with water melted from the creek ice and began the process of testing his prospect having worked down the gravel and sediment to a half handful he spread it with a movement of his wrists leaving stranded at the tail of the black sand a few specks of yellow these he eyed for a moment before washing them away too light as usual he said aloud the dogs stirred and raised their heads always pretty near but not quite but it's here somewhere and i'll get it if i can last out this damned silence that rimrock didn't lie and old pitka didn't lie either nobody lies except women he scowled at some remembrance his whole face retreated behind a bristling mask of ferocity he sat motionless over the tub of muddy water until the fire died out of the stove and the chill warned him that it was time to resume work for many weeks how many mcgill neither knew nor cared he had pursued the routine of his search he had penetrated this valley alone unseen in the late autumn and every day since then he had labored steadily mechanically almost without physical sensation for all feeling was centered in his memory which never gave him time to consider his surroundings spring was coming now the sun was already peeping over the southern hills in the middle of its daily journey and during this time there had been but two interruptions which had roused him from his apathy one had occurred when in quest of fresh meat he had discovered that he had neighbors ten miles to the west he had seen their camp from the divide then had turned and slunk away cursing them for intruding upon his privacy the other was when a herd of caribou had crossed 
at that time he had given brief rein to his desire to kill seeing ahead of his sights the face of the man who had sent him into the wilderness he could have bagged half the herd but checked himself in time realizing that it was not barclay at whom he levelled his rifle but defenceless animals the carcasses of which were useless barclay the name maddened mcgill he wondered dully why he continued to work so steadily when barclay had robbed him of the need for gold the answer to this he supposed was easier than the answer to those other questions that forever troubled him he had to do something or die of his thoughts and he knew no other work than this even in his busiest hours memories of barclay and the woman obtruded themselves it was dark when he had fired the hole a second time and returned to his cabin he had not reached bedrock and this fact irritated him he was growing very irritable it seemed lighting his pipe of rank sheep dip tobacco when the supper dishes were finally cleaned and the dogs fed he once more prepared for the profitless process of panning but he noticed that this sample of gravel was different to any he had yet found being of a peculiar ashen colour he felt it with practised fingers and discovered it to be gritty and full of sediment feels good he said aloud but i'll bet it's barren he had panned so many samples that all eagerness all curiosity as to the outcome had long since disappeared therefore his movements were purely perfunctory as he dissolved the clay lumps and washed the gravels down he paused halfway through the operation to dry his hands and relight his pipe then fell to thinking of barclay and the woman once more and remained so for a long time when he resumed his task it was with glazed unseeing eyes he was about to dump the last dregs carelessly when something just slipping over the edge of the pan caught his eye and caused him to tilt the receptacle abruptly the breath whistling in his throat roused the dogs mcgill closed his eyes for an instant then reached unsteadily for the candle a movement of his wrist ran the water across the pan bottom and spread the black sand thinly instantly there leaped out against the black metal a heap of bright clean yellow particles which lay as if glued together coarse gold coarse gold he whispered then curse in the weak meaningless manner of men under great excitement not trusting himself to hold the pan he set it upon the table but without removing his eyes from it when his nerves had steadied he ran the prospect down all the time muttering in his beard he dried it over the fire blew the iron sand free with his breath then pushed the particles into a heap striving to estimate their value there's half an ounce he said finally eight dollars a pan god that's big big it's another klondike he rose and ran bareheaded out into the night followed by the dogs then stood staring at the smoke as it ascended vertically above his shaft like a giant night-growing plant of some kind he was tempted to descend the ladder and tear the crackling logs apart but thought better of it swinging his eyes along the valley rim that stood out black against the aurora he lifted his long arms it's mine all mine understand he cried the words loudly wildly as if challenging the silence it's no good to me but it's mine and by god i'll keep it mcgill reached bedrock the next evening and spent most of the night panning the pile of scrapings he had collected from the bottom of the pit if the top of the streak had been rich the lower concentration was amazing every seam in the shattered limestone which stood on end like sluice riffles contained little flattened pumpkin seeds of gold they lay embedded in the clay stringers like plums in a pudding or as if some lavish hand had inserted them there as coins are slipped into the slot of a child's savings bank he could see them before the dirt was half washed but took a supreme pleasure nevertheless in watching the yellow pile grow as the sediment disappeared a baking powder can was half filled when he had finished it told him unmistakably the magnitude of his riches he was a wealthy man wealthier than he had ever dreamed of being there was more where this came from and the gulch lay unappropriated from end to end 
fortune had come in a day and he would never want so long as he lived his thoughts were wild and chaotic for he was half mad from the silence but what use to make of his discovery he hardly knew since he had slunk away from the world ablaze with hatred for his fellow-men intending to live alone for the rest of his days his grudge was as bitter now as then and he determined therefore to keep his find a secret that would be a grim if unsatisfactory sort of revenge he reflected he would take what he wished and let other men wear out their lives searching unsuccessfully those strangers to the westward for instance would toil and suffer through the long winter then leave discouraged there was money here for them and for hundreds thousands like them but he decided to guard his secret and to let it die with him mcgill pictured the result of this news as he gave it out the stampede the headlong rush that would bring men from every corner of the north he saw this silent valley bared of its brooding forest and filled with people he saw a log city in the flats down by the river he heard the bass blasts of steamboats the shrilling of sawmills the sound of music from dance halls the click of checks and roulette balls the noise of revelry no 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 he rose and shouted into the empty silence of his cabin i won't do it i won't i won't but the voices called to him all through the night he rose early for they would not let him rest and during the darkness a terrible hunger had grown upon him it was the hunger for companionship for speech his secret was too great for imprisonment it threatened to burst the confines of the valley by its own tremendous force he knew he could never sleep with it for it would smother him vampire-like it would suck the life from his veins and the reason from his brain when he had eaten he pocketed the baking powder tin slipped into his snowshoes and crossing the gulch climbed the westward hills that hid his neighbors and the dogs went with him end of story eleven part one story eleven the brand part two news of the john daniel strike reached ophir in july when a ragged unkempt man arrived in a poling boat he was one of the party that had camped west of mcgill and he ate a raw potato with the ravenous appetite of an animal while waiting for his first meal at the miner's rest between mouthfuls he gave the word that set the town ablaze when he had bought a ton of grub at the a c store and weighed out payment in bright pumpkin seed gold he went to hopper's saloon and handed the proprietor a folded paper hopper read it uncomprehendingly this is a location notice recorded in my name the latter said turning the document uncomprehendingly as if to see if it contained a message on the reverse side the stranger nodded number four above on john daniels creek john staked for you and told me to tell you to come we've struck it rich hopper's hand shook he stared at the speaker in bewilderment john daniels i don't seem to remember him he's a big slab-sided man with a deep voice and eyes like ice the listener started is he skookum stronger than any two men god it's mcgill i thought so but i never saw him only once that was in circle he's changed now got a beard he said you done him a favor once you're his friend ain't you i am what's the trouble with him there was a pause you can tell me he put me and my five partners in on his strike i'm taking grub to him and the others oh it was about a woman of course it always is everybody here knows the story she was no good except to look at feller named barclay brought her into the country but dan didn't know it so he up and marries her she thought he had money and when she found he was broke like the rest of us she and barclay began cutting up again it was rotten i came near putting barclay away but figured dan wouldn't like anybody to do his work so i told him he went out to clean the slate but found his wife was crazy about the skunk and always had been so he sent him away together he done it for her sake but he warned him to stay off his trail because no camp was big enough to hold all three of em it was blizzardy and what did the blame fools do but get caught ten miles below here cochran brought em back that night on his sled 
mcgill was here right where you're standin when they were lugged in when he seen barclay he went after him again figurin i suppose that god was disgusted with his proposition and had sent the feller back to be finished good said the stranger and he got him huh no barclay wasn't more than half dead and the woman fell to begging for his life again she appealed to all of us mcgill must have loved her more'n we give him credit for because when he saw that neither one of them was able to leave he left instead he walked right out of that door into the wickedest storm we had that season and we never seen him again everybody thought he froze or the wolves got him that was a year ago last winter what become of the woman oh her and barclay left for dawson on the first boat i guess they saw we didn't enjoy him here and barclay didn't nobody offer to bump him off the ragged stranger was incredulous no we just left him and the woman alone most of us was kind of sorry for her sorry why well hopper hesitated i don't think she exactly understood what she was doing you know the first winter up here is hard on tender feet especially women most of em act mighty queer before they calm down she'd have come to herself if mcgill had given her time hm mm, it's too late now both men nodded when'll you leave for john daniels creek when now i've got enough of this camp and i'll have these bar fixtures packed in two hours mcgill or john daniels as he chose to call himself saw his dream come true the first stampeders came in august gaunt fellows worn by sleepless days and nights during which they had fought the swift waters and the fear of pursuit they were followed by a tiny river boat then an a c packet loaded heavy and carrying hopper with his bar fixtures and fifteen barrels of whisky she had been aground a hundred times and had passed other stranded craft laden with men who cursed her as she gained the lead a city of tents sprang up on the flats it changed to one of cabins when the first snows flew john daniels creek was overrun at nights its tortuous course was lit by glowing fires smoke hung above it constantly it became pitted with prospect holes trails were broken to adjoining creeks where similar scenes were enacted but of all who came few saw and almost none spoke to john daniels himself for he never went to town and there was no welcome at his cabin of course his name was on every tongue but he toiled underground by day and hid himself by night sometimes hopper on his way to or from number four above would stop over and spend an evening with him but not often meanwhile great ash-gray pay dumps grew upon discovery and there were rumors of a fabulous bedrock inlaid with gold but daniels did all his own sampling so there was no way of verifying the reports when the spring sluicing was finished it was said that he had cleaned up half a million daniels himself huge gaunt gray-bearded and silent saw his gold loaded aboard the first steamer and accompanied it to the outside this being his first trip to the states in ten years during his absence the new camp of arcadia grew for its fame had spread it changed from a formless cluster of log shacks to a small city of sawed lumber and paint one season had made the wilderness into a frontier town the next made of it a metropolis with the current that flowed thither from the distant camps came the scum of the north country following the first tide of venturesome strong-limbed men came the weaklings the maimed and crooked of body and soul the parasites and idlers among these there were women of the customary kind and a number of men who lived upon their earnings barclay was one of them arcadia was in the fullest riot of its growth when john daniels returned late in the autumn he had expected to find a change but he was unprepared for the startling transformation that greeted his eyes it stirred him deeply for the town was his he had made it his hands had given it life he wondered if this could be his desolate camping-place of two seasons before where was the melancholy forest the brooding silence as he walked up the front street past the painted stores the vigorous life and optimism of the place electrified him he heard laughter and music the tinkle of pianos from the dance halls the sounds of revelry the air was filled with clamour it was pungent with smoke 
and with the manifold odors of a city everywhere was activity and haste of course the news of his return spread swiftly for he was a personage but before the curious could mark him he had left for the creek that bore his name where a hundred men were preparing to drift out discovery pay streak under his supervision he remained there a month during which the first gray snows turned white and brought that peculiar loneliness that depression of spirit which marks the beginning of winter then one day he decided to go to town the impulse surprised him for he had meant to shun the place as always but his summer in the world outside had worked a change and something within him hungered for companionship the glare of lights the sight of animated faces then too he was curious to examine this town of his at closer range it was worth seeing he decided proudly during his inspection it was a splendid healthy camp he walked the front street then prowled through the regions behind there were women in this part of arcadia and these he regarded distrustfully although he was more than once arrested by a glimpse of some cosy home and stood staring until warned by the frowns of indignant housewives that his presence was suspicious he remembered another cabin like these his own he had never quite grown accustomed to its white curtains and china dishes and similar delights any more than he had grown accustomed to the presence of that wonderful mysterious creature who had filled the place with light it was all part of another life a bewildering dream too agreeable to last in the course of his wanderings however he came into a different district one which offended him sorely immediately behind the saloons he found a considerable cluster of meaner shacks which were inhabited by women and yet which were not homes these gaudily curtained houses huddled close together as if for moral support or as if avoiding contact with their surroundings they crouched in the shelter of the gilded dance halls seeking a sort of protection in one another's disreputable company from some of the windows haggard faces smiled at daniels and he heard sounds of a merry-making that were particularly offensive at this hour until this moment he had regarded arcadia with a fatherly pride and had not dreamed it was wicked hence this discovery enraged him he was not a sensitive man having trod the frontier where vice is naked but something about the rotten core of this new community sickened him it reminded him of a child diseased and then as if to point the comparison he saw a child a tiny fat round-faced person leading a puppy by a string now women were strange to john daniels since there had been but one in his life and he had possessed her only briefly but children were mysterious incomprehensible creatures phenomena which excited at once his awe and his amazement they made him ill at ease he had never touched one with the possible exception of an indian papoose now and then therefore his present meeting constituted an experience perhaps an adventure it was a white child too and it gazed at him with the disconcerting calmness of a full-grown person daniels was both embarrassed and shocked at its presence in this locality he hesitated then summoned his courage and said timidly say kid ain't you lost the child continued to stare at him in unaffected wonder leaving him painfully conscious of his absurd size and forbidding appearance he feared that once it had overcome its first amazement it would begin to cry and thus cover him with ignominy but happily for him the puppy experienced none of its owner's doubts and uncertainties it flattened its round stomach thumped its soft paws upon the sidewalk then approached the giant in a delirious series of wobbly leaps wiggling an eloquent if awkward declaration of friendship fine dog team you're driving sonny daniel smiled congratulating himself upon an admirable display of wit only to realize with a start that he had made a mistake some sixth sense informed him that this was not a boy it was a humiliating error say missy uh, you you don't belong here you're a plum off your trail that's a cinch he cast a worried glance over his shoulder and saw a hideous blanched face smile at him between a pair of red curtains he glared back at the woman and his cheeks grew hot 
meanwhile the little girl continued her unwinking examination she wore a ridiculous fur parka scarcely larger than daniel's cap and tiny mucklucks that made her legs look shorter and fatter than they were her mittens were the littlest things he had ever seen and he was regarding them wonderingly when she amazed him by approaching and laying one in his hand now this frank and full declaration of friendship reduced daniels to a helpless condition he had never been more troubled in his life he was vaguely frightened and yet he thrilled in an unaccountable manner at the touch he was half minded to withdraw his hand from his glove and retreat leaving it in her possession but thought again of these evil surroundings and of the responsibility that had devolved upon him with her surrender in the midst of his dumbness the young lady burst into a bubbling and intimate recital of her adventures which doubtless would have been perfectly intelligible to her mother but which left the discoverer of john daniel's creek floundering for a translation he concealed his disgraceful ignorance by an easy assumption of understanding he nodded he winked he grinned he eyed the infinitesimal hand that lay in his then gingerly removed his own glove the better to safeguard its treasure whereupon the small mitten promptly closed over one of his big knuckled fingers daniels gasped and held his digit as rigid as a pick handle escape was no longer possible having finished her recital the tot burst into a funny gurgle which plainly established a deep and undying intimacy between them then like all maidens who have pledged their affections she made plain her readiness to accompany her protector to the end of the world but the puppy held back and delayed progress as effectively as a ship's anchor so fearing to exert too great a strain upon his extended finger daniels gave the animal boldly into her embrace one short arm encircled the dog's neck whereupon as if by habit it limply resigned itself to misery the three went slowly out of that sin-ridden place the man dazed and delighted the child loquacious and trustful the puppy with lolling tongue and legs protruding stiffly daniels had mastered many dialects in his time from chinook to pigeon english but to save himself he could make nothing out of this language some words were plain but they were lost in a bubbling flow of strange moist lisping articulations that left the general meeting obscure she answered all his questions eagerly fully and he acknowledged she knows what she's saying all right but i'm as rattled as a tenderfoot nevertheless he derived a preposterous delight from this experience until he realized that they were wandering aimlessly then thoughts of a possible encounter with a distracted parent filled him with such dismay that he appealed to the first woman he met lady if you know where this baby lives oh, certainly i know then take her home her mother'll think i'm a kidnapper daniels perspired at the thought the woman laughingly accepted the responsibility of a full explanation but as she lifted the child it turned up its face to daniels quite as a matter of course the rosebud lips awaited him yet he did not understand he inquired blankly now what does she want a kiss don't you dearie god almighty breathed the man then he lowered his bearded face he was trembling when the strangers had gone he felt those moist baby lips against his and the sensation almost overcame him he didn't like the woman's appearance but she seemed tender-hearted and there was no better way of ensuring the safety of his little charge than to give her over but that kiss it remained upon his lips more fragrant more holy than anything he had ever conceived it left him conscious of his own uncleanness and shortcomings still in a daze he looked down at his index finger which remained rigid it was blue with the cold but he felt nothing except the clasp of a tiny woolen mitt well he exploded i don't seem to be dreaming she liked me she must have or she wouldn't have kissed me she sure did and i god i'd trade discovery for another one he felt no further interest in arcadia he thought only of the child and the amazing adventure that had come to him he could think of nothing else during the afternoon 
more than once he touched his lips timidly with his tongue and bared his hand to stare at his big finger when he had dined that evening he began a leisurely round of the saloons and gambling halls pausing at each one to invite every one to drink as befitted a man of wealth he played more or less without knowing whether he won or lost for his thoughts were directed in other and stranger channels the elite was the most pretentious place of amusement in arcadia and it was running full blast when he strolled in late that night the show was over in the theatre but a dance was going on beyond the people at the gambling tables he saw swiftly moving figures and heard the caller shouts through the rhythmic beat of the orchestra he looked on with some interest until he could engage the attention of a bartender then said call everybody up for a drink when the fellow eyed him distrustfully he explained i'm john daniels he was amused at the instant almost ludicrous change of expression and at the alacrity with which the crowd responded to his invitation they stampeded the games were deserted the sleepers roused themselves even the dancers came trooping forth with his name upon their lips the music ended discordantly and the musicians followed them the long bar was lined six deep by people who elbowed one another for a glimpse of the famous john daniels those who succeeded beheld a huge grim-featured man bearded to the cheekbones who seemed deaf to their remarks and heedless of their stares his hair was long and gray his eyes were small and bright and hard he looked like a mormon elder it took time to serve such an assemblage and during the delay daniel stood motionless vaguely resenting this curiosity when the bartender said all set he raised his glass and exclaimed drink hearty as the glass left his lips his eyes ran down the bar and along the bank of faces clear to the end where the dance hall girls had squeezed themselves in there they rested and widened his hand fell heavily crushing the glass beneath it for facing him clinging to the rail as if about to fall stood his wife their eyes met fairly daniel saw in hers the first flaming light of recognition then that expression of deathly terror that he remembered he felt the floor sinking saw the nearby figures whirling heard the clamor die after his first start not a muscle of his face moved but his eyes began slowly to search through the crowd as if for some one and seeing that she understood with a hand to her throat she groped her way blindly out of the crush then made for the rear but her knees forsook her and she paused leaning against the wall it never occurred to her that she might escape she knew without looking when he came toward her he spoke in an emotionless tone saying come and she followed half swooning followed him up the stairs to the curtained boxes that ran round the gallery when they were alone she faced him managing to utter so you are john daniels they said you were dead she expected some violence death perhaps but he only looked at her silently with an expression she could not read she felt she must scream she swayed her eyes were filmed with terror well why don't you do it mcgill why don't you she cried hysterically where is barclay he inquired he's here somewhere we came three weeks ago we uh, i didn't know he saw that she was not the woman he had known she was frail broken her fluttering hands were thin and bloodless she had no spirit so he's got you working eh? Huh? you're one of these uh, rustlers well, i had to do something all i know is stage work this ain't stage work she nodded wearily he made me go the limit made you did you get a divorce no daniels cursed so harshly that she flinched although she had long since grown accustomed to profanity then he turned away but reading murder in his face she seized him with fingers that were like claws wait don't do that you love him don't you no no but he's bad now and probably drunk he'll kill you mcgill he's bad i tell you tough don't you understand he's bad and he's made me bad too 
that's why i'm here he's not worth it mcgill neither am i you can't stay in arcadia neither of you i got out of ophir and let you alone but this is my town i can't leave it we'll go she cried wringing her hands anyhow i'll go if you'll help me but i'll need help oh god yes i'll need help you don't know you and he can settle things afterward you want to leave him i've tried to break away i've been trying ever since that first day in ophir but he won't let me i kept trying until i learned better now i'm afraid he's broken me dan but you'll help me to leave him won't you after a time the husband answered more to himself than to her i guess i'm even with you anyhow you've gone to hell hand in hand with him i won't interfere not that way i suppose he beats you she nodded and saw his bearded face twitch yes and he'll make me like these other women you understand i fought until i'm tired worn out i'm in a trap mcgill and i'm afraid afraid for the little soul i have left you sprung the trap he told her bitterly but his wife had seen a way of freedom and clutched at it with desperate persistence listen i want to talk to you come with me for a minute come why never mind oh it's all right you owe me something for i still have your name do this for me please it's only a step he yielded to her imploring eyes and followed grudgingly down the back stairs and into the night wondering the while at his own weakness she led the way bareheaded heedless of the cold they were in that ill-favored district he had penetrated earlier in the day but if it had been offensive then it was doubly so now with its muffled sounds of debauchery and wickedness she paused finally fumbling at the door of one miserable structure whereupon he growled you live here you're worse than Shh! she said a finger on her lips as she led him in and lit a lamp then she beckoned him toward the single rear room shading the light with one hand and inviting him silently to peer over her shoulder the surprise of what he saw struck mcgill dumb for there in a crib lay the tiny lass who had befriended him that afternoon her lips were pouting sweetly her face was flushed with dreams one plump little arm was outside the covers and just below the doubled fist mcgill saw the deep dimpled bracelet of babyhood her presence made of these squalid surroundings a place of purity the room became suddenly a shrine the son of a gun said mcgill inanely then his face darkened once more i know her he announced grimly what are you doing with that kid in this hell-hole from the alleyways nearby came a burst of ribaldry but the woman's face was shining when she answered why she's mine my baby we have no other home he did not could not speak so she said simply now you see why i must leave barclay and all this your baby mcgill's eyes dropped to the index finger of his right hand then he touched his lips curiously barclay won't let me run straight i've always wanted to and now i must for the baby's sake when this brought no response she continued with growing intensity but in a lowered tone she'll begin to understand things before long she'll hear about him and me then what she'll think for herself and she'll never forget a thing like that never how can she grow up to be good if she learns the truth it wouldn't let her nobody could stay good around barclay even i couldn't and i was a woman when i met him i'm decent inside mcgill honestly i am and i've been sorry every day since you left oh i've paid for what i did and i'll pay more if i have to but she mustn't be part of the price no you've got to help me don't you see she mistook his gesture of bewilderment for one of refusal then hurried to one final frenzied appeal although at a fearful cost to herself it was this which had come to her in the dance hall it was this that she had led up to without allowing herself time in which to weaken listen she shouldn't stay with me even if i get away it wouldn't be good for her besides barclay would find us some time or if he didn't i'm too sick to last much longer then she'd be alone you're rich mcgill you're john daniels you'll have to take her not for my sake understand but i the man started i take barclay's baby great god 
there was a moment of silence during which the wife strove to steady herself and then she said she's not his she's yours ours mcgill uttered a great cry it issued from the depths of his being and racked him dreadfully he swung ponderously toward the rear room then fell to trembling so that he could not proceed he stared at the woman lifted his hands then dropped them his lips shook a fretful sleepy complaint issued from the chamber at which the mother raised a warning figure and the necessity for silence calmed him more quickly than anything else could have done my baby he whispered while he felt something melt within him and was filled with such an aching joy that he sobbed with the agony of it his wife's punishment overflowed when he breathed fiercely then give her to me you can't keep her you can't touch her you ain't fit she bowed her head in assent although his torture was nothing as compared with hers you'll help me get away from barclay won't you she asked supporting herself unsteadily barclay i forgot him he's the one that did all this ain't he he brought you to this and my baby too he made her live among women like this he raised her in slime the speaker's face became slowly frightfully distorted his wife went swiftly to him she struggled to fend him away from the door but he moved irresistibly they wrestled breathlessly so as not to waken the child while she begged him in the baby's name not to go not to bring blood upon her but he plucked her arms from around him and went out closing the door softly when he had gone mrs mcgill stood motionless her eyes closed her palms pressed over her ears as if to shut out a sound she dreaded barclay was a dealing bank at one of the saloons when mcgill entered and came toward him down the full length of the room they recognized each other as their eyes met and the former sat back stiffly in his chair feeling that the dead had risen what he saw written in the face of the bearded man drove the blood from his cheeks for it was something he had dreaded in his dreams he knew himself to be cornered and fear set his nerves to jumping so uncontrollably that when he snatched the colt from its drawer and fired blindly he missed the place was crowded and it broke into a frightful confusion at the first shot none of those present told the same tale of what immediately followed but the stories agreed in this that john daniels neither hesitated nor quickened his approach although barclay emptied his gun so swiftly that the echoes blended then snapped it on a spent cartridge as the two clenched curious ones later searched out the bullet marks in wall and ceiling which showed beyond doubt the nervous panic under which the gambler had gone to pieces and so long as the building stood they remained objects of great interest now mcgill or daniels as he was known to the onlookers never went armed having yet to feel the need of other weapons than his hands he tore the gun from his victim's grasp then mauled him with it so fearfully that men shouted at him and hid their faces meanwhile he was speaking growling something into barclay's ears no one understood what it was he said until the confusion died and they heard these words and you'll go with my brand on you where everybody'll read it and know you're a rat next he did something that a great many had heard of but few even of the old-timers had witnessed he gun-branded his enemy barclay was little more than a pulp by this time he lay face up across the faro table with mcgill's fingers at his throat they thought the older man was about to brain him but instead he turned the revolver in his hand and drew the thin sharp-edged sight across barclay's forehead from temple to temple then from forelock to bridge of nose a stream of blood followed as the sight ripped through to the skull like a dull scalpel leaving a ragged disfiguring cross above the gambler's eyes it scarred the bone it formed a hideous mutilation that would last as long as the fellow lived and constitute a brand of infamy to single him out from ten thousand telling the story of his dishonor when he had finished mcgill raised the wretch bodily and flung him half across the room as if he were unclean then without a glance to right or left he went forth as he had come 
his wife was waiting with her ears covered but she saw the blood on his hands when she opened her eyes and cried out it's his he told her roughly i don't think i killed him i tried not to for her sake he inclined his head towards the inner door but it was hard to hold in after all this time he'll never trouble you again when do you mean to take the baby she whispered now she no no not yet let her stay here a little while till i'm strong enough to let her go just a little while mcgill you're a good man don't you understand she was palsied incoherent with dread in her eyes was a look of death but he held out his empty arms crying hoarsely let me have my kitty so she went in and gathered up the sleeping babe it may have been the father's heartbeats that awakened the little one when she lay against his breast at any rate the blue eyes opened and stared up at him gravely astonishment alarm gave way to recognition she smiled drowsily and her lids closed again then a tiny hand curled around one of mcgill's fingers his face was wet when he raised it to the stricken woman and said gently we'll go now if you're ready alice what do you she stared at him wildly you don't want me mcgill not after all i've done all i am i've always wanted you he told her simply you'll have to come for she needs you holding the baby close with one arm he extended the other to his wife but she drew back choking not yet she managed to say through her tears not until you know i'm not all bad only weak he took her hand and together they went out walking slowly so as not to awaken the child end of story eleven end of the crimson gardenia and other tales of adventure by rex beach